from the book jacket. They are sleek, swift, and deadly. They are the X-Wing fighters. And as the struggle rages across the vastness of space, the fearless men and women who pilot them risk both their lives and their machines. Their mission, to defend the rebel alliance against a still powerful and battle-hardened imperial foe in a last-ditch effort to control the stars. Its very name strikes fear into enemy hearts. So when rebel hero Wedge Antilles rebuilds the legendary rogue squadron, he seeks out only the best, the most skilled, the most daring X-Wing pilots. Through arduous training and dangerous missions, he weeds out the weak from the strong, assembling a group of hard-bitten warriors willing to fight, ready to die. And Tilly's knows the grim truth, that even with the best X-Wing jockeys in the galaxy, many will not survive their near-suicidal missions. But when Rogue Squadron is ordered to assist in the assault on the heavily fortified Imperial stronghold of Black Moon, even the bravest must wonder if any at all will survive. 1. You're good, Corrin, but you're no Luke Skywalker. Corrin Horn's cheeks still burned at the memory of Commander Antilles' evaluation of his last simulator exercise. The line had been a simple comment, not meant to be cruel nor delivered that way, but it cut deep into Corrin. I've never tried to suggest I'm that good of a pilot. He shook his head. No, you just wanted it to be self-evident and easily recognized by everyone around you. Reaching out, he flicked the starter switches for the X-Wing simulator's engines. Green One has four starts and is go. All around him in the cockpit, various switches, buttons, and monitors flashed to life. Primary and secondary power is at full. Ural Krig, his GAND wingman, reported similar startup success in a high-pitched voice. Green Two is operational. Green 3 and 4 checked in. Then the external screens came alive, projecting an empty starfield. Whistler, have you finished the navigation calculations? The green and white R2 unit seated behind Korn hooted. Then the nav data spilled out over Korn's main monitor. He punched a button, sending the same coordinates out to the other pilots in green flight. Go to light speed and rendezvous on the redemption. As Korn engaged the X-Wing's hyperdrive, the stars elongated themselves into white cylinders, then snapped back into pinpoints and began to revolve slowly, transforming themselves into a tunnel of white light. Korn fought the urge to use the stick to compensate for the roll. In space, and especially hyperspace, up and down were relative. How his ship moved through hyperspace didn't really matter. As long as it remained on the course Whistler had calculated and had attained sufficient velocity before entering hyperspace, he'd arrive intact. Flying into a black hole would actually make this run easier. Every pilot dreaded the redemption run. The scenario was based on an Imperial attack on evacuation ships back before the first Death Star had been destroyed. While the Redemption waited for three medevac shuttles and the corvette Korolev to dock and offload wounded, the Imperial frigate Warspite danced around the system and dumped out TIE fighters and added bombers to the mix to do as much damage as they could. The bombers, with a full load of missiles, could do a lot of damage. All the pilots called the Redemption Scenario by another name, the Requiem Scenario. The war spite would only deploy four starfighters and a half dozen bombers, known in pilot slang as eyeballs and dupes, respectively, 
but it would do so in a pattern that made it all but impossible for the pilots to save the Korolev. The Corvette was just one big target, and the TIE bombers had no trouble unloading all their missiles into it. Stellar pinpoints elongated again as the fighter came out of hyperspace. Off to the port side, Corin saw the redemption. Moments later, Whistler reported that the other fighters and all three medevac shuttles had arrived. The fighters checked in, and the first shuttle began its docking maneuver with the redemption. Green one, this is green four. Go ahead, four. By the book? Or are we doing something fancy? Corin hesitated before answering. By book, Noara Venn had referred to the general wisdom about the scenario. It stated that one pilot should play fleet hund and race out to engage the first TIE flight, while the other three fighters remained in close as backup. As long as three fighters stayed at home, it appeared, the war spite dropped ships off at a considerable distance from the Korolev. When they didn't, it got bolder, and the whole scenario became very bloody. The problem with going by the book was that it wasn't a very good strategy. It meant one pilot had to deal with five ties, two eyeballs and three dupes, all by himself, then turn around and engage five more. Even with them coming in waves, the chances of being able to succeed against those odds were slim. Doing it any other way was disastrous. Besides, what loyal son of Corellia ever had any use for odds? By the book, keep the home fires burning and pick up after me. Done. Good luck. Thanks. Corin reached up with his right hand and pressed it against the lucky charm he wore on a chain around his neck. Though he could barely feel the coin through his gloves and the thick material of his flight suit, the familiar sensation of the metal resting against his breastbone brought a smile to his face. It worked for you a lot, Dad. Let's hope all its luck hasn't run out yet. He openly acknowledged that he'd been depending quite a bit on luck to see him through the difficulties of settling in with the Alliance forces. Learning the slang took some work, moving from calling Thai starfighters eyeballs to calling interceptors squints made a certain amount of sense, but many other terms had been born of logic that escaped him. Everything about the rebellion seemed odd in comparison to his previous life, and fitting in had not been easy. Nor will be winning this scenario. The Korolev materialized and moved toward the redemption, prompting Korin to begin his final check. He'd mulled the scenario over in his mind time and time again. In previous runs, when he served as a home guard to someone else's fleet hund, he'd had Whistler record traces on the Thai timing patterns, flight styles and attack vectors. While different cadets flew the Thai half of the simulations, the craft dictated their performance, and a lot of their initial run sequence had been pre-programmed. A sharp squawk from Whistler alerted Corin to the war spite's arrival. Great. Eleven clicks aft. Pulling the stick around to the right, Corin brought the X-wing into a wide turn. At the end of it, he punched the throttle up to full power. Hitting another switch up to the right, he locked the S-foils into attack position. Green One engaging. Risati's voice came cool and strong through the radio. Be all over them like drool on a hut. I'll do my best, Green Three. Corin smiled and waggled the X-Wing as he flew back through the Alliance formation and out toward the war spite. Whistler announced the appearance of three TIE bombers with a low tone, then brought the sound up as two TIE fighters joined them. Whistler, Tag the bombers as targets one, two, and three. As the R2 unit complied with that order, Korn pushed shield power full to front and brought his laser targeting program up on the main monitor. With his left hand, 
he adjusted the sighting calibration knob on the stick and got the two fighters. Good. Looks like three clicks between the eyeballs and the bombers. Corin's right hand again brushed the coin beneath his flight suit. He took a deep breath, exhaled slowly, then settled his hand on the stick and let his thumb hover over the firing button. At two clicks, the heads-up display painted a yellow box around the lead TIE fighter. The box went green as the fighter's image locked into the HUD's targeting cross, and Whistler's shrill bleat filled the cockpit. Korn's thumb hit the button, sending three bursts of laser bolts at the lead fighter. The first set missed, but the second and third blasted through the spherical cockpit. The hexagonal solar panels snapped off and spun forward through space while the ion engines exploded into an expanding ball of incandescent gas. Corin kicked the X-Wing up in a 90-degree snap roll and sliced through the center of the explosion. Laser fire from the second fighter lit up his forward shields, making it impossible for him to get a good visual line on the tie. Whistler yowled, complaining about being a target. Corn hurried a shot and knew he hit, but the tie flashed past and continued on in at the Korolev. Time to write a new chapter for the book on the Requiem scenario. Corn throttled back almost all the way to zero and let the X-Wing decelerate. Whistler, bring up target one. The image of the first TIE bomber filled his monitor. Korn switched over to proton torpedo target control. The HUD changed to a larger box, and Whistler began beeping as he worked supplying data to the targeting computer for a missile lock. Green One, your velocity is down to 1%. Do you need help? Negative Green Two. Corin, what are you doing? Making the book a short story. I hope. The HUD went red, and Whistler's tone became constant. Corin punched a button and launched the first missile. Acquire target two. The HUD flashed yellow, then red, and the pilot launched the second missile. Numbers scrolled away to zero as the missiles streaked in at their targets. Two kilometers away, the first missile hit, shredding the first TIE bomber. Seconds later, the second missile hit its target. A Nova-like explosion lit the simulator's cockpit then melted into the blackness of space. Acquire target three. Even as he gave the order, he knew the rate of closure between the bomber and his ship would make the last missile shot all but impossible. Cancel three. Corn throttled up again as the third bomber sailed past and brought his ship around. He switched back to laser targeting and climbed right up on the bomber's stern. The dupe's pilot tried to evade him. He juked the double-hulled ship to the left, then started a long turn to the right. But Corrin was of no mind to lose him. He cut his speed, which kept the bomber in front of him, then followed it in its turn. As he leveled out again on its tail, he triggered two laser bursts, and the targeting computer reported hull damage. The bomber's right wing came up in a roll, and Corin did the same thing. Had he continued to fly level, the X-Wing's lasers would have passed on either side of the bomber's fuselage, giving the bomber a few seconds more of life. Keeping the bomber centered in his crosshairs, Corin hit twice more, and the bulky craft disintegrated before him. Pushing his throttle to full, Corin scanned for the fighter he'd missed. He found it two clicks out and going in toward the Korolev. He also found five more ties coming in from the other side of the Corvette, 18 kilometers away. Damn, the bomber took more time than I had to give it. He brought the torpedo targeting program back up and locked on to the remaining fighter. The HUD seemed to take forever before it went red and acquired a lock. Corin fired a missile and watched it blast through the fighter, then turned his attention to the new ties. Green one, do you want us to engage? Corin shook his head. Negative two. 
Warspite is still here and could dump another flight. He sighed. Move to intercept the fighters, but don't go beyond a click from the Korolev. On it. Good. They can tie the fighters up while I dust these dupes. Corin studied the navigational data Whistler was giving him. The Korolev, the bombers, and his X-Wing formed a shrinking triangle. If he flew directly at the bombers, he would end up flying in an arc, which would take more time than he had and let them get close enough to launch their missiles at the Corvette. That would be less than useless, as far as he was concerned. Whistler, plot me an intercept point six clicks out from the Korolev. The R2 whistled blithely, as if that calculation was so simple, even Corin should have been able to do it in his head. Steering toward it, Corin saw he'd have just over a minute to deal with the bombers before they were in firing range on the Korolev. Not enough time. Flicking two switches, Korn redirected generator energy from recharging his shields and lasers into the engines. It took the acceleration compensator a second to cycle up, so the ship's burst of speed pushed Korn back into the padding of his command seat. This better work. Green One, the war spite has hyped. Are we released to engage fighters? Affirmative Three, go get them. Korn frowned for a second, knowing his fellow pilots would make short work of the TIE fighters. They would deny him a clean sweep, but he'd willingly trade two TIEs for the Corvette. Commander Antilles might have gotten them all himself, but then he's got two Death Stars painted on the side of his X-Wing. Whistler, mark each of the bombers four, five, and six. Range to intercept was three clicks, and he had added thirty seconds to his fighting time. Acquire four. The targeting computer showed him to be coming in at a forty-five degree angle to the flight path of his target, which meant he was way off target. He quickly punched the generator back into recharging lasers and his shields, then pulled even more energy from his quartet of INCOM 4L4 fusel thrust engines and shunted it into recharging his weapons and shields. The resource redirection brought his speed down. Corin pulled back on the stick, easing the X-Wing into a turn that brought him head-on into the bombers. Tapping the stick to the left, he centered the targeting box on the first of the dupes. The HUD started yellow, then quickly went red. Corn fired a missile. Acquire five. The HUD started red, and Whistler's keen echoed through the cockpit. The Corellian fired a second missile. Acquire six. Whistler screeched. Corn looked down at his display. Scrolling up the screen, sandwiched between the reports of missile hits on the three bombers, he saw a notation about Green 2. Green 2, report. He's gone, one. A fighter got him? No time to chat. The comm call from the Twi'lek and Green 4 ended in a hiss of static. Risati? Got one, Corin, but this last one is good. Hang on. I'll do my best. Whistler, acquire six. The R2 unit hissed. The last bomber had already shot past the intercept point and was bearing in on the Korolev. The pilot had the wide-bodied craft slowly spinning, making it a difficult target for a missile lock. The Korolev, being as big as it was, would present large enough of a target that even a rolling ship could get a lock on it. And once he has that lock, the Korolev is so much space junk. Korin switched back to lasers and pushed his X-wing forward. Even though two clicks separated them, he triggered a couple of laser blasts. He knew his chances of hitting were not good at that range, but the light from the bolts would shoot past the tie and give the pilot something to think about. And I want him thinking about me, not that Nerf vet grazing there. Corin redirected all power back into the engines and shot forward. Two more laser blasts caused the tie bomber to shy a bit, but it had pushed into target acquisition range. The ship's roll began to slow 
as the pilot fixated on his target. Then, as Corrin brought his lasers to bear, the bomber jinked and cut away to port. The Corellian's eyes narrowed. Roar Jace has got to be flying that thing. He thinks it's payback time. The other pilot, a human from Thyfera, was, in Corrin's opinion, the second best pilot in the training squadron. He's going to kill the Korolev, and I'll never hear the end of it. Unless... Corrin pulled all his shield energy forward and left his aft as naked as the shieldless TIE bomber. Following Jace through a barrel roll, he kept the throttle full forward. As they leveled out again, Corrin triggered a snapshot at the bomber. It caught a piece of one wing, but Jace dove beneath the X-Wing's line of fire. Here we go. Corrin shoved his stick forward to follow the bomber's dive, but because his rate of speed was a good 20% faster than that of Jace's ship, the X-Wing moved into a broad loop. By the time Corrin inverted to finish the turn off, Jace's bomber came back up and banked in on the X-Wing's tail. Before the bomber could unload a missile or two into his aft, Corrin broke the fighter hard to port and carved across the bomber's line of fire. Basic maneuver with a basic response. Without even glancing at his instruments and paying no attention to Whistler's squealed warning, Corrin cut engine power back into recharging his shields. One more second. Jace's response to Corrin's break had been a reverse throttle hop. By bringing the nose of the bomber up in a steep climb, then rolling out in the direction of the turn, Jace managed to stay inside the arc of the X-Wing's turn. As the bomber leveled off, it closed very quickly with the X-Wing. Too quickly for a missile lock, but not a laser shot. The TIE bomber shrieked in at the X-Wing. Collision warning klaxons wailed. Corrin could feel Jace's excitement as the X-Wing loomed larger. He knew the other pilot would snap off a quick shot, then come around again, angry at having overshot the X-Wing, but happy to smoke Corrin before taking the Korolev. The X-Wing pilot hit a switch and shifted all shield power to the aft shields. The deflector shield materialized as a demosphere approximately 20 meters behind the X-Wing. Designed to dissipate both energy and kinetic weapons, it had no trouble protecting the fighter from the bomber's twin laser blasts. Had the bomber used missiles, the shields could even have handled all the damage they could do, though that would have been enough to destroy the shields themselves. The TIE bomber, which massed far more than the missiles it carried, should have punched through the shields and might even have destroyed the fighter, but it hit at an angle and glanced off. The collision did blast away half the power of the aft shield and bounced the X-Wing around, but otherwise left the snub fighter undamaged. The same could not be said of the unshielded bomber. The impact with the shield was roughly equivalent to a vehicle hitting a ferrocrete wall at 60 kilometers per hour. While that might not do a land vehicle much damage, Land vehicles are decidedly less delicate than starfighters. The starboard wing crumpled inward, wrapping itself around the bomber's cockpit. Both pods of the ship twisted out of alignment, so the engines shot it off into an uncontrolled tumble through the simulator's data space. Green 3, did you copy that? Corrin got no response. Whistler, what happened to 3? The R2 unit gave him a mournful tone. Sith spawn. Corn flipped the shield control to equalize things fore and aft. Where is he? The image of a lone TIE fighter making a strafing run on the Korolev appeared on Corn's monitor. The clumsy little craft skittered along over the Corvette's surface, easily dodging its weak return fire. That's seriously gutsy for a TIE fighter. Corn smiled or arrogant, and time to make him pay for that arrogance. The Corellian brought his proton torpedo targeting program up and locked onto the tie. It tried to break the lock, 
but the turbo laser fire from the Korolev boxed it in. Corin's HUD went red and he triggered the torpedo. Scratch one eyeball. The missile shot straight in at the fighter, but the pilot broke hard to port and away, causing the missile to overshoot the target. Nice flying. Corn brought his X-wing over and started down to loop in behind the tie, but as he did so, the tie vanished from his forward screen and reappeared in his aft arc. Yanking the stick hard to the right and pulling it back, Corin wrestled the X-wing up and to starboard, then inverted and rolled out to the left. A laser shot jolted a tremor through the simulator's couch. Lucky thing I had all shields aft. Corin reinforced them with energy from his lasers, then evened them out fore and aft. Jinking the fighter right and left, he avoided laser shots coming in from behind, but they all came in far closer than he liked. He knew Jace had been in the bomber, and Jace was the only pilot in the unit who could have stayed with him. Except for our leader. Corin smiled broadly. Coming to see how good I really am, Commander Antilles? Let me give you a clinic. Make sure you're in there solid, Whistler, because we're going for a little ride. Corin refused to let the R2's moan slow him down. A snap roll brought the X-Wing up on its port wing. Pulling back on the stick yanked the fighter's nose up away from the original line of flight. The tie stayed with him, then tightened up on the arc to close distance. Corin then rolled another 90 degrees and continued the turn into a dive. Throttling back, Corin hung in the dive for three seconds then hauled back hard on the stick and cruised up into the TIE fighter's aft. The X-Wing's laser fire missed wide to the right as the TIE cut to the left. Corin kicked his speed up to full and broke with the TIE. He let the X-Wing rise above the plane of the brake, then put the fighter through a twisting roll that ate up enough time to bring him again into the TIE's rear. The TIE snapped to the right and Corn looped out left. He watched the tracking display as the distance between them grew to be a kilometer and a half, then slowed. Fine. You want to go nose to nose? I've got shields and you don't. If Commander Antilles wanted to commit virtual suicide, Corn was happy to oblige him. He tugged the stick back to his sternum and rolled out in an inversion loop. Coming at you. The two starfighters closed swiftly. Corin centered his foe in the crosshairs and waited for a dead shot. Without shields, the TIE fighter would die with one burst, and Corin wanted the kill to be clean. His HUD flicked green as the TIE juked in and out of the center, then locked green as they closed. The TIE started firing at maximum range and scored hits. At that distance, the lasers did no real damage against the shields, prompting Corrin to wonder why Wedge was wasting the energy. Then, as the HUD's green color started to flicker, realization dawned. The bright bursts on the shields are a distraction to my targeting. I'd better kill him now. Corrin tightened down on the trigger button, sending red laser needles stabbing out at the closing TIE fighter. He couldn't tell if he had hit anything. Lights flashed in the cockpit and Whistler started screeching furiously. Corin's main monitor went black, his shields were down, and his weapons controls were dead. The pilot looked left and right. Where is he, Whistler? The monitor in front of him flickered to life and a diagnostic report began to scroll by. Blood red bordered the damage reports. Scanners out. Lasers out, shields out, engine out. I'm a wallowing hut just hanging here in space. With the X-Wing's scanners being dead, the R2 droid couldn't locate the TIE fighter if it was outside the droid's scanner range. Whistler informed Corin of this with an anxious bleat. Easy, Whistler. Get me my shields back first. Hurry. Corin continued to look around for the TIE fighter. Letting me stew, are you, sir? 
You'll finish the core lab, then come for me? The pilot frowned and felt a cold chill run down his spine. You're right. I'm no Luke Skywalker. I'm glad you think I'm not bad, but I want to be the best. Suddenly, the starfield went black, and the simulator pod hissed as it cracked open. The canopy lifted up, and the sound of laughter filled the cockpit. Corrin almost flicked the blast shield down on his helmet to prevent his three friends from seeing his embarrassed blush. Nope, might as well take my punishment. He stood and doffed his helmet, then shook his head. At least it's over. The Twi'lek. Nawara Ven clapped his hands. Such modesty, Corrin. Huh? The blonde woman next to the Twi'lek beamed up at him. You won the redemption scenario. What? The gray-green Gand nodded his head and placed his helmet on the nose of Corrin's simulator. You had nine kills. Jace is not pleased. Thanks for the good news, Ural. But I still got killed in there. Corrin hopped out of the simulator. The pilot who got you three, Commander Antilles, he got me too. The Twi'lek shrugged. He's been at this a bit longer than I have, so it is not a surprise he got me. Risati shook her head, letting her golden hair drape down over her shoulders. The surprise was that he took so long to get us, really. Are you certain he killed you? Corin frowned. I don't think I got a mission end message. Clearly you have too little experience of dying in these simulators because you'd know if you did. Risati laughed lightly. He may have hit you, Corin, but he didn't kill you. You survived and won. Corin blinked, then smiled. And I got Broar before he got the Korolev. I'll take that. As well you should. A brown-haired man with crystal blue eyes shouldered his way between Ural and Nawara. You're an exceptionally good pilot. Thank you, sir. The man offered Kor in his hand. Thought I had you, but when you shot out my engines, your missile caught up with me. Nice job. Corrin shook the man's hand hesitantly. The man wore a black flight suit with no name or rank insignia on it, though it did have Hoth, Endor, and Bakura battle tabs sewn on the left sleeve. You know, you're one hot hand in a tie. Nice of you to say, Mr. Horn. I'm a bit rusty, but I really enjoyed this run. He released Corrin's hand. Next time I'll give you more of a fight. A woman wearing a lieutenant's uniform touched the Thai pilot on the arm. Admiral Akbar is ready to see you now, sir, if you will follow me. The Thai pilot nodded to the four X-Wing pilots. Good flying, all of you. Congratulations on winning the scenario. Corin stared at the man's retreating back. I thought Commander Antilles was in that tie. I mean, it had to be someone as good as him to get you three. The ends of Nawara Ven's head tails twitched. Apparently, he is that good. Risati nodded. He flew circles around me. At least you saw him. The Gand drummed his trio of fingers against the hull of Corin's simulator. He caught Ural as Ural fixed on his wingman. Ural is free hydrogen in sim space. That man is very good. Sure. But who is he? Corrin frowned. He's not Luke Skywalker, obviously, but he was with Rogue Squadron at Bakura and survived Endor. The Twi'lek's red eye sparked. The Endor tab had a black dot in the middle. He survived the Death Star run. Risati looped her right arm around Corrin's neck and brought her fist up gently under his chin. What difference does it make who he is? Reese, he shot up three of our best pilots, had me dead in space, and says he's a bit rusty? I want to know who he is because he's decidedly dangerous. He is that, but today he's not the most dangerous pilot. That's you. 
She linked her other arm through Nawara's right elbow. So, Corin, you forget you were a security officer, and Nawara, you forget you were a lawyer, and let this thing drop. Today we're all pilots. We're all on the same side. She smiled sweetly. And the man who beat the redemption scenario is about to make good on all those dinner and drink promises he made to talk his wingmates into helping him win. 2. Wedge Antilles saluted Admiral Akbar and held the salute until the Mon Calamari returned it. Thank you for seeing me, sir. It is always my pleasure to see you, Commander Antilles. Without moving his head, Akbar glanced with one eye toward the other man standing in his office. General Salm and I were just discussing the impact of having Rogue Squadron back in the fleet. He feels you are all but ready to go. The unit roster is impressive. The brown-haired fighter pilot nodded. Yes, sir. I wanted to speak to you about the roster if I could, sir. Wedge saw Salm's face close up. There have been changes made to the roster without my consultation. Salm turned away from the floating blue globe hanging in the corner and clasped his hands behind his back. There are circumstances beyond your control that made those changes necessary, Commander Antilles. I am aware of that, sir. Lieutenants Hobby Cliven and Wes Jansen will do well bringing new training squadrons along. I didn't want to lose them, but that was a battle I lost a long time ago. And I understand why half the slots in my squadron are going to political appointees. Akbar's head came up. But you do not approve? Wedge bit back a sharp comment. Admiral, I spent a good deal of the two and a half years since the Emperor died, touring worlds new to the Alliance, because someone decided our new allies needed to see we had heroes, that we weren't all the bandits the Empire made us out to be. I gave speeches, I kissed babies, I had holograms taken with more world leaders than I ever knew existed. I was there as our propaganda machine built Rogue Squadron up into the needle that exploded the Emperor's Death Star balloons. The human general in command of the Rebellion's Starfighter Training Center at Folor smiled coolly. Then you do understand why it is important that our allies have representatives within our most celebrated squadron. Yes, but I know the difference between a real fighter squadron and the monster you've made Rogue Squadron out to be. The Empire isn't going to lie down and die just because they see a dozen ships jump into a system. Of course not. But, General, that's what our diplomatic corps is suggesting. The Bothans want a pilot in Rogue Squadron because they found the second Death Star and we killed it. And I understand why having two Thyferans is important. We have to appease the two conglomerates that control back to production. Akbar held up a webbed hand. Commander, a question to the point is this. Are the pilots selected inferior to other candidates? No, sir, but... But... Wedge took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Luke would be telling me that anger isn't good. He's right, because anger won't get me any closer to what I want. Admiral. I'm commanding a fighter squadron. We're an elite squadron, and the only thing I want to change about it is our survival rate. You've let me have the pick of the new pilots coming over to us, and I've got a fine group of them. With some more training, I think I can make them into the sort of unit that will strike terror into Imperial hearts. And, he added, nodding at General Salm, I concur with the selection of all the pilots listed on the roster you have, except for two. Rogue Five and my executive officer. Lieutenant Deegan is an excellent pilot. Agreed, General, but he's from Corellia. The same as me and Corin Horn. It strikes me that having Corellia overrepresented in Rogue Squadron is not politically wise. 
One of Akbar's eyes shifted slightly. You have someone in mind to replace him? Wedge nodded. I'd like to use Gavin Darklighter. Psalm shook his head adamantly. He's just a Tatooine farm boy who thinks the ability to shoot womp rats from a speeder can make him a hero. Begging your pardon, sir, but Luke Skywalker was just a Tatooine farm boy whose ability to shoot womp rats from a speeder did make him a hero. The general snarled at Wedge's riposte. You can't mean to suggest this Darklighter has Commander Skywalker's control of the Force. I don't know about that, sir, but I do know Gavin has every bit as much heart as Luke does. Wedge turned toward the Mon Calamari. Gavin had a cousin, Biggs, who was with Luke and me in the trench at Yavin. He stayed with Luke when I was ordered to pull out. Biggs died there. Gavin came to me and asked to join my squadron. What Commander Antilles is not telling you, Admiral, is that Gavin Darklighter is only 16 years old. He's a child. You couldn't tell it by looking at him. Akbar's barbels quivered. Forgive me, gentlemen, but determining a human's age by visual clues is a skill that has long since eluded me. General Psalm's point is well taken, however. This Darklighter is rather young. Is the Admiral suggesting that someone somewhere within the Alliance won't take Gavin in when we need to put someone in an X-Wing cockpit? I don't think Commander Varth would balk at bringing Gavin on board. That may be true, Commander Antilles, but then Commander Varth is far more successful at keeping his pilots alive than you are. Akbar's even tone kept the remark away from being a stinging rebuke, but not by much. And yes, I know Commander Varth has never had to face a Death Star. Rogue Squadron's leader frowned. Sir, Gavin came to me because Biggs and I were friends. I feel an obligation to him. Even General Psalm will agree that Gavin's test scores are very good. He'll do his redemption scenario in three days, and I expect his scores there will measure up. I want to pair Gavin with the Shistavanan, Sheil. I think they'll work well together. He opened his hands. Gavin's all alone and looking for a new home. Let me put him in Rogue Squadron. Akbar looked at Psalm. Aside from this nebulous age problem, you do not disagree with this selection? Psalm looked at Wedge and bowed his head. In this case, if Darklighter does well in his redemption trial, I see no problem with letting Commander Antilles have his way. Which means my choice for XO gets opposed fully. Not that I expected less. You are most kind, General. Akbar's mouth opened in the Mon Calamari imitation of a smile. Spoken with General Solo's degree of sarcasm, I believe. I'm sorry, sir. Wedge smiled, then clasped his hands at the small of his back. I would also hope the General would see his way clear to letting me choose my own executive officer. The Admiral looked at his starfighter commander. Who is presently in that position? Rogue Squadron's XO is Captain Errol Nunb. She is the sister of Nine Numb, one of the other heroes of Endor. She is every bit as skilled a pilot as her brother and worked extensively with him during his smuggling days. Sullis is providing us aid and having her in Rogue Squadron would definitely increase support from the Sorosub government. Commander, do you quarrel with his assessment? Wedge shook his head. No, sir, not at all. Then the problem is? She's a wonderful pilot, Admiral, and I'd love to have her in my squadron, but not as my XO. In that position, I need someone who can help train my pilots. What Errol does, what her brother does, is intuitive to them. They can't teach it to others. As my XO, she'd be frustrated, my pilots would be frustrated, and I'd have chaos to deal with. And you have another candidate in mind? Yes, sir. 
Wedge looked at General Salm and braced for his reaction. I want Tycho Tselchu. Absolutely not. The explosion Wedge had expected from Salm did not disappoint him. Admiral Akbar, under no circumstances will I allow Selchu to be anywhere near an active duty squadron. Just because he isn't in prison is no reason for me to want him in my command. Prison? Wedge's jaw shot open. The man hasn't done anything that warrants confinement. He cannot be trusted. I believe he can. Come on, Antilles. You know what he's been through. What I know, General, is this. Tycho Selchu is a hero. Much more of a hero than I am. On Hoth, he fought as fiercely as anyone, and at Endor, he piloted an A-wing that led a bunch of TIE fighters on a merry chase through the Death Star. He took them off our backs while Lando and I went in and blew the installation's reactor. He fought at Bakura and went on subsequent missions with the squadron, then volunteered, General, volunteered to fly a captured TIE fighter on a covert mission to Coruscant. He got captured. He escaped. That's it. That's all you want to see, Antilles. Meaning? You say he's escaped. Psalm's face hardened into a steel mask. It could be they let him go. Sure, just like they let him go at Endor. Wedge grimaced, doing his best to banish the anger he felt growing in him. General, you're fighting ghosts. Psalm nodded curtly. You're right. I'm fighting to prevent you and your people from becoming ghosts. Well, so am I, and having Tycho with us to train my people will give them the best chance of survival possible. Psalm tossed his hands up in disgust and looked at Admiral Akbar. You see, he won't listen to reason. He knows Captain Selchu is a threat, but he won't let himself see it. I'll listen to reason, sir, when I see the product of some reasoning. Akbar held up his hands. Gentlemen, please. Commander Antilles, you must admit that General Salm's concerns are valid. Perhaps if there were a way to alleviate some of them, an accommodation could be reached. I thought of that, sir, and I've spoken with Captain Selchu about it. Wedge started ticking points off on his fingers. Tycho has agreed to fly a Z-95 headhunter in our training exercises with the lasers powered down so they can only paint a target, not hurt it. He's agreed to have a destruct device installed in the Starfighter so that if he goes to ram anything or goes outside space lanes to which he is assigned, he can be destroyed by remote. When not flying, he has agreed to remain under house arrest unless accompanied by Alliance security or members of the squadron. He's agreed to undergo interrogation as needed, to have all his computer files and correspondence open to examination, and is even willing to have us choose what he eats, when, and where. Saul marched over and placed himself between Wedge and the Mon Calamari Admiral. This is all well and good, and might even be effective, but we can't afford the risk. Akbar blinked his eyes slowly. Captain Selchu has agreed to these conditions? Wedge nodded. He's no different from you, Admiral. He's a warrior. What he knows, what he can teach, will keep pilots alive. Of course, there's no way General Salm will ever let him fly in combat again. That can be etched in transparasteel. So, serving as an instructor is the only way he can fight back. You have to give him this chance. Akbar activated the small comlink clipped to his uniform's collar. Lieutenant Phila, please find Captain Selchu and bring him to me. The Mon Calamari looked up at Wedge. Where is he currently? Wedge looked down at the deck. He should be in the simulator complex. He's where? Psalm's face went purple. You'll find him in the simulator complex, Lieutenant. Bring him here immediately. Akbar turned the comm link off. 
the simulator complex? It was Horn's turn leading the redemption scenario. Tycho knows how to fly a TIE better than most pilots, so I decided to have him fly against Horn. Akbar's lip fringe twitched. You've taken certain liberties concerning Captain Selchu already, it seems, Commander. Yes, sir, but nothing that isn't necessary to make my pilots the best. I'm being prudent in this, I think. The most prudent course, Commander. If you cared to protect the rest of the trainees here, not just your own, would have been to keep Captain Selchu out of the simulator facility entirely. Psalm crossed his arms over his chest. You may be a hero of the New Republic, but that doesn't give you any authorization to jeopardize our security. Perhaps having Tycho fly today was a bit premature. Wedge glanced down penitently. I stand corrected, sir. Akbar broke the uneasy silence following Wedge's admission. What is done is done. Now, using Captain Selchu in the scenario would have made it that much more difficult, would it not? A smile creeping back on his face, Wedge nodded. Yes, sir. Which is what I wanted. Horn is good. Very good and the trio of pilots flying on his side in the exercise are not bad either. Overall, Horn or Broar Jace, the Thyferon, are the best pilots in the whole group. Jace is arrogant, which gets under Horn's skin and keeps him working hard. Horn, on the other hand, is impatient. That'll get him killed. And the only way to make that apparent to him is by having someone shoot him up in exercises. Tycho can do that. The door to Akbar's office opened, and a female rebel officer led a pilot in a black flight suit into the room. Admiral, this is Captain Selchu. Tycho snapped to attention. Reporting is ordered, sir. At ease, Mr. Selchu. Wedge gave the slightly taller man a reassuring smile. The Admiral eased himself out of his chair. You may leave us, Lieutenant. The Mon Calamari waited for the door to close behind his aide. Then he nodded toward Wedge. Captain Selchu, Commander Antilles has told me that you have agreed to a remarkable number of restrictions on yourself and your activities. Is this true? Tycho nodded. Yes, sir, it is. You realize you will be flying a defenseless bomb. You will have no privacy and no freedom. I do, sir. The Mon Calamari closed his mouth for a moment and stared silently at the blue-eyed pilot. You will be treated no better than I was when I served as a slave to Grand Moff Tarkin. You will be treated worse, in fact, because General Salm here believes you are a threat to the New Republic. Why do you agree to such treatment? Tycho shrugged. It's my duty, sir. I chose to join the rebellion. I willingly froze on Hoth. I followed orders and assaulted a Death Star. I volunteered for the mission that got me in all this trouble. I did all those things because that's what I agreed to do when I joined the rebels. He glanced down. Besides, even the worst you can do to me will still be better than imperial captivity. Sweat gleaming from his bald head, Psalm pointed at Tycho. This is all noble, Admiral. But would we expect anything less from someone in his position? No, General. Nor would we expect anything less of a noble son of Alderaan. The Mon Calamari picked up a data pad from his desk. I'm signing orders to make Captain Selchu the executive officer for Rogue Squadron, and to put this Gavin Darklighter in the squadron as well. Wedge saw Psalm's expression sour, so he suppressed his own smile. Even so, he winked at Tycho. Two flights, two kills. Akbar glanced at the data pad's screen, then looked up again. Commander Antilles, I expect to be informed about any irregularities or problems with your unit or personnel. 
An M3PO military protocol droid has been assigned to your office to help you make out reports. Use it. The Corellian rolled his eyes. As you wish, sir. But I think that droid could be more useful elsewhere. I'm sure you do, Commander. But those decisions are made by those of us who haven't refused promotions time and time again. Wedge held his hands up. Yes, sir. I surrender. But you don't fool me, Admiral. You like mixing it up in battle the same as I do. But you work with the big ships, while I like the fast ones. Good. I'm glad we understand each other. Akbar nodded toward the door. You're dismissed, the both of you. I imagine you have things to celebrate. Yes, sir. One last thing. Wedge looked up, and Tycho turned around to face the Admiral. Sir? they asked in tandem. What did you think about the pilots in the redemption scenario? Wedge looked over at his XO. Did you get Horn? Tycho blushed. Oh, I got Horn, but just not as much of him as I would have liked. Smiling proudly, he added, Admiral? If the pilots I flew against are representative of the rest of the people we have to work with, Rogue Squadron should be operational within a couple of months, and the scourge of the Empire not very much longer after that. 3. Curtin Lure struggled to keep a self-satisfied smirk from ruining the stern expression he had worked hard to cultivate. He wanted to appear implacable. He needed to be merciless. He feared he would fail on both counts, but laid the blame on his eagerness to confront an old nemesis finally brought to heel. What had been a blot on his record would soon be expunged. More importantly, people who had ridiculed him would learn they had grossly underestimated him. And in doing so, they had doomed themselves. Curtin held his head erect as he marched down the companionway on the Expeditious. The Carrick-class light cruiser had not been built to accommodate people of his height, so he felt some of his black hair brush against the ceiling. A more cautious man would have slumped his shoulders slightly and lessened the chance of bashing his head on a light fixture or bulkhead support. Curtin, having once been told that he looked every inch a taller, younger Grand Moff Tarkin, from thinning widow's peak and lanky frame to sharp features in a cadaverously slender face, did his best to emphasize the resemblance. Even though Tarkin was nearly seven years dead, the resemblance still earned him some respect. On an Imperial naval vessel, respect for an intelligence officer such as himself was in short supply, so he took what he could get. The military arm of the Empire clearly resented having the government being run by the Emperor's former intelligence chief, and they took their displeasure out on the least of her servants. Curtin ducked his head and entered the antechamber of the Expeditious's brig. I'm here to interview the prisoner you took off the Starwind. The lieutenant in charge glanced at his data pad. He just got back from medical. I know. I've seen the report. Curtin glanced at the hatchway leading to the detention cells. He has been told nothing about the results. The soldier's face darkened. I've been told nothing about the results. If he has a disease, I want him out before he infects the... The intelligence operative held a hand up. Calm yourself. You'll bounce your rank cylinder out of your pocket in a moment. The lieutenant raised a hand to check his rank badges, and when he found them in place, he blushed. Play your little games with rebel scum, not me. I have serious work to do. Of course you do, Lieutenant. Curtin flashed a smile that was more predator than comrade, then turned toward the detention cells. Which one? Holding cell three. Wait here while I get you an escort. I won't need one. You may not think so, 
but he's listed as rating a four on the hostility index. That rating requires two officers to accompany an interrogator. Curtin shook his head slowly. I know. I gave him that rating. I can handle him. Remember that when you're in a back-to-bath washing away his fingerprints. That I shall, Lieutenant. Curtin grasped his hands at the small of his back and started off through the hexagonal companionway. His black boots made a solid clanking sound on the metal grating, and he measured his steps carefully to keep the sound rhythmic and daunting. The hatch to cell three opened with a hiss of pressurized gas. Yellow light spilled out into the corridor, and Curtin folded himself halfway to double to fit through the opening. He paused inside the cell and stood tall. He narrowed his eyes, then immediately thought better of it. He always said it looked as if I were wincing in pain. The older, heavy-set man swung his legs around off the cot and levered himself up into a sitting position. Curtain lure. I thought it would be you. Did you? Curtin injected sarcasm into his voice to cover his own surprise. How could that be? The old man shrugged his shoulders. Actually, I rather counted on it. What? The intelligence officer snorted. You mean you thought no one but me would be able to puzzle out your whereabouts? No. I mean that I thought even you could figure out how to find me. Curtin rocked back slightly from the venom in the prisoner's voice, bumping the back of his head on the top of the hatchway. This is not the way this is supposed to be going. Narrowing his eyes, he stared down at the old man. You, Gil Bastra, are going to die. I figured that the moment your ties started shooting at me. Curtin slowly crossed his arms. No. You don't understand how desperate is your situation here. You thought you outsmarted me and the Empire. You were cautious, but not insurmountably so. You are dying, even now. Bastra's bushy gray eyebrows met in a frown. What are you talking about? When we took the Starwind, I ordered a medical evaluation for you. You may have forgotten, that I always remember what I have seen and heard, and in doing so, you have forgotten how you ridiculed me for using Skirtopinol to interrogate a smuggler working for the Rebellion. You told me then that he died during interrogation because his boss, Billy, had his people dose themselves with lotyramine. It metabolizes the interrogation drug and can induce chemical amnesia or, in some cases, death. Curtin gave Bastra a cold smile. Your medical scan shows elevated levels of lotyramine in your blood. I guess you'll just have to kill me the old-fashioned way then. Bastra smiled openly, flashing white teeth in a thick, stubble-coated face. Since Vader was the last Jedi, I guess you'll even have to get your hands dirty doing it. Hardly. You never were one to break a sweat doing any work on Corellia, were you, Lure? Bastra slumped back against the bulkhead. I don't think you would have fit in, even if you'd made an effort. You were always your own worst enemy. I wasn't meant to fit in. You were Corellian security. I was Imperial Intelligence attached to your office. Curtin forced himself to calm down a bit and unknotted his fists. Lowering his hands to his sides, he tugged on the hem of his black tunic. And now, you are your own worst enemy. You have accelerated blastonacrosis. What? You're lying. No. No, I'm not. Curtin let pity slip into his voice. The lotyramine is very effective in masking the tracer enzymes for the disease. Here, on this ship, our medical facilities are far superior to those you would find among rebels. We were able to pick out the enzymes. 
Gilbastra's shoulders slumped, and his gray head bowed. His hands came together around his bulging stomach. The fatigue. Loss of appetite. I thought I was just getting old. You are. And you are dying. The intelligence officer idly stroked his sharp chin with a long-fingered hand. I can do nothing about the former problem, but there are ways to cure blastonecrosis. And all I have to do to be cured is turn in my friends. Looking down upon the gray lump of a man across from him, Curtin felt momentarily embarrassed by memories of having feared Gil Bastra's judgment of him and his work. Bastra had not been his direct supervisor, but he had been the one to assign officers to work with intelligence, and Bastra's lack of respect had been reflected through the personnel sent to work with Curtin. Every time that Curtin had felt in control and superior, Bastra had managed to undercut him and shame him. Is this another of those times? Curtin caught himself and nodded slowly. There is more fight in you than you would want me to believe there is. I know you fashioned the new identities for your Confederates and did a very good job of it, too. In fact, you only made mistakes in your own cover. Still, I knew that you'd find yourself a freighter and hop around the galaxy as your heart pleased. You were too old to change your lifestyle to something totally alien to avoid detection. You decided to gamble, and now you have lost. The old man's head came up slowly. Curtin saw fire still smoldering in the blue eyes. I'll give you nothing. Yes, yes, of course you won't. The intelligence man laughed lightly. You forget, I learned interrogation from a number of very good people, including yourself. I will get information from you. When I do, and you know I will, Corin Horn, Ayala Wasiri, and her husband will be mine. It is inevitable. You're overestimating your abilities and underestimating mine. Am I? I think not. I know you well enough to know you'll only break under extreme pressure. I can and will take you to the edge of your endurance, then float you in Bacta until you are ready to continue interrogation. Curtin folded his hands together. However, you are just one relay in the network that will bring the others to me. Corin Horn is too volatile to stay confined in any role you create for him, and I know that role had to be very constricting for him. Bastra's chest heaved mightily with a sigh. And how do you know that? Curtin tapped his temple with a finger. You think I have forgotten the falling out the two of you had? You decided to protect him because his father had been your partner when you started out. But you are a vengeful man, Gil Bastra. Whatever role you created for Corin would squeeze him every day, just to remind him he owed his life to a man he hated. Fat rippled beneath the prisoner's gray jumpsuit as he laughed. You do know me. I do indeed. But not well enough. Bastra gave him a grin that was all teeth and defiance. I am vengeful. Vengeful enough to engineer things so a disgraced intelligence officer would spend the rest of his career dashing around the galaxy trying to capture three people he once worked with. Three people who escaped out from under his hooked beak and were able to do so because his nose was so up in the air all the time that he couldn't notice the most obvious of mistakes they made. Curtin used scorn to smother his surprise. I caught you, didn't I? And it took you the better part of two years to do so. Ever wonder why? Ever wonder why, when you were about to give up, a new clue would surface? Bastra surged forward and stood. Though the prisoner was nearly thirty centimeters shorter than Curtin, the intelligence officer felt somehow dwarfed by him. I wanted you following me. 
Every second you were on my trail. Every moment I looked easier to catch than the others. I knew you'd come after me. And while you were coming after me, you wouldn't be going after the others. Curtin pointed a trembling finger at the old man's face. That doesn't matter, because you can and will be broken. I will have from you the things I need to find the others. You're wrong, Curtin. I'm a black hole that's sucking your career down into its heart. Bastra sagged back down onto the cot. Remember that when I'm dead, because I'll be laughing about it for all eternity. This cannot continue. I will not be humiliated any longer. I'll remember your words, Gilbastra, but your laughter will be a long time coming. The only eternity you'll know is your interrogation, and I guarantee, personally guarantee, you'll go to your grave having betrayed those who trusted you the most. 4. Corin made a vain grab at the hydro spanner with his right hand as the tool slipped from the X-Wing's starboard engine cowling. His fingertips brushed the spanner's end sending it into a spin toward the Ferro Creek deck of the hangar. A half second later, when his right knee slipped and unbalanced him, he realized having failed to catch the tool was the least of his problems. He tried to hook his left hand on the edge of the open engine compartment, but he missed with that grab, too, leaving him set to plummet headfirst in the hydro spanner's wake. Still trying to prepare himself for the agony coming from a fractured skull, he was surprised to find pain blossoming at the other end of his body. Before he could figure out what had happened, his flailing left hand caught hold of the cowling it had missed before, aborting his long fall to the ground. He hauled himself back onto the S-foil and lay there on his belly for a moment, considering himself very lucky. As the pain in Corin's rump lessened, Whistler's scolding gained volume. Corin rubbed a hand back over his left cheek and found a small tear in the fabric of his flight suit, prompting him to laugh. Yes, Whistler, I am very lucky you were quick enough to catch me. Next time, though, can your pincer catch a little less of me and a bit more of my flight suit? Whistler blatted a reply Corin chose to ignore. The pilot twisted around onto his seat with only mild discomfort. So, do I still need the tool, or did the last adjustment do it? The droid's tone ran from high to low in a fair imitation of a sigh. No, of course I still need it. Corin frowned. You should have caught it, Whistler, not me. I can climb back up here by myself. It can't. Even as he said that and slid toward the S-foil's forward edge, it occurred to him that he'd not heard the hydro spanner hit the ground. That's odd. Peering over the edge of the wing, he saw a smiling, brown-haired woman holding the hydro spanner up in his direction. This belongs to you, I take it? Corin nodded. Yeah, thanks. She handed it to him then climbed up on the cart he'd used to get up on top of the S-foil. Need some help? No, I pretty much got it handled, despite what the droid says. Oh, she extended her hand toward him. I'm Lou Jane Forge. I know. I've seen you around. You've done a bit more than that. You flew a dupe against me in the redemption scenario. She leaned her slender body against the side of his fighter, bisecting the green and white wording that indicated the X-Wing was the property of the Corellian security force. You put the Korolev down. Corin tightened the hydro spanner over the primary trim bolt on the centrifugal debris extractor and nudged it to the left. That was luck. Noara Venn had already taken the shields down with his missiles. It was more his kill than mine. You still did well. Her brown eyes narrowed ever so slightly. I guess. I have a question for you, though. Corin straightened up. 
Go ahead. The way you took that bomber after me, did you do that just as part of the exercise? Or was there something more to it? Something more? Lu Jane hesitated, then nodded. I was wondering if you singled me out because I was from Kessel? Corin blinked in surprise. Why would that make any difference to me? She laughed and tapped the Corsac insignia on the side of the fighter with a knuckle. You were with Corsac. You sent people to Kessel. As far as you're concerned, everyone on Kessel is either a prisoner or a smuggler who ought to have been a prisoner. And when the prisoners and smugglers liberated the planet from the imps, well, that didn't change anything in your eyes, did it? Setting the hydro spanner on a safe spot, Corin raised his hands. Wait a minute. You're jumping to a lot of conclusions. Maybe. But tell me, you didn't know I was from Kessel? Well, I did. And tell me that didn't make a difference to you? It didn't. Honest. I bet. The firm set of her jaw and the way she folded her arms across her chest told Corn she didn't believe him. There was a fair amount of anger in her words, but also some hurt. Anger he could deal with. There wasn't a smuggler or criminal who hadn't been angry when he was around. The hurt, though, that was unusual and made Corin feel uncomfortable. What makes you think I hold your coming from Kessel against you? The way you act? Lu Jane's expression softened a bit, and some of the anger drained away, but that just let more anxiety and pain bleed into her words. You tend to keep to yourself. You're not associating with the rest of us. Beyond a narrow circle of pilots, you think are as sharp as you are. You're always watching and listening, evaluating and judging. Others have noticed it, too. Miss Forge, Lu Jane. You're making meters out of microns here. I don't think so. And I don't want to be judged for things over which I had no control. Her chin came up and fire sparked in her eyes. My father volunteered to go to Kessel under an old Republic program where he taught inmates how to move back into society upon their release. My mother was one of his students. They fell in love and remained on Kessel. They're still there along with most of my brothers and sisters. They're all good people, and their work with inmates was designed to make your job easier by giving criminals other skills so they'd not return to crime when they were released. Corin sighed and his shoulders slumped. I think that's great. I really do. I wish there were thousands of people like your parents and kin doing that sort of work. The fact is, though, that even if I'd known that, I'd still have gone after you in the exercise. Oh, my being from Kessel had nothing to do with it? He almost dismissed her question with a glib denial, but he caught himself, and she clearly noticed his hesitation. Maybe, just maybe, it did have something to do with my flying. I guess I decided that if you were from Kessel and could fly, you had to be a smuggler and it was important for me to fly better than you could. She nodded once, but her expression did not shift from one of concern to smug triumph as he had expected it would. I believe that, and I can understand it. Still, there's something more there, right? Look, I'm sorry if what I did made you look bad in the exercise, but I really don't have the time to talk about this now. No time or no inclination. Whistler hooted something in an utterly carefree manner. You stay out of this. Frustration curled his hands into fists. You're not going to let this go, are you, Ms. Forge? With a smile blossoming on her face, she shook her head. If you'd gotten this far in an interrogation, would you give up? Corn snorted a laugh. No. So, explain yourself. He definitely heard a request for more than an explanation of his conduct in the redemption scenario in her voice. For a split second, he flashed on the times at Corsac when his human partner, Ayala Wasiri, had made similar demands of him. 
Ayala had been a conciliator, always the one to be patching up the disagreements between folks in the unit. That's what Lu Jane is trying to do. Which means I've managed to alienate a number of the other pilots trying to get into the unit. Concerning the exercise, I really just wanted to see how good you were. I'd been able to figure out where some of the other pilots stood in relationship to me, but I'd not flown against you. You know, you're not bad. But I'm not in a class with you and Broar Jace. Corin smiled quickly, then covered it with a frown. True, but you're still very sharp. I'd like to think the rest of the pilots are going to be at least that sharp. I'd even be set up to fly against that Gimbal kid in his redemption scenario tomorrow, but Jace volunteered before I could. His name is Gavin. Gavin Darklighter. Gavin, then. And you didn't want to be following Jace's lead? Would you? Lou Jane smiled. Given a choice, no, I guess not. Next to you, he's the most standoffish person in the group. Corin felt uneasy inside. I'm not as bad as he is. No? At least he has the good graces to deign to join us in downtime for some recreation. He's a sliced and blown data file compared to you. Corin turned to the left and pointed his finger at the astromech droid. Don't even start. Lu Jane raised an eyebrow. So, your droid thinks you should get out more, too? Something halfway between a snarl and a growl came from Corin's throat, but it lacked the power to make it menacing. Whistler has the ability, from time to time, to be a nag. His problem is that, in the time since I left Corsac, I've been in situations where I've had to be very careful. I moved through a number of identities that didn't allow me to be very open with people. For example, most recently, I spent over a year as the confidential aide to a succession of incompetent imp officials governing a rim world. One slip, one crack in my identity, and I'd have been caught. And when you get out of the habit of trusting folks and relaxing around them, well, I understand. Thanks. Corin gave her a grateful smile. On top of that, I'm learning a lot of new things here, and I've been trying to concentrate on my flying. That's not easy. There's a whole new set of slang to get used to, and people from species I barely knew existed that I now have to work with and even share living quarters with. That is difficult. My roommate is a Rodian. That's rough, but I'll bet she's less idiosyncratic than my roommate. Corin whistled at the Gand pilot entering the hangar. Oral, come over here, please. The pilot's gray-green flesh clashed with the bright orange of his flight suit, and the knobby bits of his exoskeleton poked bumps in odd places from beneath the fabric as he walked. May Oral assist? I've been curious about something since we were assigned at the same quarters, but didn't think to ask you about it until now. Corn frowned. I hope you don't mind. You might take it personally, and I don't mean to embarrass you. The Gand just watched him with multifaceted eyes. Craig would hope to avoid embarrassment as well, but you may ask. Corin nodded in what he hoped was a friendly manner. Why do you speak of yourself in the third person? Craig is embarrassed by not understanding your question. Lu Jane smiled. You do not seem to refer to yourself with the pronoun I. And you alternate the names you use. The Gan's mouth parts clicked open in what Corin had decided was a Gan's best approximation of a human smile. Oral understands. And? Oral crossed his arms, then tapped his trio of fingers against his body's deltoid armor plates. On Gand, it is held that names are important. Any Gand who has achieved nothing is called Gand. Before Oral was given Oral's name, Oral was known as Gand. Once Oral had made a mark in the world, Oral was given the Krig surname. Later, by mastering the difficulties of astro navigation and flight, Oral earned the right to be called Oral. The woman frowned. 
this still does not explain why you do not use pronouns to refer to yourself. Craig apologizes. On GAND, only those who have achieved great things are permitted to use pronouns for self-designation. The use of such carries with it the presumption that all who hear the speech will know who the speaker is. And this assumption is only true in the case where the speaker is so great, the speaker's name is known to all. Corin found the system curious, but somehow satisfying. It always does seem that those who use I the most are the ones who have the least in the way of accomplishments to justify it. The Gans have formalized a system we should have come up with long ago. So Ural is the equivalent of Corin, and Krig is the same as Horn for me? Exactly. Then why do you sometimes refer to yourself by your family name and sometimes by your own name? The Gand looked down for a moment, and his mouth parts closed. When a Gand has given offense or is ashamed of his actions, this diminishes the gains made in life. Name reduction is an act of contrition, an apology. Oral would like to think Oral will not often be called Krig. But Krig knows the likelihood of this is slender. Whistler tooted jauntily at Corin. People would know my first name was Corin even if we did use this system. He rolled his eyes, and any droid who wanted to keep his name would have run his little diagnostic program and told me if the extractor was adjusted correctly or not by now. Lu Jane glanced over at him. Trouble with the engine? Nothing major. Corin pointed down into the hole. I had to replace an extractor a while back, and keeping it trimmed up over the first fifty parsecs is important. Lu Jane nodded. Until it seats itself properly. Looks like you're working on the housing when you really ought to be just putting a spacer on the axle. You know about fixing these things? She shrugged. Land speeder repair was one of the trade skills my father used to teach. The T-47 uses virtually identical debris extraction systems for the engine. What you're doing will work, but you'll keep making adjustments for another six months. I can measure up a spacer and have it ground down to size for you in a half an hour or so. Really? Sure, if you want the help. Corin frowned. Why wouldn't I? You'd owe me a favor, and you'd have to trust me. Trusting someone he did not know did feel odd to him, but not so much so that he could not do it. I see your point. I think, though, I can trust you. We have a deal, then? Ural looked up at Lujane. You will need a spacer and laser calipers? Ural will obtain them, if you wish. Please. Corn leaned back on the S-foil. I appreciate this help. She smiled slyly. I hope you think that after you hear what my favor is. Name it. After we fix up your X-Wing, you come with me to downtime and get to know some of the others who are likely to make it into the squadron. We've all got the thing pretty well figured out. Gavin's a wild card, but Broar Jace thinks he will probably knock him from the running. A few of us are at the lower edge of what we assume will be acceptable scores, but we hope to make it. Anyway, we congregate down there, swap stories, and get to know each other. Since you'll undoubtedly be in, you should join us. Corin nodded. Okay, I'll do that but that's not the favor I owe you. If that's the way you want it. Definitely. Corin smiled at her. I owe you for more than just helping with the engine. Asking me to become friends with folks I should already be getting to know isn't a favor I'd be doing you, but one I'll be doing myself. One thing, though. I'm not going to have to get along with Roar Jace, am I? Why should you be the first? Good. As Oral returned with the part and the tool, Corin winked at Lu Jane. Well, let's get this engine working. Then we can see if there's a way to fix up my relations with the rest of Rogue Squadron. 5. Corin Horn tried to kill his smile as he entered the white briefing amphitheater. 
Then he saw all the other pilots, who could smile, were absolutely beaming. Not a one of the nervous expressions we were all wearing the other night in downtime. The first message in the queue on his data pad had informed him that after breakfast he was to report for Rogue Squadron's first briefing. The message itself had been neutral and routine in wording, even though it was the first official notification that he'd made it into the squadron. He'd had a pretty good idea that he'd make it, but despite assurances from the other candidates, he'd never allowed himself to assume he would make it. In the past, he'd been burned by making unwarranted assumptions. Granted, those assumptions had eventually led him to join the rebellion, which was not a wholly bad thing, but it took him well away from where he had imagined he'd be at this time in his life. Even though he'd not allowed himself the luxury of believing he'd make the cut before he actually made it, he was proud of his being selected for the squadron. Corin had never been one to hold back. He'd gone into the Corellian Security Force Academy straight out of secondary school and continued the Horn family tradition by establishing new records in the training there. One of the last marks he'd surpassed had been set by his father, Hal, twenty years earlier, and Hal had beaten the record set by Hal's own father. And now I'm a rebel, an outlaw. What would my father and grandfather have thought? A cold sensation raised goosebumps on his skin. Whatever. They would have thought much worse things if I'd become an imp. Risati Enir waved Corin over to the bench where she sat. We made it. We actually made it. It was nice of Commander Antilles to agree with our group consensus. He mounted the steps up to Risati's row and slid in next to her. It hasn't sunk in yet in some ways. The Gand, sitting behind them, leaned forward. Ural learned your redemption run had the highest score of our training cycle. Korn flashed the Gand a big smile. He'd found exaggerating his expressions did indeed help Ural catch its import. Who came in second? Broar Jace, I bet. The Gand shook his head. Gavin Darklighter beat the Thyferon. The kid beat Jace? Corn glanced over it where the tall, brown-haired pilot from Tatooine sat talking with the black-furred Shistavan and Wolfman, Sheel. Corn, with years of experience in the spaceports and stations on Corellia, had spotted Gavin as being young, despite his size. It's in the eyes. The years just aren't there, but apparently the piloting skill is. The Twi'lek sat down next to Ural, looping one of his brain tails back over his left shoulder. Jace isn't any happier about it than he was about losing to you. He volunteered to fly in an eyeball in Gavin's exercise and got hit with a missile at range. He never had a chance. Corin nodded his head and looked up toward the front of the room where Broar Jace stood. Tall, slender, and handsome, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed pilot had proven himself to be very good during the selection exercises. The Corellian thought he might even have liked Jace, but the man's ego was as big as an Imperial Star Destroyer and likely to be just as deadly. The ego cases Corin had known in Corsac had always burned bright, but burned out early. At some point, they got themselves into a situation they could have just as easily avoided had they been thinking clearly. Corin smiled in Jace's direction and caught a return nod from the black-haired woman to whom Jace was speaking. Ural, how did Arisi Delaret do in the exercise? Middle of the hunt, after Noir Ven and ahead of Ural. Lujane Forge came in at the back of the group, with the others in between. The scores were still very good, but competition is stiff here. Wedge Antilles entered the room and marched down front to where the holographic briefing display grew from the floor like a mechanical mushroom. Joining him at the front of the room, Corin saw the mystery pilot from the day before and a black 3PO droid with a non-standard head. It looked more like 
the clamshell design seen on flight controller droids, where the concave upper disc overlapped the lower one, but left a facial hole. The unusual construction made sense, both given the lack of spare parts for droids and the fact that this droid was assigned to a fighter squadron. The little bit of sagittal crest on its head made it look somewhat martial. People, if you would be seated. I'm Wedge Antilles, the commander of Rogue Squadron. The green-eyed man smiled openly. I'd like to welcome you here and congratulate you on being chosen for Rogue Squadron. I want to go over with you the basic criteria we used in making our selections and let you know what will be expected of you as your training continues and missions are assigned to us. Wedge looked out at his audience and Korn felt a bit of a shock run through him as their eyes met. His eyes have seen the years, have seen more than they should have. Corrin knew of Wedge's background because Hal Horn had been one of the investigators trailing the pirates who killed Wedge's family at Gus Tretta. Hal had kept his eye on Wedge and had pronounced him a lost cause when he started smuggling weapons for the rebellion. Wedge exhaled slowly. You all know the history of the squadron. Even before we were formally created, we were given the job of killing the first Death Star. We did it, and lost a lot of fine pilots in the process. All of them were and are heroes of the Rebellion. They'll be as famous as some of the old Jedi Knights in the years to come. Rogue Squadron saw a lot of action guarding convoys and raiding Imperial shipping after that. We covered the evacuation from Hoth, fought at Gaul, and a year later, at Endor, we killed another Death Star. From there we went to Bakura and fought the Siuruk. After seven years of non-stop fighting, the leadership of the New Republic decided to rebuild and revitalize this unit. This was a wise choice because all of us, those who had survived, had seen a lot of new pilots come into Rogue Squadron and get killed in Rogue Squadron. Wedge looked over at the mystery pilot. All of the veterans wanted to see Rogue Squadron continue, but also wanted to see the pilots in it get the training they needed to survive. The Thai pilot nodded in agreement with Wedge's statement. Wedge looked back at the new pilots. About a year ago, Admiral Akbar, at the behest of the Provisional Council, presented me with the plans for reforming Rogue Squadron. Rogue Squadron had become a symbol for the Alliance. It needed to live up to its legend and become once again an elite group of pilots who could be called upon to do the sort of impossible jobs Rogue Squadron has always managed to complete. As you know, we have interviewed and tested a lot of pilots, nearly a hundred for each of the dozen positions you now fill. The reason I mention all this to you is so that you'll be aware of something that might not have sunk in during your selection process. You are elite pilots, and you are more than just that. But no matter who you are, or how good you are, you'll never be considered as good as Biggs Darklighter, or Jack Porkins, or anyone else who has died in service to Rogue Squadron. They are legends. This unit is a legend. And none of us are ever going to be able to be more than they are. Except for someone like you, Commander, who already is more. A grin blossomed on Corin's face. And I can dream, can't I? Wedge opened his hands. Truth be told, most of you are already better pilots than a lot of the men and women who have died in this unit. You are an eclectic bunch. Two of you had death marks against you before you joined the Alliance, and the rest of you will earn them as soon as the Empire learns who has been assigned to this unit. You were chosen for your flying skill and for other skills you possess because Admiral Akbar wants this unit to be more than just a fighter squadron. He wants us to be able to operate independently if necessary, 
and perform operations that would normally require a much larger group of individuals. Risati leaned over to Corin. Baron Administrator Calrissian had his own group of commando pilots back home. The ideas got merit, even if they couldn't stop Darth Vader from causing trouble. Corin nodded. Corsac had its own tactical response team. Wanting to make Rogue Squadron into something similar explains why some of us made it when others didn't. Corin still wondered what special skills Gavin was going to bring to the group, but he was willing to wait for an answer instead of assuming there wasn't one. The commander continued his briefing. Over the next month, you'll get the most intensive training you've ever had. Captain Selchu will be in charge of it. For those of you who do not know him, Captain Selchu graduated from the Imperial Naval Academy and served as a TIE pilot. He left Imperial service after his homeworld of Alderaan was destroyed. He joined the squadron shortly thereafter and participated in everything from the evacuation of Hoth to the Death Star run at Endor and more. He is a superior pilot, as some of you have already learned, and what he will teach you will keep you safe from the best pilots the Empire can throw at us. Wedge nodded toward the droid. Entrey is our military protocol droid. He will deal with all requisitions, duty assignments, and other administrative duties. You will be moving to a separate complex here to continue your training. Mtray has your room assignments and initial craft assignments, and will give them to you at the end of this meeting. So you're all now part of Rogue Squadron. What you can expect of the future is this. Endless amounts of boredom and routine, punctuated by moments of sheer terror. As good as you are, statistical studies of fighter pilots indicate most of you will die in your first five missions. While survivability goes up after that, the odds are still not good that you will live to see the complete destruction of the Empire. The reason for that is that you will be there to see bits and pieces of it being lopped off. Rogue Squadron will be given tough assignments and will be expected to complete them, specifically because we are the best there is. Wedge rested his hands on his hips. That's it for now unless you have any questions. Jace stood. Will our training consist of more simulator work, or will we be given actual X-wings to fly? That's a fair question. m -Tray has informed me that our squadron has been assigned a dozen X-wings. We have possession of ten at this time, with two more expected inside the week. When those ships arrive, we'll start training in them. Until then, and as a supplement to flight training, we will use a lot more simulator exercises. The commander smiled, and yes, we could have been assigned A-wing or B-wing craft, but we're using X-wings. You may debate the merits of the various ships among yourselves, but Rogue Squadron has always been primarily an X-wing squadron and shall remain so. Any other questions? No? Then you're dismissed until 0800 hours tomorrow, at which time we'll meet again and begin molding you into a true fighting unit. Corin stood, intending to head down to thank the commander for picking him for the squadron, but Jace approached Wedge first, and Corin refused to do anything that gave the impression he was following Jace. Later. I can thank him later. Nawara then stroked his chin with his left hand. So... Two of us are already under death marks. I wonder who. Risati poked him in the ribs with her elbow. You mean you aren't, Nawara? You were a lawyer, after all. Yes, and there are doubtlessly some of my clients still on Kessel who would love to kill me. But I'm not aware of having a death mark. His red eyes narrowed. The Shistavanin is a rough customer. I could see him as being wanted by the Empire. The blonde woman frowned. I'd taken his being one of them for granted. What about Andorni Hui? She's a Rodian, and most of them tend to work with the Empire. Did she do something to anger her old employers? Ural blinked his big compound eyes. Not her. 
Rodians are hunters who live and die by their reputations. And Dorney is a huntress who decided that joining the most celebrated hunting band in the galaxy, Rogue Squadron, is a way of furthering her reputation. Ural does not think she did anything to bring the wrath of her past patrons down on her head. Risadi looked over at Corin. What do you think? Me? I don't know. I don't think I ever ran into her when I was in Corsac. But I have trouble telling one Rodian from another, and I can't speak their language. I do know she wasn't on any apprehension lists I ever saw, so she didn't have a death mark before I left the service. He shrugged. Sheil probably does have a death mark on him, on the other hand. A lot of the wolf men were put out of the scouting business because of the Emperor's restrictions on exploration. Some of them turned around and sold their services to the Rebellion and found havens like Dantooine and Yavin. I don't think the Empire appreciates that sort of activity. More correctly, Mr. Horn, Riv Sheil earned his death mark when he slew a stormtrooper team that tried to apprehend him, thinking he was Lack Sivrak. The Black Protocol droid carefully ascended the stairs. Forgive me for interrupting, and please allow me to introduce myself. I am M. Trey, human cyborg relations and regulations with a military specialty. I am fluent in over six million languages and familiar with an equivalent number of current and historical military doctrines regulations, honor codes, and protocols. The ends of the Twi'lek's brain tails twitched, as well as being familiar with the personnel files of everyone in the squadron. Why, yes. Golden lights glowed deep in the dark hollow of the droid's face. My primary function requires me to carry such data around with me. Without it, Nawara held a hand up. So, you could tell us who the other individual is with a death mark on him or her. I could. Emtre's head canted at an angle. Sheil has made no attempt to conceal his death mark, but the other person has said nothing about it. Would revealing his identity be wise, Mr. Horn? Corin shrugged. I stopped being a law enforcement officer a bit ago, so I don't know if revealing that information would be a violation of the law. Counselor Venn might. The Twi'lek half closed his eyes. Hardly. Death marks imposed by the Empire are meant to be a matter of public record. And in this company, it is hardly a disgrace. Who is it? Risati asked. Noir is right. It's more a badge of honor here than anything else. Corin crossed his arms. Come on, Emtray. Say what you know. The droid looked at Corin carefully. Are you sure, sir? Why ask me? Of course. Very well. The droid righted its head again. The other death mark was issued after the brutal murder and vivisection of a half dozen people. Corin's blood ran cold. Who did that? The droid's eyes burned bright. You did, sir. You're wanted on Drawl in the Corellian sector for the murder of six smugglers. Six. Laughing so hard he had to hold his stomach, Corin sat down abruptly. He only partially landed on the bench and ended up on the floor at Emtray's feet. That's nothing. He swiped his hands at the tears streaming down his face. I'd forgotten all about it. The Gand looked down at him. Oral was not aware murder was seen as mirthful. Nawara then folded his arms. It isn't. About the time Risati stepped back, imposing Emtre between herself and him, Corin realized he'd quickly destroyed what his previous socializing had accomplished. He scrambled to his feet and composed himself. I can explain this. I really can. The Twi'lek lawyer twitched a brain tail at him. I've heard that before. Yeah, well, this is the truth, unlike what your clients were probably saying. Corin looked at the droid. Can you tap into registry files from here? I am fully capable of a whole host of functions in that regard. Good. See if you can pull up the death files for the names in the reports about the murders. Then match them up with birth bites. 
As the droid's eye lights started to flicker, Corin turned back to his squadron mates. The short form is this. At Corsac, in my division, we had an Imperial liaison officer who had enough ambition to dream about being a Grand Moff, and just enough talent for dealing with regs and bureaucracy to be a severe problem. He wanted us to bear down on all rebel smuggling in the system, but we were more concerned about hunting down the kind of pirates who actually hurt folks, glit smugglers and the like. Lure, that was the intelligence officer's name, threatened to bring us up on charges of aiding the rebellion. The Imperials fleeing to Corellia after the Emperor's death gave the Dictat a lot of support, and that meant Imperial officers suddenly had the muscle to back up their threats. My boss, Gil Bastra, decided to make up new identities for himself, my partner, Ayala Wasiri, her husband, Derek, and myself. But he knew Lure would be suspicious of time we all spent together outside the office. Gil and I made up the records for these smugglers, put hints out that they existed and were very bad, and then put out reports that they'd been murdered. Lure saw all the reports, and reading them was the closest he ever got to a field investigation. In a staged scene in the office, Gil accused me of having executed the smugglers, and I said I hadn't, and that he couldn't prove it anyway. We had a public falling out, and Lure assumed we never met with each other after that. We did, and set things up so we could head out and away from the Empire. Corin sighed. Lure and I did not get along at all all. He threatened me with a death mark for those deaths if I ever got out of line. When I took off, when he set me up and failed to kill me, he followed through. That's where the death mark comes from. The Twi'lek opened his hands and looked at the droid. Do you have the records, Emtray? I do. They have birth bites. Gil did good work. Convert the time of their births to military time. Reverse values for minutes and hours, then compare that to the birth date of the next person in alphabetical order. Using basic, of course. The droid tilted his head to the right. There is a progression. The birth time of the one is the month and day of the birth of the next. But the pattern does not loop all the way around. It does if you add in my birthday and birth time. Corin smiled. On top of that, the hospital where they were born doesn't exist, nor does the town where it's supposed to be. Risati emerged from behind the droid and patted Corrin on the shoulder. I'm happy to know you're innocent, but couldn't you have found something aside from death to use to fool your imp? Well, when you're in Corsac, you see enough death that you have to joke about it or it grinds you down. Besides, watching Lure read the fictional reports and react to them was funny. Then he would find Gil Bastra's death file amusing, I take it? Corin's jaw dropped open. What? The droid's head became level. There is a notice of Gil Bastra's death. It came when I asked for the data on all the names with the report. That can't be. Oh, I'm afraid it is, sir. Emtray's head tilted to the left. It was appended to Imperial Holonet transmission number A34920121. The pilot shook his head, wishing he didn't feel so hollow inside. Gil dead? No, I don't believe it. Gil can't be dead. The Twi'lek eased Corin down onto the bench. How reliable is the report of his death? The droid's eyes flickered for a moment. Answering that question, could compromise intelligence-gathering operations. What difference does it make, Nawara? Corin rubbed both hands over his face. It was reliable enough to be put out on the holonet. Nawara smiled carefully, though the sight of his sharp pegged teeth carried with it a hint of menace. No, Corin. The report of a death went out on the holonet. That says nothing about the reliability of the information upon which the report was based. That report could have been based on something your guild did, or even something this lure did to get at you. He's right. 
You must have been one grand lawyer to spot that sort of inconsistency. The Twi'lek slapped Corrin on the shoulder. You would have hated me if you were trying to make a case against one of my clients, whether he was lying about his innocence or not. So, Emtre, how reliable is this report? Are there other reports that corroborate it? I have no related reports. It wouldn't make any difference if you did, at least not any that came out of Corellian Security Force files. Gil had full access to the database, the same way he created new identities for my partner, her husband, himself, and me. He would have entered everything to make it look good. He really went all out. We had temporary identities that let us travel to the worlds where he had created solid identities we could hide behind. At my last destination, he had me working as an aide for the local military prefect. Risati gave Corin a hard stare with her hazel eyes. So, are you saying you aren't Corin Horn? No, I am Corin Horn. I used the identities Gil made for me when I ran and hid, but I joined the rebellion as myself. Corin took a deep breath and sighed heavily. Look, what I've told you about myself is true, but I haven't told you everything. It's not that I haven't trusted you, but a lot of it I didn't want to talk about. I... The blonde woman reached out and squeezed his shoulder. Hey, we all have bad memories. Thanks, Reese. Corin's chest felt tight, but as he spoke, he could feel some of the tension ease. There was a lot of bad blood between Lure and me, and knowing I was going to head out, I really started defying him. He decided to have me dealt with. On what I thought would be my last assignment, I drew an X-wing from the pool of craft we'd captured and converted to Corsac use. I was supposed to pull a surprise inspection on small-time smugglers who were coming in system. Whistler and I mounted up. The R2 had served as my partner in the field and had all the new identity files Gil had made up for me. Unbeknownst to Lure, Whistler also had already computed a number of jumps from Corellia since I had planned to take him with me when I left. Where the smugglers were supposed to be, I found debris and two flights of ties looking for trouble. I illuminated a couple with my lasers, then jumped out. That's the start of a long story about how and why I'm here now. Emtray looked down at him, his eyes glowing like stars in his black face. Sir, do you have copies of the identity files for Mr. Bastra and the others? Nope. Gil was the only person with a complete set, and I'm sure he destroyed them. I've only got mine, and they're stored in Whistler's memory. Perhaps, sir, if you could provide me with your files, I can search our databases and see if I can locate other files that were similarly sliced, thereby determining if Mr. Bastra's new identity is known to us. Oral sees the wisdom of this. Corin smiled over his shoulder at the gand. So do I. I don't see how it can hurt. Sir, if you will permit me then, I will make inquiries of your R2 unit and try to solve this mystery. Corin nodded. Do what you need to do. Yes, sir. Which reminds me. The droid passed each of the pilots a narrow piece of plastic with an embedded black magnetic strip on the back. These are your room assignments. Mr. Horn and Mr. Craig will continue to be billeted together. Mr. Venn, you will room with Mr. Jace, and Mistress Inir will share a room with Mistress Dlaret. The Corellian looked back at the gand. At least I know you don't snore. Heck, I don't even know if you breathe. The soft tissues just inside Ural's mouth wobbled around for a second. Oral does not believe you do either. Oral does not sleep in the same manner as most others, so your occasional production of rhythmic nocturnal sound is not a problem. Oral finds it somewhat soothing, in fact. First time I've heard it described as soothing. Corin blushed, then stood and patted the Twi'lek on the arm. I don't think you can describe anything about your roommate as soothing, my friend. 
Noara's red eyes darkened slightly. Since I won't be fighting with Jace for mirror space to preen, I think our conflicts will be minimal. I shall take solace in that fact. Risati, on the other hand, will have more trouble with the other Thyferon. Why? You think I'm going to worry about my looks to impress a lot of you? No chance. Risati folded her arms across her chest. I'm going to be spending my time becoming the best pilot there is in this squadron, so romance is not high on my list of priorities. Corin smiled. Besides, you don't need to work to be beautiful, Reese. Sure, just remember that when I turn your X-Wing into slag. Oh, I hope you would not do that, Mistress Inir. A plaintive tone warbled through Mtray's words and his arms flailed. The forms I would have to fill out, the court-martial and requisitions for new parts, the work would be endless. Easy, Mtray, I was joking. Ah, oh, yes, of course you were. The black droid's arms settled back down to his sides. If you have no further need of me, I will find this whistler of yours, Mr. Horn, and see what I can do to learn more about the fate of your friend. Thank you, Emtray. Corin suppressed a smile as the droid turned about with tiny steps, then headed for the door. Nawara, did you have to deal with protocol droids in court? The tips of the Twi'lek's head tails recoiled. They functioned as paralegals, but none were allowed into court without restraining bolts. A judge once threw a gavel at one. Not your droid, I take it? No. I was not a welcome sight in Imperial courts, so any droid I could have afforded would not have been allowed in. Risati frowned. But then there was no chance that the defense you offered your clients would be as strong as it should have been. That's not just. Law and justice are seldom served at the same time. Nawara shrugged. The quest for justice has brought us all to the Alliance, has it not? Reese, you want justice for the dislocation of your family when the Empire made them flee Bespin. I am looking for the justice I could not get for my clients. Corin wants the justice denied to innocent people oppressed by Imperial officials. Nawara stopped and turned toward the Gand. And you, my friend, what is the justice you seek? Ural's armored lids closed for a second over his multifaceted eyes. Ural does not believe you would fully understand what it is Ural seeks. The acceptance Ural has known here is indeed a welcome relief from the prejudice of the Empire. This shall suffice as Ural's justice. A noble quest indeed, Ural, Nawara assured him. Corin led the quartet from the briefing room. Their route to their new homes took them out of the main complex, through a tunnel, to a smaller warren of rooms and suites. The rebel base had once been an extensive mine complex on Commonor's largest moon, Folor. The Commodore system had been chosen because of the high level of shipping traffic that passed through it, and because of its proximity to Corellia and the Core Worlds. Corin led his right hand trail over the smooth surface of the tunnel walls. Are we really after justice, Nawara, or do we really want revenge? Or is this a case, Corin, where revenge and justice are two aspects of the same thing? We are all committed to seeing the Empire brought down. The Emperor's death advanced our cause. But not enough to bring the conflict to the conclusion we want. Three in ten worlds are in open rebellion, and perhaps another twenty percent are nominally supportive of our fight, but half the worlds are still firmly allied against us. When the Emperor dissolved the Senate, he gave the Moths control over their provinces. While I do not believe Palpatine saw that action as a hedge against disaster, that is, in effect, what it has become. I know. If not for some of the Moths playing power games against each other, we'd be hard-pressed to keep from being driven away from the core. The Corellian frowned. Then again. 
with Vader and the Emperor dead and the Death Stars destroyed, I wonder if the Rebellion hasn't lost some of its fire. I agree with that. Risati moved to the front of the quartet, then turned to walk backward down the hallway and face them. Vader was a symbol, just like the Emperor, and when they died, the relief was palpable. I think a lot of folks believe the whole rebellion was won there. I'm taking the revitalization of Rogue Squadron as a sign that at least Commander Antilles and Admiral Akbar don't share that belief. The Twi'lek looped one of his brain tails back over his left shoulder. By defeating the Emperor at Endor, the rebellion proved itself a legitimate power in the galaxy. Within a month after Endor, the Alliance's Provisional Council issued their declaration of a new republic. The rebellion became a government, albeit one with very little in terms of real assets, and it presented an alternative to the Empire. Worlds joining the new republic are doing so on their own terms, and those negotiations are far from joyous things. Destroying the Emperor did bring a lot of nations into the fold, but primarily those who felt most oppressed or most threatened. Corin thought for a moment. What you're saying is that the victory at Endor transformed a military insurgency into a political entity. Not exactly, but close. Politics was always part of the rebellion, but it remained largely dormant while the war was being fought. With the death of the Emperor, it became more important because it allowed the rebellion to bring in more worlds without having to resort to military conquest. Nawara pointed vaguely back behind them with a taloned finger. Commander Antilles' victory tour shows how important politics was and is to the rebellion. A key military leader was taken out of service and forced into diplomatic duty. And there are all the stories about Luke Skywalker and the possibility of reestablishing the Jedi Knights. Risati smiled. Even though the Jedi had been wiped out by the time I was born, my grandmother used to tell me stories about them and the Clone Wars. My grandfather fought in the Clone Wars. The Twi'lek stared at Corrin. Your grandfather was a Jedi? No, just an officer with Corsac, like my father and me. He knew some Jedi Knights and fought alongside them in a couple of actions near Corellia. But he wasn't one. His best friend was, and died in the wars. But Grandpa never talked about those times very much. Corrin glanced down. When Vader started hunting down all the Jedi, Corsac resources were used to find them, and my grandfather didn't like that at all. The sort of resentment such Imperial action engendered among the people is precisely the means by which the Alliance is able to bring worlds in to join it. Princess Organa and the host of diplomats working for the New Alliance have done more to strengthen the New Republic than the whole Katana fleet could do if that legend was true and we had control of it. Even so, there is a limit to what the diplomats can do. Hence, the reconstruction of Rogue Squadron. I think so, Corin. Risati frowned. What am I missing? Corin jerked his head toward Nawara. He's saying that the diplomats have pretty much mined all the ore they can find. The worlds who want to join us have. Those who don't, haven't. And those who aren't sure will need some convincing. Thyfera, for example, is the source of 95% of the Bacta in the galaxy. They're neutral right now and making grand profit selling to all sides, but we want them in our camp. Putting two of their people in Rogue Squadron sends a message to the Thyferans that we value them. The same goes for having the Bothan in the squadron. And the unit is commanded by a Corellian and has another Corellian pilot in it. Nawara tapped himself on the chest. I'm either a token Twi'lek or a token lawyer. Risati laughed. I'm a token refugee, I guess. Ural snapped a trio of fingers against his billet data card. Ural is token Gand. So if this unit is a symbol that's filled with symbols, the supposition is that we have to do something very symbolic to get more worlds to join the new republic. Corn smiled. 
As long as that means I get to bring justice to a bunch of Imperial pilots, I'm all for it. Oh, I think you'll have that opportunity, Corrin. The Twi'lek's rosy eyes darkened to the color of dried blood. I'd guess Rogue Squadron will have the greatest of that sort of opportunity. You think you know what target will be coming up next, Nawara? It's only logical, Corrin. Both of the Twi'lek's head tails twitched in tandem. Before too long, we'll be going after the biggest symbol of all. Let's hope they train us very well, because Rogue Squadron is bound to be the tip of the spear the Alliance stabs into the heart of the Empire. A chill ran down Corrin's spine. Coruscant? The sooner it falls, the sooner the Empire falls apart. I never wanted to go to Coruscant, the Corellian pilot smiled. But if I have to go, doing it in the cockpit of a rebel X-Wing will make the visit just that much more memorable. 7. Wedge Antilles killed his proud smile as he began his walking inspection of his X-Wing. He brushed his fingers along the underside of its smooth nose cone. Newly refinished. Good. He emphasized this judgment with a firm nod of his head so those who could not hear him could determine what he was saying and thinking. Throughout the cavernous hangar, the pace of work had slowed as he came to inspect his ship. His squadron had already cleared the area and waited for him on the dark side of Folor, leaving him alone with the technical staff. Aside from his X-Wing, three other X-Wings being worked on, and a scattering of other broken-down fighters, there was little to occupy the attention of the crews. While they made a show of rolling up cables and sorting tools, they watched him and his reaction to their work. He continued on around to the starboard side of the craft, noticing how clean the crew had gotten the proton torpedo alleys. Another nod. The background hum of conversation picked up in volume and speed, but Wedge ignored it and continued his walk around. He could have cited dozens of reasons for doing a pre-flight inspection of his fighter, and all of them would have been good and right and militarily proper. The starfighter had seen him through seven years of pitched battles with a minimal amount of failure. The inspection allowed him to spot anything that might be trouble before he got out into space, and that would save him a long, cold wait for a rescue crew. More importantly than that, his taking a tour around his ship set a good example for the rest of Rogue Squadron. He wanted to fight the belief that because they were elite pilots, they were above the mundane sort of duties all other pilots had to endure. Most of his people weren't like that, but he didn't want laziness by one person to slowly spread to the rest of the squadron. While they weren't there to see him, he knew news of his inspection would get back to them. And if I do this right... They'll be sorry they missed the show. He paused for a moment and looked at the rows of TIE fighters, bombers, and interceptors painted on the side of the ship. Big Death Stars bracketed the collection of smaller ships on either side, and Sea Rook fighters had started a new row, right at the top of the red stripe bisecting the fuselage. It has been a long fight, and will be longer still. Behind him, Wedge heard some chittering that m -tray translated. Master Zrai apologizes for not being able to fit all your kills in the space allotted. The ships rendered in red are meant to represent a squadron worth of kills, meaning a dozen. Wedge frowned as he turned to face the droid. I have a vague idea how many ships there are in a squadron, you know. Yes, of course, sir. I know that. But given that the Verpine normally count in base 6, and humans use base 10, 12, which to a Verpine is known as four fists, the potential for confusion warranted explanation. The human held his hands up in surrender. Fine. Just tell him that he can group kills by dozens or gross lots. It makes no difference to me. 
Gross lots, sir? A dozen dozen, Emtray. One hundred and forty-four? Four wings? Yes, forty-eight fists in verpine. Emtray looked from Wedge to the brown insectoid trailing behind them. Sir, if I knew you were fluent in verpine. Enough, Trey. I'm not fluent in verpine, but I have a head for figures. Let me finish this inspection. Wedge took a deep breath and slowly let it out again. I'm going to have to talk to Luke and find out how he puts up with his 3PO unit. Wait, that won't work. I don't have a sister around here to foist the droid off on. He walked back to the starboard engines and inspected the cooling vanes and what little of the centrifugal debris extractor he could find. After looking over the engines, he examined the lenses for the deflector shield projectors and saw new ones had been installed. Shields gave the X-Wing its major advantage over TIE fighters and contributed to the X-Wing's reputation for being able to take a lot of damage before it went down. Even though the lasers were being powered down for the training exercises, seeing the deflector shield equipment in good repair pleased him. He paid very careful attention to the twin laser cannons mounted on the ends of the ship's stabilizer foils. He pulled down on the bottom one and felt a slight shift before the unpowered actuator prohibited movement. That was good. More play than a couple of centimeters meant the lasers might shift out of alignment during use. Emtray, ask Zrai what range he zeroed these lasers at. A click-buzz exchange took place between Tech and Droid. He says he zeroed them at 250 meters, Commander. Good. When they had flown against the Death Star, the X-Wings had been reconfigured so their zero, the point where the four beams converged, was nearly half a kilometer. That allowed them to be employed very effectively in knocking out stationary ground targets. In space combat, where ranges shrank and targets moved quite a bit, keeping the focal point closer increased the chances of scoring lethal hits on the enemy. While the lasers could still hit another fighter at a range of more than a kilometer, the lasers were at their most powerful at the close ranges common in dogfights. The cannon's barrels, flashback suppressors, gate couplers, and lasing tips seemed in good shape. Ducking beneath the cannons, he swung around to the aft of the X-Wing. Power couplings, deflector generators, exhaust ports, and power cell indicators all seemed in order. The inspection of the port S-foils and cannons showed them to be in good repair. His inspection ended with his return to the nose of the craft. He bowed his head to the Verpine tech. It looks as good as new, if not better. Emtray translated, and the Verpine started buzzing. Wedge couldn't figure out what was being said, but the friendly pat on the arm by the insect man told Wedge the enthusiasm he heard was positive. Emtray, what did you tell him? I told him that you think this ship is superior to what it was in its pre-molt stage. That is high praise. He is saying that he has a passion for restoring antiques like this and has taken the liberty to make minor adjustments that will enhance performance. Oh, wonderful. Wedge smiled and kept his tone light. The Burpine, with their fascination for technology and with eyesight that allows them to spot microscopic details like stress fractures without magnifying equipment, made for some of the best tech support in the galaxy. They were also known, however, for tinkering with the ships for which they cared. Wedge had never had a problem in that regard, but stories abounded about ships where the controls had been reconfigured into what a Verpine found would be a much better alignment. Not realizing, most pilots did not have microscopic vision or didn't think in base six. Continuing to smile, Wedge mounted the ladder and assistant tech ran up against the side of the X-Wing. Poised on the edge of the cockpit, the pilot looked at his astromech. 
he didn't recognize it beyond realizing it was one of the flowerpot-topped R5 droids. Though the R5 was a newer model astromech droid, Wedge actually preferred the dome-topped R2 astromech droids like the one Luke used. Because of the lower target profile, they offered an enemy. Then again, if they're close enough to hit you, you'll take the shots before they hit the cockpit, won't you? The droid's panicked hooting brought a smile to his face. Don't worry, the shooting is not going to start yet. Wedge dropped into the pilot's seat and got a pleasant surprise. One of Zurai's improvements had been a refurbishing of the padding in his ejection seat. This will make those long hyperspace jumps more comfortable. He strapped himself in, then brought his systems up. All the monitors and indicators came to life as expected. Weapons are green and go. The R5 unit reported all navigation and flight systems were working, so Wedge pulled on his helmet and keyed his comm unit. This is Rogue Leader requesting departure clearance from Folor Traffic Control. Rogue One is clear for departure. Have a good flight, Commander. Thank you, Control. With the flick of a switch, he cut in his repulsor lift generators and feathered the throttle so his fighter rose from the hangar deck in a deliberate and firm manner. Using the rudder pedals to keep the lift generators in tandem, he killed roll and yawing. He wanted there to be no doubt in the minds of anyone in the hangar that his was a steady, strong hand on the controls. His performance, he knew, would be pulsed out through the base's rumor network and become fodder for every idle conversation until something truly worthy of discussion displaced it. Adding some forward thrust, he moved the X-Wing into the magnetic atmospheric containment bubble and threw it to the airless exterior. Once outside, he kicked the Incom 4L4 fusel thrust engines in at full power and rocketed away from the craggy gray lunar surface. He rolled the X-Wing and brought the nose up slightly, sending the fighter into a gentle arc toward the horizon. The data screen in front of him reported the engines were working at 105% of efficiency, an increase he put down to verpine tinkering. Throttling back to 70%, then 65%, he dropped his speed and flipped a switch above his right shoulder. The stabilizer foils split and locked into the cross pattern that had given the X-Wing its name. He glanced at the upper left corner of the screen and saw his R5 unit had been designated Minoc. Are you called Minoc because you draw a lot of power? Urgent whistles and tweets were translated to a scrolling line of text at the very top of the screen. A pilot once said I screamed like a Minoc when we were in combat. A slander, Commander. I can understand that. No one likes to be thought of as a space rat. Wedge shook his head. I need you to adjust the acceleration compensator down a bit. I want 0 .05 gravity. The astromech droid complied, and Wedge immediately began to feel more at home in the cockpit. To combat the effects of negative and positive gravity because of maneuvers, the starfighter had a compensator that created a gravity-neutral pocket for both the craft and pilot. It prevented a lot of problems with blood flow and black or red outs in pilots, but Wedge felt it insulated him from the machine and left him out of touch with his situation. Flying with all gravity negated felt, to him, like trying to pick up grains of salt while wearing heavy gloves. It might be possible, but it would be a lot easier without the interference. Flying required use of all the senses, and the compensator cut out most kinesthetic sensations. And that kills pilots. Wedge was convinced that some pilots had died unnecessarily because they couldn't feel where they were. Jack Porkins, a heavyset man who always had his compensator on at full, had plowed into the first Death Star while trying to pull out of a dive. His repeated assurances, 
of I can hold it, I can hold it, died in a burst of static as his X-wing slammed into the Emperor's toy. Had Porkins not been compensated, he could have realized he wasn't pulling up, and he might have had time to do something else. Flying without full compensation is just one more thing we need to teach these kids. Wedge laughed at himself. Aside from Gavin, the whole crew and rogue squadron was almost his own age or older. He thought of them as kids because they hadn't seen the sort of duty he and Tycho had. And with what we'll teach them, maybe they'll survive longer than the rest did. Wedge rolled the X-Wing again as he hit the Terminator line, and daylight flopped into darkness. Punching a console button, he changed his screen over to a tactical scanner and picked up a dozen other traces. The screen reported and tagged 11 X-Wings and one Z-95XT trainer, the benign version of the X-Wing's little brother. He switched his comm over to the tactical frequency he shared with Tycho. Everyone green and running, Tycho? Affirmative. Systems are go. There's been some grumbling about feeding at the pig trough, however. No surprise there. Shifting to TAC-1. I copy. Flipping the comm over to the frequency shared by the rest of the squadron, Wedge caught the last of a comment by Rogue-9, Corn Horn. Blind, wallowing pigs, and slow. I'm sure, Rogue-9, your comrades who fly Y-wings will be pleased to know what you think of their ships. Sorry, sir. Good. The unit commander throttled back and fed his repulsor lift generators enough power to counter the moon's gravity. The reference to Y-wings, their slow speed and the underpowered nature of their sensors, had been heard in rebel camps since the earliest days of the fight against the Empire. The B-wings had been developed to counter the flaws with the Y-wing and replace it in service. But production had yet to meet demand, so plenty of Y-wings still saw service. Their reputation as wallowing pigs had led to the naming of the Folor gunnery and bombing range the Pig Trough. Alliance Command had originally designated it the Trench as a memorial to the pilots who had died running the artificial canyon on the Death Star. But pilots saw no reason to stand on ceremony. Y-Wings practiced their bombing runs in the twists and turns of the Lunar Canyon, while fighter pilots preferred the rolling and looping demanded of them in the satellite field circling the moon. Today I want you all to do some basic work on the gunnery range. Laser targets have been set up to provide you a number of flying and targeting challenges. Your run will be graded for accuracy and speed, and if you get hit, you'll lose points. If you suffer an equipment failure, pull out and you'll get another run after things are fixed. We don't want to lose you or the equipment, so try not to do anything stupid. Any questions? Horn's voice squawked through the helmet headset. Sir, our lasers are zeroed at 250 meters, which is a little short for ground attack missions. I guess then you'll have to be very good and very quick in shooting, won't you, Mr. Horn? Yes, sir. Wedge smiled. Good. Then perhaps you'd like to go first. Mr. Craig will fly your wing. Yes, sir. The enthusiasm in Horn's voice matched the energy in the roll and dive his X-wing executed. Shifting to ground attack mode. Good luck, Mr. Horn. Wedge killed his comm unit. Minoc, pull a sensor feed from Horn's R2. Shoot it to Captain Selchu on TAC-3. He popped his comm over to TAC-2. Captain, you'll be getting a data feed from Rogue-9. It will be interesting to watch. He's going in hot. That he is, Tycho. Very hot. He wants to set a mark the others can't possibly hit. Wedge nodded slowly. I think he needs to get a different lesson today. Here's what we'll do. Eight. Corin pulled out of his dive and skimmed the surface of Folor. 
He aimed the nose of his snub fighter at the paired mountains that marked the opening of the pig trough. A line of red lights burned on and off in sequence, seeming to send the light from plains to the peaks of the gray mountains. Below him, the rough rims of countless craters flashed past. Nine, should ten shift shields forward? Negative ten, even them out. We'll probably have targets at our backs. Korn glanced at his data screen. Whistler, can you boost my forward sensors? Screen for background formations and pick out what's anomalous. Yes, yes, take care of your communications link first, but just do it. Thanks. After a couple of seconds, the astromech droid complied with the request, and the image on the data screen refined itself. The mountains appeared in a light shade of green, and likely targets, in this case, the lights on the mountains, were translated into red circles that began to blink when he had a clear shot at them. From past experience, he knew Whistler would turn the circles into diamonds if they proved to be hostile. The fighter shot forward into the trench. Tall, jagged walls rose tall on either side of him. Unlike canyons carved through stone by the relentless flow of water, this one boasted sharp walls that would grind a fighter into dust. It seems as if I'm flying between teeth, not stones. He guided the fighter up over a small rise and then down into a valley where two red circles became diamonds. His cannons tracked left and lit up the first target while laser fire from the gand hit the second. Nice shooting, Ten. Oral was anxious. Oral will wait for clearance to fire in future. Not at all. Two more targets. I've got them. Corrin let his fighter drift to the right. Pick up what I drop. As ordered. Corrin pulled back on his stick and climbed sharply to get at the first target. He shot it before its laser could depress enough to shoot back at him. Rolling his ship to the left, he moved back to the center of the canyon, then finished the roll with an inside loop that brought him down to target the second diamond. It hit him once before he took it out, but the shot from the target did not penetrate his shields. Climbing back up, Corin stood the fighter on its right S-foil and arced around a corner in the trench. Coming up to let his sensors read the valley beyond a steep rise, he took laser fire from two bunkers nearly a kilometer distant. He pushed the stick forward and brought the X-wing down to the deck, then worked his way back up to the rise. I've got the one on the port side. You take starboard. A brief, high-pitched whistle came through the comm to signal Ural's understanding of the order. The X-Wing streaked over the ridgeline and immediately started taking fire from the target on the left. Corin dipped below it, intending to repeat his steep climb run from before when Whistler started wailing. A threat light burned in the aft position. Full shields aft, Whistler. Laser bolts shot past the X-Wing as Corin jinked to the left. He punched the right rudder pedal, vectoring thrust to kick the tail of his fighter into a bit of a skid to port. Doing that took him out of line with both guns, while allowing him to keep his nose on his intended target. He triggered four bursts of fire, hitting with the second and third. He rolled the fighter to present its belly to the mountain wall that had housed the gun he'd silenced. Then he cut in his repulsor lift generators. They created a field that bounced him off the wall and pushed him back toward the center of the canyon. Rolling back down to starboard, he killed the repulsor lift generators and dove to pick up a little speed. In doing so, he came out beneath Ural and still had laser bolts popping past him. Whistler shifted views of the canyon for a moment and showed Corin what had been happening in that section. An emplacement had been located on the reverse slope of the rise. Had Corin not ducked his ship back down when he took fire the first time, his sensors might have picked up its location. I would have come up, looped it, hit it, then rolled out and picked up the right side target. Ural could have nailed the left target and we'd have been set. 
Forward view again, Whistler. Seeing the array of targets upcoming, Corrin trimmed his speed back to allow him more time on target. It's going to get busy. Whistler hooted something about understatement. Targets came fast and seemed to get more accurate the deeper he ran into the trench. Corrin tapped his lucky charm once, then forced himself to concentrate. He analyzed target locations and plotted angles of attack. Rolling his fighter, diving and climbing, he wove his way through the gunnery course. He didn't get every target he shot at, but fewer of them hit him. Two-thirds of the way through the course, Corin and Ural approached another ridge like the one that had hidden a gun position on its back slope. Drop back, Ten. Let me draw fire from any back slope guns. Then you can roll in and nail them. A squeal answered him. Corin sailed up over the rim prematurely and snapped a shot off at the guns to the left. Rolling wide to the right, he side-slipped out of fire from below. Mid-slope down, Ten. Without waiting for confirmation, Corrin corkscrewed his X-wing around and lazed the starboard target. The port target still fired at him, but he dove below its line of bolts and cruised farther into the canyon. Oral got it, Nine. Congrats, Ten. Coming around to the last sweeping turn, Corrin saw a narrowing of the canyon down toward the deeper part of it. Above that crevasse, Four laser targets had a perfect field of fire for blowing any X-wing out of the sky. But they couldn't shoot down into the split in the rocks. Whistler, give me the width of the crevasse. The droid mournfully reported it was 15 meters on average, 12.3 meters wide at the most narrow point. Good, the walls will cover me. Behind him, Anticipating him, Ural had already rolled his X-wing up on its starboard S-foil. Corin smiled and dipped toward the crevasse while keeping his wings parallel to the ground. Nine, you need to roll. Negative ten. It's wide enough. A meter to spare on each side. If you go dead down the middle. If I don't, I'll be dead. Taking a deep breath, Corrin focused on an imaginary point about ten meters off the nose of his fighter. He kept his hand gentle on the stick and steered for that point. He kept it in the middle of the crevasse, floating left and right as sections of the wall jutted out from one side or the other. The choke point closed with him. Easy, easy. He drifted to port for a half meter, and suddenly the tight spot was behind him without his having left any paint on either side of it. The walls streaked by, black and gray blurred together. Corn found himself steering the ship almost effortlessly. He knew he could have handled the run at full throttle and not had a problem. It almost feels as if I have kilometers off each S-foil not a meter or two. The bright line marking the end of the crevasse yawned open before him. And now I've got targets. Swooping up and out of the rock slit, Corrin's X-wing spat fire. He started with the lowest target, hit it squarely with the first shot, then tracked his fire up and to the starboard with a roll and climb. He blasted the second target, then continued his roll until he was inverted. Firing two controlled bursts got him the third gunnery station, and Oral, threading Corin's loop, tagged the last one. Corin came down, around, and shot past Oral as they headed out of the range. Hauling back on the stick, he stood his X-wing on its tail and rocketed away from Folor. Rolling out into a long loop, he traded distance for time and pulled up on Ural's wing as they both headed in toward where the rest of the squadron orbited. Commander Antilles's voice filled Corrin's helmet. Very impressive flying, Mr. Horn. Your score is 3250 out of a possible 5000. Quite good. Corrin smiled broadly. Hear that, Whistler? Rogue Leader was impressed. He activated his comm unit. Thank you, sir. You can head back to base now, Mr. Horn. 
your participation in this exercise is at an end. Consider yourself at liberty for the rest of the day. Yes, sir. Rogue Nine heading home. Yeah, I was at liberty. Liberty to be humiliated. Muscles bunched at the corners of Corin's jaw as he ground his teeth. He'd waited in the hangar for the others to come back to base, hoping to hear his mark had stood through the rest of the exercise. He knew he was looking for congratulations on his great flying, but not in the egotistical way Broar Jace would have been. He didn't want to lord it over the others, but he did want to know they thought he was good. The others had come back in pairs and, for the most part, had tried to avoid him. Lujain Forge and Andorni Hui had been the first to return. As he saw their ships come in, his smile became broad. He knew he had blown past any score they could set. They're good pilots, but I was really flying out there. They couldn't touch me today. Andorni had remained silent, possibly brooding, but who could tell with Rodians? Lujain had been almost apologetic. I got 3,300, Corn. And Dorney hit 3,750. What? Lujane hesitated, tucking a strand of brown hair behind her left ear. It was just our day to fly well. You inspired us, really. Inspiring, Horn. The Rodian's ears rotated toward him, then back again as Andorni wandered away. Lujane gave him a sympathetic smile. Want to head to downtime and get something to eat? The tone of her voice suggested strongly that he wanted to take her up on her offer to spare himself from what was headed in his direction. Despite the unspoken warning, he'd shaken his head. Thanks. Maybe I'll see you at the Tap Cafe later. Corin continued to wait for the rest of the squadron to return. Peshk, Vrisik, and Ural came back together. The ruddy-furred Bothan took great delight in reporting a score of 4,200. The Gand had been very quiet, and when he finally spoke, he said, Krig scored 4050. That answer told Korn something very strange was going on. In reverting to calling himself by his family name, Ural had shown himself to be ashamed of his score, but Korn knew he should have been ecstatic about it instead. The fact that Ural clearly didn't want to speak with Corin, and only relented after Corin insisted, meant that whatever Ural was ashamed of had to do with Corin. The others in the squadron didn't say much of anything except to report their scores. Each pilot had scored better than Corin, and most had done so by over 1,000 points. That didn't seem possible to Corin. He knew he had flown that course as best he could. On subsequent runs, I might score up in that range, but not first time out. That's not possible. Unless... Corin jogged over to where Whistler had plugged himself into a recharging outlet. Whistler, at the start of our run, you set up a communications link with someone. Who? The droid's holographic projector began to glow. A miniature image of Wedge Antilles floated between them. You sent him my sensor data, right? Sharp scolding whistles followed an affirmative tone. I know I didn't prohibit it. A curt squawk made Corn wince. Yes, Whistler, I did approve your action. Never again give out that sort of data without my permission. Got it? The little droid piped demurely then shifted to the sing-song tone he had used to warn Corin when Lure had entered the Corsac office. The pilot turned and saw the headhunter trainer come through the magcom bubble, followed closely by rogue leader. Purposely ignoring Whistler's bleats, Corin watched the ship land. Time to get some questions answered. Corin felt a tug at his flight suit leg as Whistler's pincer attachment closed on the cloth. He pulled away, tearing the material. You betrayed me once here, Whistler. Don't compound the problem. The droid's mournful tones played out in time with a funeral march as Korn closed with Wedge's X-Wing. 
He ducked beneath the nose and snapped to attention as Wedge descended the ladder. His throat thick with anger, Corn saluted and held his quivering hand in place until Wedge returned the salute. Do you want to speak to me about something, Mr. Horn? Yes, sir. Wedge tugged his gloves off. Well? Permission to speak frankly, sir? Knock yourself out, Mr. Horn. Corrin's hands convulsed into fists. You gave everyone else my targeting data. I flew my heart out and flew that course as good as anyone possibly could on his first time through. You turned that data over to the others, so they were making a run based on the things I had done. You gave them my score as a base and they built on it. Wedge's brown-eyed gaze did not waver as he met Corn's stare. And? And? It's not fair, sir. I'm one of the best pilots in this squadron, but it looks like I'm the worst. The others appear better, but they're not. I've been robbed. I see. Are you finished? No. Well, you should be. Or you can be. Do you understand me? The icy tone in Wedge's voice filled Corrin's guts with frozen needles. Yes, sir. Wedge nodded past him toward the exterior of the base. You need to examine why you're here, Mr. Horn. You're part of a team and have to act like it. If I need you to shoot a trench like that and feed your data back to a Y-wing squadron coming through, I'll have you do it. How good you are means nothing if the rest of the people in the squadron get killed. You might be the best pilot in the squadron, but the squadron is only as good as the worst pilot in it. Today, the others learned to use data from a reconnaissance flight to help them through deadly territory. You learned that you're not more important than anyone else in this squadron just because you're a gifted pilot. I'm pleased with those lessons having been learned by my people. If you're not, I'm certain there are other squadrons who would love to have rogues washouts. Corin's cheeks burned and his stomach turned itself inside out. He's right. He saw the same thing Lou Jane did and found a way to point out how serious a problem it can be. I've been an idiot. He swallowed hard. Yes, sir. Yes, what, Mr. Horn? I'm happy learning what I learned, sir. I want to stay with the squadron. Wedge nodded slowly. Good. I don't want to lose you. You've got the makings of a superior pilot, but you aren't there yet. You have the skills you need, but there is more to being part of this squadron than flying well. The training you get will be a bit different from the others, but your need to learn is just as great. Do you understand? Corin nodded. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Wedge handed his helmet and gloves to an astrotech. And just so you know... You're right to be angry. Remember this, though. Giving in to that kind of anger in battle will get you killed. I don't think you want that any more than I do. The leader of the squadron tossed him a sharp salute. You're dismissed, Mr. Horn. Corin returned the salute, spun on his heel and marched stiffly away, deeper into the hangar. He threaded his way through the fighters, stepping over power cables and around tool carts. He purposely steered himself away from where Whistler was recharging. The little R2 unit had perfected an I told you so whistle that Korn realized he'd heard far too often since his father's death. Mr. Horn. Korn stopped and blinked away the gathering clouds of dark memories. His hand rose in a salute. Captain Selchu. The blue-eyed man returned the salute and crossed his arms over his chest. Still walking and talking? Sir, either Commander Antilles is losing his touch in dressing down recruits or... Tycho smiled lopsidedly. You're made of sterner stuff than I might have otherwise imagined. Nine. Corin's green eyes narrowed. I don't think the commander cut me any slack, sir. 
Tycho held a hand up. Forgive me, Mr. Horn. That did not come out the way I wanted. From your Corsac record and the way you tend to excel in scenarios where you act alone, you have struck me as a loner. Loners don't tend to like it when they're made to be a team player. But that's not how I am. Is it? Corin frowned. I can work with others, but I know I can only rely on myself when things fall apart. I can't help that attitude because it kept me alive in tough times. Tycho pointed toward the passage deeper into Folor base, and Corin fell into step with him. The problem with that attitude, Corin, is that it keeps others away. It makes it more difficult for them to help you when you need it. It keeps them uncertain that you will help them when the time comes that they need you. Hey, I'll never leave a buddy in trouble. I don't doubt that. But you define buddies on your terms. Others may not see themselves as your friends. The taller man pressed his lips together in a grim line. It's clear that being here is not easy for you. That's an unwarranted assumption. I've adjusted as well as anyone. Corin glanced to the right at Tycho. Why do you think that, sir? You were with the Corellian security force and spent a good deal of your time hunting down people who are now your allies. That transition isn't something you can make overnight. It couldn't have been any easier for you, sir. You were an Imperial pilot. Tycho did not reply immediately, and Korn sensed a window of vulnerability that had opened, then slammed shut almost immediately. He knew it with the certainty he'd known when he'd hit on lies suspects told him during interrogation. He wanted to pounce and push, but the hint of pain he saw flash through Tycho's eyes stopped him. Let's just say, Corin, that my situation was quite different from yours. Tycho's face slackened into an emotionless mask. Different time, different circumstances. Corin heard pure honesty in Tycho's words and decided against pushing. That honesty cleared his mind and punched through walls he didn't realize he'd erected. You may be right, sir. Looking around here, I see the sort of smuggler's hideaway my father and I ached to bust wide open. Just looking at this place, I know it had to have been used by smugglers before the Alliance turned it into a base. If I'd known then what I know now, you would have been even more convinced that the rebellion was wrong. Yeah, I guess I would have. Corin slapped his own belly with his right hand. I remember being in the Corsac Academy when the Imperial warrants for Han Solo and Chewbacca were issued. They were charged with the murder of Grand Moff Tarkin. No word about the Death Star, of course. I remember thinking that if I were already in Corsac, I'd have gotten Solo. I thought he was a blot on Corellia's honor. The hint of a smile tugged at the corners of Tycho's mouth. And you still do. Corin winced. He smuggled spice for a hut? I understand that he made some choices that made his life fall apart. I can sympathize with his freeing Wookiee slaves. No one on Corellia liked the idea of slaves. But he sank pretty low after that. Tycho nodded. When your life disintegrated, you didn't sink that far, so he shouldn't have? Something like that. Corin stopped just before they entered the corridor out of the hangar. Is that your assessment of my opinion? Or your assessment of Solo in relationship to your leaving Imperial service as he did? Tycho's smile broadened. Interesting insight. I think there was a time that Solo, who had bound his conception of honor to his service to the Empire, forgot that honor could exist outside Imperial service. This seems to be a misconception that has been corrected. And correcting it won him fame, glory, and Princess Organa. True. 
But what's important is that he knows honor exists inside you and can only radiate out. What goes on outside can't change it or kill it unless you abandon your honor. Too many folks give it up too easily, then do whatever they can to fill the void in their hearts. Tycho shook his head. Forgive me this little lecture. I've had an unfortunate amount of time to think about this sort of stuff. Two Alliance security officers walked over to where Corin and Tycho stood. The female lieutenant spoke with a calm, even voice. Captain Selchu, are you ready to return to your quarters now? The taller man suddenly looked very fatigued, as if his skeleton had just become one size smaller so his flesh hung loosely from it. Yes, I believe so. Thank you for this conversation, Mr. Horn. You're welcome, sir. Tycho nodded to the woman. After you. No, sir, she said. After you. Her tone struck Corin as all wrong. He had assumed she had been offering to escort Captain Selchu to his quarters as a courtesy. But the edge in her voice transformed her words into an order. Why would they be forcing him to return to his quarters? I don't understand. She's treating him like a criminal. He stared after them, trying to reconcile the security officer's action with a need to protect Tycho from some threat. He couldn't imagine anyone in the Alliance base who would begrudge Tycho actions taken before he joined the rebel cause. Becoming a rebel was like starting over. The data screen was wiped and the past forgotten. Yet I still have reservations about Han Solo. Even so, I don't want to murder him, so he doesn't need protection. He realized he was attempting to rationalize why Tycho was being escorted by armed guards, and the most simple answer was because Tycho presented a threat to the Alliance in some way. The obvious ludicrousness of that idea shone like a supernova, because if Tycho was a threat of any sort, no one would trust him to be teaching pilots how to fly. Then again, he is assigned a headhunter trainer. There you are. Corn's head came up at the sound of the woman's voice. Just a bit taller than he was, but slender and walking on very shapely long legs. She entered the hangar from the corridor and stared right at him. Corin turned and looked behind himself to see who she was addressing. But when he looked back at her, she had stopped right in front of him. I was wondering where you were. Me? Corin raised an eyebrow. Are you sure you were looking for me, Arissi? She nodded confidently. Sympathy played through her big blue eyes. I was sent to find you. The rest of us are in downtime, going over what happened out there. Not enough laughs, so you wanted me to join you? He shook his head. Thanks anyway. Some other time. No, now. Arissi took firm hold of his left elbow. We do want you there, so we can apologize. Corin hesitated, covering his surprise. She sounded sincere, but she was from Thyphera and almost always in Broad Jace's company. He tried to figure out if she was setting him up, but the gentle way her short black hair lay against the nape of her long neck distracted him. I'm not sure I'd be good company. You must come. She tugged him gently toward the corridor. Look. We all used your data because Commander Antilles told us our exercise involved doing just that. It wasn't until we made our runs that he told each of us what had happened, what he had done to you. He ordered us to say nothing to you except to report our scores. None of us felt good about what happened, and we want to make it up to you. He nodded and started walking with her. So how did you get the job of coming after me? You picked the Sabak card with the lowest value? Erisi smiled at him, her eyes dominating a delicately sculpted face with high cheekbones and a strong jawline. I volunteered 
Nawaravan and Risadi Inir are trying to talk some sense into Broar, and I had to walk away. You'd abandon a fellow Thyferon to a conversation with a Twi'lek lawyer? Her laughter echoed faintly through the dim corridor. Strip illumination ran along the edges of the tunnel where the floor met the walls and gave them enough light to travel by. But most of the people in front of them were shadowed silhouettes. Broad Jace is from a family that owns a significant portion of stock in Zoltan. His people are known for being rather haughty and obstreperous. I hadn't noticed. I would have thought you a keener observer than that. She gave his arm a squeeze. Besides, Broar has noticed you. He sees you as his chief rival for supremacy in the squadron. He's forgetting the commander and Captain Selchu. She shook her head. No, he's not. He's just ignoring them. As Commander Antilles said, those who have served with Rogue Squadron before are legends, and Broar doesn't think it's possible to defeat a legend. Become one? Yes. But best one, never. Erisi, I appreciate your candor, but I'd hardly expect you to be speaking of a friend in such uncomplimentary terms. What gave you the impression we were friends? Perhaps the fact that you spend a lot of time with him? Oh, that? Erisi chuckled politely. Better the moth you know than the Emperor's new envoy. I could never truly be friends with anyone who grew up in the Zaltan corporate culture. My people are with Zukfra, the true leader in Bacta production and refinement. My uncle was the person who discovered the contamination the Ashern introduced into lot ZX1449F. Really? The woman glanced sidelong at him, her face frozen for a millisecond. Then she smiled and playfully slapped his left shoulder. You! I know Thyferon corporate politics is boring, but it's the lifeblood of my people. Though there are thousands of Ratiks who actually grow Alaji and refine Bacta, the 10,000 humans who run the corporations are really the people who make Bacta available to the galaxy. Since we're such a small community, and, I'll admit, a fairly affluent one, we set great store in the accomplishments of our relatives. Corin nodded as they stepped onto an escalator that took them down deeper into the heart of Folor. Choosing one of you from each corporate family was meant to keep things even? Were that possible, of course? Erisi winked at him. More of us would have been sent, I suspect, but strong involvement with the Alliance is a thing of fierce debate on Thyfera. Benign neutrality seems to be the course our leaders are choosing. Playing both ends against the middle means big profits for the Bacta cartel. But you felt strongly enough about the rebellion to volunteer to join it? There are times one must place higher ideals over personal safety. At the bottom of the escalator, they stepped off and walked across a small chamber to a dark opening carved in smooth, melted stone. Beyond it, lay a noisy stone gallery with next to no visible light, unless the bright colors of strobing neon tracery were to be considered adequate for lighting. Voices from dozens of alien throats croaked below or shrieked above the booming din of human conversation. The heavy moist air stank of sweat, acrid, cloying smoke, and fermented nectars from hundreds of Alliance worlds, and not a few Imperial strongholds. Corin paused on the threshold of the makeshift tap cafe the rebels had named Downtime. If I were still in Corsac, I'd be calling for backup before setting foot in a place like this. Erisi, taking his hand in hers, led him into the room. As if she could see things he could not, she guided him between holo-game light tables and knots of pilots and techs. Back in the corner, a holo-projector had been set up. It appeared to be projecting a sporting event being broadcast down on Commonor, but the exoskeleton padding the players wore 
and the curiously spiked ball they tossed back and forth weren't from any game Corin recognized. Aside from a quartet of Ugnaughts sitting right at the edge of the projection ring and staring up at the towering figures, no one appeared to care about the game. The rest of Rogue Squadron had gathered in a corner of the Tap Café. Corin spotted Gavin first, both because of his size and his nervousness. The youth stared at all the different aliens as if he'd never seen them before. That surprised Corin because he thought, with Mos Eisley being on Tatooine, Gavin would have had his fill of aliens. Then again, I doubt the kid spent much time there. He's as green as the foam on Loman Ale. Over on the right, Broar Jace and Nawara appeared to be deep in conversation. Sheil slipped past Corin and handed Gavin a mug full of a steaming liquid that smelled sweet. Lujane, seeing Corin, smiled at him and wrapped the heel of her mug on the table around which they stood. Corin's here. The Bothan's reaction to his arrival appeared to be relatively apathetic, but everyone else seemed to be pleased to see him. The Twi'lek pointed toward Corin with the tip of a head tail, and Broar Jace managed a tight smile. Stepping forward, the Thyfarin pilot offered Corin his hand. I want you to know I would not have flown with your data had I known. I'll be the first to sign the letter of protest to General Salm. Letter of protest? Nawara looked a bit exasperated. Some members of the squadron feel that a protest of Commander Antilles's treatment of you is in order. Corn looked Nawara in the eyes. You don't think so? The Twi'lek slowly shook his head. I don't think it will be effective, and I believe, quite honestly, that this incident is really fairly minor. Corin smiled. I'm glad to see someone hasn't lost a sense of perspective here. Broar's blue eyes narrowed. What do you mean by that? I mean, my friends, we're part of a military unit involved in an illegal insurgency against a government that controls the vast majority of planets in this galaxy. We're all volunteers here, and we've all come because we expect to win freedom and liberty for all sapient species by overthrowing the government. We're all willing to make the ultimate sacrifice if it comes to that, yet we're going to protest how one of the most decorated and revered leaders conducts training exercises? I don't think so. Gavin gave Corin a wide-eyed look of confusion. But what he did to you wasn't right. It was nasty and cold and meant to hurt you. I'll agree it was nasty and cold, but it wasn't meant to hurt me. He looked around at the rest of the squadron. Commander Antilles had a point to make with me, and he made it. And he made one with you. Your being here like this, your discomfort with what happened, and your desire to protest my treatment means I know you're going to be there when I need you to be. And you know I'm willing to do what I need to do to make sure our squadron can do its job. If that means I go in alone or with Ural or whatever to get information, I do it. The thing we all have to remember is this. There's nothing Commander Antilles can do to us that will be worse than what the Empire has already done on hundreds of worlds. They destroyed Alderaan. They destroyed the Jedi. And they'll destroy us if they can. Because of what he did today, Commander Antilles knows he can count on me. And I hope the rest of you do too. Arissi raised Corrin's left hand above his head. I think Corrin's correct. He might not have been the best pilot on the course today, but he's probably the one who learned the most. Lu Jane stood and gave Corrin a firm hug. As the second worst pilot today, I say thanks, both for your skill and your wisdom here. Corrin blushed slightly, freed his left hand from Arissi's grip, and extricated himself from Lu Jane's hug. 
thanks to all of you. But just so you don't think I'm this cool-headed all the time, I have to admit that I had a discussion with Commander Antilles in which he pointed out most of these insights. The Wolfman growled in a low voice, yelling, punches. No, just some clear and concise conversation. Sheil bared his teeth and Gavin laughed. Blue Jane fished into her flight suit's thigh pocket and produced a handful of oddly shaped credit coins. She held them out to the Twi'lek, who cupped them in both hands and smiled avariciously. He flicked at a couple of taloned fingers, then looked up and froze as if caught bloody-handed. Corin knit his fingers together and let them rest against his belt buckle. And those credits are for... Winning the pool. Nawara carefully slipped them into his pocket. I said you'd be reasonable. Risadi elbowed him. You took reasonable because you got the best odds with that wager. The Twi'lek looked offended. I hold opinions. I don't bet them. Corin laughed. Who had, we'll challenge Commander Antilles to an X-Wing death duel? Erisi raised her hand. It was an even odds bet, too. Nawara won by betting what was in my brain. But you bet what was in my heart. Corin pointed to the bar. In honor of your insightfulness, I will buy you that which your heart desires. She took his left hand again. And if it doesn't have a price, then I'll buy you a drink and we'll talk about how else to make you happy. Broad Jace bowed from the waist in Erisi's direction. To make her happy, you would have to make her family's corporation yet more profitable. And to do that means I'd have to be boosting the use of Bacta, right? Corin opened his hands and took in the whole of the squadron. And since the Empire buys Bacta and will be shooting at their pilots, I don't think that'll be hard to do at all. 10. The shuttle's pilot looked back over his left shoulder. Agent Lure, you'll probably want to strap yourself in. We're coming out of hyperspace. Curtin began to fumble with the restraining harness, then brought his head up quickly, embarrassed that his lack of coordination betrayed his nervousness. Thank you, Lieutenant, but I've traveled this way before. Yes, sir, came the pilot's oily reply. But I'd bet this is your first time to Imperial Center. Curtin wanted to snap some sharp reply that would sting the man, but a sense of utter and complete disaster washed over him. He had waited for two full weeks before reporting Gil Bastra's death to his superiors. In that time, he furiously analyzed and tried to expand upon any leads Bastra had offered during his interrogation. They all seemed to be dead ends, leading nowhere. But he knew, he just knew, they would put him on Corin Horn if he had enough time to figure out their greater significance. In his report, he had tried to stress the positive. But within hours of the report being sent on up the line, he had received his summons to Imperial Center, formerly known as Coruscant. He was ordered to make his way to the Imperial capital as quickly as possible. As luck would have it, luck he in no way saw as benign, passage had been arranged on a series of ships with a minimum of difficulty. This last ship, a shuttle on loan from the aggressor, effortlessly carried him to his doom. The wall of light visible through the viewport dissolved into a million million points of light as the ship left hyperspace. Imperial Center, a clouded gray world ringed by Golan defense platforms, seemed even more forbidding than he had imagined. He had expected to see that the world that had become a city would be as dead and cold as the emperor who had ruled from it. Instead, with boiling clouds burned white by flashes of lightning, the planet's true nature lay cloaked and hidden, as did his future. Imperial Center, this is Shuttle Obdurium, requesting clearance for entry on the palace vector. 
Transmit clearance code, shuttle Abjurium. Transmitting now. The pilot turned back toward Curtin. This code better be good. We're well within the range of the two nearest Golan stations. It is good. Curtin blanched. I mean, it is the code I was given with my orders. He started to go on to explain further, but saw the pilot and co-pilot exchange a quick wink and realized he was being teased. Don't worry, Agent Lure. The days of the Empire blasting one of its own shuttles apart to kill an intelligence agent are long past. Can't spare the ships right now, which is what makes me a bit more secure. Curtin forced an edge into his voice. And how do you know, Lieutenant, that I am not here solely to monitor and report on your attitudes? You're not the first man I've ferried to his death, Agent Lure. Shuttle Abjurium, the comm squawked. Clearance granted. Align course for Beacon 784432. Understood, Control. Abjurium out. The pilot punched the beacon number into navigation computer then gave his co-pilot a more somber glance. What? Curtin tried to stop himself from blurting the question out and began to brace for some stinging jibe from the pilot, but he got none. We're heading to Tower 78, level 443, Bay 2. And Curtin saw the pilot's Adam's apple bob up and down. Sir, the only other time I've been given that vector is when I had the pleasure of shuttling Lord Vader to the Emperor. It was after the disaster at Yavin. Curtin felt a chill slowly pour into him and move up his spine, bone by bone. Did Lord Vader fear retribution for his actions as I do? Perhaps the Emperor had meant to kill him, but Vader redeemed his life by bringing news of the existence of another Jedi to his master. Curtin's fist hammered his right thigh. If I had just a little more time, I could have delivered my quarry. Ahead of the shuttle, Curtin saw lightning flare from the clouds upward toward space. It hit and spread out, faintly illuminating a hexagonal area hanging above the clouds. What is that? Defense shield. The pilot punched a couple of buttons on his command console. A miniature model of the world materialized between pilot and passenger. Then two spheres made up of hexagonal elements engulfed the world. The spheres moved in opposite directions around the world, constantly shifting, with the hexes in the upper layer covering more area than those below. Imperial Center, for obvious reasons, has the most sophisticated system of defense shields in the Empire. A small portion of it will come down to let us in, then that section will be reinforced behind us, while another one will open below. Nothing can get in without clearance. The pilot nodded. Or out. More than one rebel agent has been caught trying to race back out while ships are coming in. It's a gamble, but not one that pays off very often. The co-pilot pushed a glowing button on the console. We're through the first shield. Our next opening comes two degrees north, four east. Course set, sir. Not much longer until we're down, Agent Lure. One thing that could go wrong now is a cloud discharging and trying to hit the upper shield through our opening. Does that happen? Sometimes. Often? The pilot shrugged. The power for the upper shield comes through openings in the lower shield. This tends to ionize a lot of atoms, making lightning travel that much faster along those routes. However, doesn't look like our hole served as an energy conduit very recently, so we should be safe. Turbulence hit the shuttle as it pierced the layer of clouds. Curtin tightened some of the belts restraining him, then clutched the back of the co-pilot's chair with white knuckles. He wanted to blame his growing feeling of nausea on the way the shuttle bounced down through the atmosphere. But he knew that was not its only cause. The world beneath these clouds is the last thing I will see before I die. The shuttle broke through the vapor shell around the planet 
and the pilot smiled at him. Welcome to Imperial Center, Agent Lure. Despite his fear, Curtin Lure looked out at the dark world below and felt overwhelmed by the panorama. Instantly recognizable, the Imperial Palace stood tall, like a volcano that had thrust itself up through the heart of the metropolis that dominated a whole continent of Coruscant. Towers festooned it, as if spires on a crown, and thousands of lights sparkled like jewels set in an incandescent mosaic on its stone hide. Beneath it, dwarfed into insignificance, lay Senate Hill, its tiny buildings, raised as monuments to the justice and glory of the old republic, seemed frozen with fright that the palace would grow out and consume them. Spreading out from that central point, brilliant neon lights in all manner of colors pulsed as if nerves carrying information to and from the palace itself. Curtain followed one river of light as it shifted from red and green to gold and blue, from the heart of the world out to the horizon. As the ship swooped lower, he saw depths to the light streams, where buildings had accreted, sinking the streets into twisted, broken canyons. He knew the light could not reach all the way down, and his imagination had no difficulty in populating those black gashes with nightmare creatures and lethal danger. But the lethal danger I face dwells above all this. Curtin sat back as the shuttle banked and the nose came up a bit. The pilot leveled the obdurium off, while the co-pilot flicked a switch above his head. A red square appeared on the shuttle's viewport and surrounded the top of one of the palace's towers. Lights blinked around an opening far too small to admit the shuttle, even with its wings folded up. We can't be going there. Where will we land? It looks small, Agent Lure, because we're still three kilometers away from it. Curtin's mouth hung open as his brain fought to put everything he was seeing into perspective. The streets below, which he had taken to be narrow tracks, had to be the size of major boulevards. And the towers, they were not slender, needle-like minarets but massive buildings designed to house hundreds or thousands of people on each level. And the structures on the surface, they armored the planet with layer after layer of ferrocrete. Curtin shuddered as he realized how deep the Warrens had to run on the planet. Yet he doubted anyone had set foot on the soil beneath Imperial City for centuries. It all struck him as impossible that a world could house that many people. But this was Coruscant. It was the heart of an empire that boasted millions of known worlds. If each one required only a thousand people to deal with it and its problems, Coruscant would have to be home to billions of people. And to see to their needs, billions more would have to be in residence, working, building, cleaning. Suddenly he went from wondering how Coruscant could house so many people to wondering if even billions of individuals were enough to oversee the Empire. Or what's left of it. The obdurium swept in closer to the tower. The opening appeared to be a black hole waiting to suck him down and rend him atom from atom. Though logic argued against expending the money it cost to bring him to Coruscant just to kill him, he knew that death hovered close and would be seeking him out. He had failed, and the price the Empire demanded for failure was dear indeed. Curtin ran a finger around his collar to loosen it, arguing against his death aside from the wasted expense of his travel, was a thought that proved utterly ludicrous to him. The only way he would stay alive was if he had something the person who had summoned him here found valuable. But he was just one person. 
The only thing he imagined he possessed that was not duplicated by ten or a hundred or a thousand other people on Coruscant was his life. I have nothing else that is unique. The opening loomed close enough for Curtin to see figures moving around in its shadows. The pilot punched a button on the command console. The shuttle's wings rose and locked up while the landing gear descended. The shuttle drifted forward, easing into the hangar, then slowly settled to the deck. It landed with only a slight bump, but Curtin's nerves magnified it until it felt as heavy as the blow of a vibroblade on his neck. Stealing himself for the worst, Curtin slapped the buckle against his breastbone and slid free of the restraining harness. Thank you, Lieutenant, for your efforts on my behalf. The pilot watched him for a moment, then nodded. Good luck, sir. Curtin pulled on a pair of black leather gloves and flexed his right hand. Smooth flight back to the aggressor. The intelligence agent stood slowly, letting his legs get used to the planet's gravity, then walked back from the cockpit and down the egress ramp. At the base of the ramp, four Imperial guards, resplendent in their scarlet uniforms, stood at attention. When he stepped into their midst, they turned as one and marched him toward the doorway at the far end of the hangar. The few people Curtin saw in the hangar did not look at him directly. Even when he turned his head, seeking to catch one of them from the corner of his eye, they paid him no heed. Have they seen so many people come this way and not return that it is no longer remarkable to them? Or do they think undue attention paid to me would find them being drawn along in my wake? Being as tall as he was, he could almost see over the red dome of the guards' helmets. As nearly as he could determine the four guards were identical in height and other physical dimensions, but their cloaks shrouded them sufficiently well that details that might have differentiated them from one another were lost. Because of that, they appeared to be identical to all the holograms he had seen of Imperial guards, with one minor exception. Their cloaks had been hemmed with a black ribbon. In the dim light, it had not been easy to pick out, and its presence almost made it appear as if the guards walked a few centimeters above the floor. The officially mandated year of mourning had ended over a year previously, except, of course, on worlds where notification of the Emperor's death had arrived late or, worse yet, inspired open rebellion. Here on Coruscant, that was not a problem. So Curtin took the ribbon as a sign of the guards' continued devotion to their slain master. They passed through the doorway and into a small corridor that seemed to extend on forever. Curtin thought he noticed a slight arch to the floor and a tremble in the structure that suggested to him they had entered one of the bridges between the tower and the palace proper. The closed passageway had no windows, and any decorations on the walls had been covered with meter after meter of black satin. Through the far end and along another corridor, the guards brought him to a doorway where two of their number stood. His escort stopped when the other two guards turned and pulled open the doors before him. He stepped through them into a large room the far wall of which was constructed entirely out of glass. A tall, slender woman stood in silhouette before it. Though the backlight from the planet's surface outlined her in red. You are Curtin Lure. It came not as a question, but a statement full of import. Reporting as ordered. He had tried to keep his voice as even and vital as hers had been, but he failed. A nervous squeak punctuated his sentence. I can explain my report. Agent Lure, if I had wanted your report explained, I would have had your superiors go to great pains to extract that explanation from you. She turned slowly toward him. Do you have any idea who I am? Curtin's mouth had gone dry. 
No, ma'am. I am Isan Isard. I am Imperial Intelligence. She opened her arms. I rule here now, and I am determined to destroy this rebellion. I believe you can aid me in this task. Curtin swallowed hard. Me? You. Her hands returned to her sides. I hope my belief is not unfounded. If it is, I will have gone to great expense to bring you here for nothing. Accounts will have to be balanced, and I don't believe there is any way you can pay what you owe. 11. Wedge Antilles smiled when Admiral Akbar nodded. I think you'll see, sir, that the squadron is coming along quite well. The Mon Calamari looked up from the data pad on his desk. Your performance figures and exercise scores are commendable. Your people are better than some operational line units. Thank you, sir. Their level of discipline is not that of line units, however, Admiral. Wedge looked over at General Salm. The irritation in his voice matched the sour expression on the small man's face. Having come up through the ranks of Y-wing pilots, Salm had not been pleased when the rogues staged a training attack on a full wing of Y-wing bombers. Though he had approved of the exercise and had flown lead in one of the squadrons, he clearly had not expected things to go so badly for his trainees. The rogues had lost four of their own fighters, but had destroyed all but six of the Y-wings. Psalm was one of the survivors, which Wedge felt was a good thing, and would have asked his pilots to leave Psalm alone if he had thought of it beforehand. Despite that, the nearly eight-to-one kill ratio had been better than even Wedge had imagined possible, and had made Psalm furious. I appreciate the general's assessment of my squadron, but these are elite pilots. I think making allowances for their high spirits promotes high morale. Wedge lifted his chin. My people have a lot to live up to. Right now, Psalm sniffed, they're living down to the squadron name. Begging your pardon, General, I think you're judging Rogue Squadron too harshly, and it's because we made your Guardian, Warden, and Champion Squadrons look as if they were lame, sick, and dying. The fighter pilot looked at Akbar. Sir, there have been no incidents, aside from the exercise in which General Psalm was a willing participant, in which Rogue Squadron has done anything untoward. The Moncal military leader set the data pad down. I think General Salm has legitimate concerns about modified computer code being downloaded into his Y-Wing's computers. I understand it painted your squadron crest on their primary monitor after they were shot down by your people. Salm's eyes blazed and Wedge fought to keep a smile off his face. Gavin Darklighter had created the crest, and with Zrai's help, had linked a digitized image of it into the startup and communications packages in the squadron. The crest, which featured a 12-pointed red star with the Alliance crest in blue at the center, had an X-wing at each point of the star. Though the image was not sanctioned by the Alliance, Astrotex had started painting it on the squadron's X-wings, and m -tray had requested unit patches that featured the design. Wedge had been unable to determine if it was Corin, Nawara, Sheil, Risati, or some combination thereof, who had talked the Verpine chief tech into adding the image to the target aggressor attack resolution software package. But he did know that Horn's R2 unit had done some of the code slicing. When the TARS package informed the downed Y-wing pilots of their status in the exercise, as Akbar noted, the rogue crest showed up to annoy the bomber jocks. I undertook an investigation into that situation, sir, and have restricted the unit's recreation time until I find out who did what in this whole thing. Psalm scoffed at that explanation. You have arranged for your squadron to use the recreation facilities exclusively. 
They get more time in the gymnasium now than they ever did before, and the squadron briefing room has more recreational equipment than the officers' lounge here. Lou Jane Forge spends more time as a social secretary for your brood than she does training. General, I'm building a squadron that will be given difficult missions, which means I need them to trust each other. If that means they have to be cliquish, then so be it. Akbar rose from his chair and walked over to where a blue globe of water hung suspended in a repulsor lift cage. The apparatus negated gravity, allowing the water to form a perfect globe. Within it, a school of small fish with neon blue and gold stripes flashed this way and that. The Mon Cal studied it for a moment, then inclined his head toward Psalm. It does not strike me, General, that your earlier complaints about the TARS tampering involved how Rogue Squadron spends its recreational time. No, sir. But all of this is indicative of the difficulties the Rogues are creating. I have three squadrons of bombers training here as well as two other fighter squadrons. The morale of my troops suffers as the rogues get rewarded for ignoring operational rules. Akbar gave Psalm a wall-eyed stare. Your specific complaint about TARS? Psalm's brown eyes smoldered. Rogue Squadron's ability to alter top-secret and proprietary software packages has serious security ramifications, especially with Tycho Selchu serving as the executive officer of that unit. Wedge's jaw dropped. Admiral, Tycho had nothing to do with the incident in the first place. And second, Tycho has done nothing to show himself to be a risk. Akbar clasped his hands together at his back. I agree to both of your points. But you would acknowledge that General Salm's concerns are valid? The rogue squadron's leader hesitated, never voicing the hot denial he had prepared as he heard the question. While he did not doubt Tycho's loyalty, he could see that taking chances was not wise. Yes, sir. Good, because I am going to make an extraordinary request of you. Yes, sir. I'm making Rogue Squadron operational within the week. What? Wedge felt as if he'd been snared by a Stokely stun net. It's only been a month since the roster was finalized, sir. Advanced training takes six months normally, four if it's rushed. We're not ready. Akbar returned to his desk and tapped the data pad. That is not what your numbers suggest. Admiral, you know there is more than just numbers to a unit. My people are good pilots, but they're still green. I need more time. Psalm folded his arms. Rogue Squadron has gone into battle before with less training. Yes, and I lost a lot of good men and women because of it. He opened his arms and appealed to Akbar. Admiral, I've not even run any hyperjump exercises with these pilots. Ah, but I thought all the pilots were pre-screened for being astronav capable. They are, but Wedge was going to protest that Gavin Darklighter needed more work with astro-navigation, but Lou Jane had been tutoring him and reported Gavin was a natural, just like his cousin. Damn it, I don't like this. I would still prefer having time to take them through more drills. We would all like that luxury, Commander, but we don't have it. Psalm frowned. I'm taking my Y-wings, the wing you so neatly chewed up, operational in two weeks. Wedge fell silent. My people are far closer to battle ready than Psalm's. As always, the needs of the rebellion outweigh the needs of its people. But this we knew going in. Admiral, can I at least run some astro-nav exercises to get my people working together when they come out of hyperspace? By all means, Commander. In fact, I have the perfect assignment for you to use in that regard. Akbar touched his datapad screen in two or three locations, and the lights in his office dimmed. As they did so, a swirling disk of stars appeared suspended between ceiling and floor. It tipped up on edge and a green circle slowly zoomed in on Commonor, locating it just outside the dense galactic core. 
I will be moving Rogue Squadron from here to Talisi in the Morobi system. Even before another green circle could appear and pinpoint the new system, Wedge's eyes narrowed. That's core word of here. Akbar nodded. There has been much debate in the Provisional Council about how we should proceed in the war against the Empire. Much of what we have discussed has been paralleled in the conversations held by the vast majority of citizens, rebel and imperial alike. We're going after Coruscant? Imperial Center? Akbar's chin fringe twitched. We are given little choice, really, if we wish to overthrow the last remnants of the Empire. That goal being an exercise that may well take generations to complete, mind you. Many of the Moffs are adopting a wait-and-see attitude about the New Republic. Others, like Zinge, have proclaimed themselves warlords and are doing what they can to consolidate their holdings with those of weaker neighbors. Any of these warlords could decide to turn his forces toward Coruscant and, by taking it, proclaim himself heir to Palpatine's throne. So, we have to get there first, or at least appear to be bent upon that goal, discouraging others from usurping our place in the galaxy. Psalm tried to keep his voice even, but his desire to see the rebels in power hurried his words. These pretenders will learn that we have not labored so long just to give them an opportunity to rape and pillage whole systems. Wedge agreed with the general sentiment, but he knew breaking Coruscant open and taking the world would be far from simple. It almost seems to me that an expedient alternative is to let some moths push themselves forward and have Iceheart deal with them. Your opinion was also heard in our councils. It was decided that leaving anyone to her tender mercies was a crime of grand proportion. Isan Isard had risen to fill the power vacuum left by the Emperor's death. The daughter of Palpatine's last internal security director, she came of age in the Emperor's court. Wedge had heard rumors that she had been the Emperor's lover for a time, but he had no way of verifying that story. What he did know was that she had betrayed her father to the Emperor, claiming he was going to defect to the Alliance. Her father was put to death immediately, and it was said she triggered the blaster shot that killed him. The Emperor elevated her to replace her father, and in his absence, she did a remarkable job in holding the core of the Empire together. The Mon Calamari warrior pointed to the galactic display. From Talisi, Rogue Squadron will provide escort to ships pushing even deeper, setting up safe worlds and supply depots. You will be but one unit of many probing the Central Imperial defenses. You want to see how hard Iceheart will hit back? Gauge strength based on speed and the nature of response? Yes, as well as determining supply routes for possible disruption. That made perfect sense to Wedge. Though space provided a limitless number of ways to get from one point to another, some simple basic rules governed how and where ships traveled. A ship attained speed and direction before jumping to light speed, and then maintained velocity in hyperspace. A ship moving fast enough could skirt phenomena like black holes, cutting parsecs off a more conservative and safer route. Because objects with mass, stars, black holes, planets, and imperial interdictor class cruises, exerted influence over hyperspace, they had to be navigated around. Their presence could abort a hyperspace flight and, in the case of a black hole or a star, could spell disaster for any ship that traveled too close to them. Making a trip through hyperspace required precise calculations that took advantage of a ship's speed and mass to get it safely to its destination because hazards to navigation diminished the number of calculable routes between places, trade tended to move through predictable corridors. Since traveling between stars was not inexpensive, merchants chose routes that allowed them to visit the most profitable systems along the way. These routes, 
including systems where ships leave hyperspace to change their travel vectors, were well known, and piracy was not uncommon. Disrupting Imperial supply routes would have a double effect for the rebellion. Not only would it deprive Imperial garrisons of needed materiel for making war, but it would provide those same materials to the rebellion. While the New Republic and the Empire used different starfighters and capital ships, supplies like blasters, rations, and bacta could easily be employed by either side. Wedge ran a hand along the edge of his unshaven jaw. I understand the mission, and I appreciate the urgency for it. I do have a question, though. Akbar nodded. Please, Commander. Rogue Squadron will do the job, but I was wondering if we were advanced for it because we're the unit that can do the job, or if we're being used as a symbol. Frankly asked. The Mon Cal's coloration brightened to a salmon pink on the dome of his head. I argued against employing you this soon, but others aptly pointed out that if you were not put in place now, our operations might not have time to succeed. Rogue Squadron is a symbol in the Alliance, and by positioning you to drive against the Empire, we show we have made a commitment to liberating everyone in the Empire. Wedge's mouth became dry. But the only way our use can function as a symbol is if our use is well publicized. And that publicity must get out to the warlords you expect to be frightened off by our presence. Akbar's shoulders slumped ever so slightly. Your words are ripples of my discussions with the Council. Borsk Felia is quite persuasive, and he has Mon Mothma's ear in many things. Wedge looked at Psalm. And you're worried about Tycho being a security risk. Tycho Selchu did not risk his life to get the Alliance the location of the second Death Star. No, he only risked his life to destroy that Death Star. Akbar stepped between his subordinates. Please, gentlemen, if I want petty bickering, I can go to more council meetings. It is important for you to air your grievances, but I will not have you fight and refight the same battles over and over again. Sorry, sir. My apologies, General. Accepted, Commander. I beg your pardon, Admiral. Akbar nodded slowly. Commander Antilles, in an effort to minimize damage done by the public profile being given your mission, we will keep your destination secret. This means your pilots will not know where they will be stationed, and they will only be told that they are going on an extended training exercise. Logistics and Supply Corps staffers have prepared lists of equipment that cover anything your unit might not carry with it on the trip. We have an Imperial shuttle that Captain Selchu will use to bring supplies on your journey. Nav data will be fed out to my pilots prior to each jump? Exactly. You should give your flight leaders numerous routes for which they will compute navigation solutions. Then you choose the appropriate one and have it communicated to your squadron at each change of course. The Mon Cal pointed at the representation of Talisi on the display, and it zoomed in. The Morobi system is a red-yellow binary, and Talisi is the fourth planet in orbit around the yellow primary. The world is cool and moist with indigenous insect and reptilian life. There are mammals there as well feral descendants of the animals brought in for an early farming colony. Your base is on the largest of the island continents. The atmosphere is thick, fog is common, but the world is safe. What happened to the farming colony? Over the centuries, most of the children emigrated to worlds where they could see the stars and didn't have to work so hard. The last group of them made the mistake of harboring a Jedi after the Clone Wars. Lord Vader destroyed them as an example. Settlement ruins are on your island, but our people have reported there was nothing of interest left behind there. Home sweet home, Wedge smiled. When are we to be on station? A week from now. That's not much time. I know. 
Akbar shrugged his shoulders. It was all I could buy you. May the force be with you, Commander Antilles. I hope you won't need it. 12. Curtain Lure clutched his hands at the small of his back so they would stop trembling. I am in your debt, Madam Director, and at your service. How kind of you to say so, Agent Lure. Isan Isard thumbed a small device. The lights in the room slowly brightened while shields descended over the windows. The rising illumination revealed the room to have a tall ceiling, with dark wooden beams curving up from the four corners to meet in an apex above the center of the floor. The walls and carpet shared the same deep blue. Though a strip of carpet the same bright red as worn by the Imperial Guards bordered the floor at the edge of the wall. In the far corner, he saw a desk and chairs that were elegant yet far from ornate, in keeping with the general Spartan nature of the room. It struck him as odd that a large room that was all but empty could seem so decadently opulent. The only thing the room seemed rich in was wasted space. Then it struck him. On a world that is so crowded with so many people, wasting this amount of space is the height of luxury. Isard's predatory pacing in the center of the room snatched his attention away from the subtle messages of the architecture and appointments. She wore an admiral's uniform, complete with boots, jodhpurs, and a dress jacket, though the garments were red. A black armband circled the upper part of her left arm, and the jacket bore no rank insignia or cylinders at all. Yet even without the external signs of rank, her intensity and the deliberation with which she moved radiated power. Though he would have put her age at a dozen years older than his own, he found her attractive. Tall and slender, she wore her black hair long, and the white streaks descending from her temples made her seem more exotic than middle-aged. Her face appeared classically beautiful to him. A strong jaw, sharp cheekbones, a high forehead, a gracefully small nose, and large eyes were all the elements that most women would have killed to possess or would have paid to have given to them. Even as he catalogued all the bits and pieces of her that should have triggered some sort of lust in him, and the aura of power surrounding her was terribly exciting, fear overrode any glimmerings of carnal desire. When she looked at him, with dark brows accenting her eyes, he knew where the menace dwelt in her. One eye was ice blue, as cold as hoth and as cruel as a hut in a sporting mood. The other eye, the left one, was a molten red, with golden highlights that flashed with fiery determination. The left eye told him that any effort by him that was not fully devoted to her service would be met with the bloodless retribution promised by her cold right eye. Curtin shivered, and she smiled. Agent Lure, your personal file has a number of interesting inputs. You are rated as having a visual memory retention rate of nearly 100%. He nodded. If I read it or see it, I remember it. This can be a useful tool, if applied correctly. Isard's expression lost some of its hardness, though this in no way made Curtin feel as if he were any safer. In the report about Bastra, you mentioned not using Skirtopinol during his interrogation because he had been dosing himself with lotyramine. This was a precaution you learned to take because of a case on Corellia where doing just that had negative effects, yes? The suspect died. Your report says you used the fact that the lotyramine masks the presence of blastonecrosis to confront Bastra with his own mortality. 
When that did not prove effective, you began conventional interrogation. Curtin nodded. Sleep deprivation, protein starvation, coercive holographic and auditory illusions taken from what I knew of him. It all proved quite promising until the blastonecrosis began to make his whole body septic. I then initiated treatment for the condition. And this treatment killed him. Her eyes became mismatched slits. Do you know why? He had a reaction to the Bacta used to treat him. Do you know why? Curtin was about to offer her the explanation the MD-5 droid had given him when Bastard died in the Bacta tank, but he knew that she would not accept it. I do not. Isard hesitated for a second, and Curtin knew he had escaped punishment by being truthful. What does XZ1449F mean to you, if anything? He instantly recognized the number, but held back his answer until he could sort out the details and put them in a coherent form. That is the lot number of a batch of Bacta that was contaminated by the Ashen rebels on Thyphera. It made its way to Imperial Center and infected nearly two million soldiers and citizens. It rendered them allergic to Bacta. Curtin frowned. But Gilbastra never was on Imperial Center. You do not know that for a fact. Perhaps he was here. She shook her head slowly. It does not matter, because... He could have run into that batch of Bacta almost anywhere. It was ordered, disposed of, and I saw to it that much of it was funneled to the black market. That, however, is not important. What is important is this. Blastonecrosis is a condition that affected roughly 2% of the people who were dosed with that particular lot of Bacta. An MD droid would have inquired of a patient if he had been dosed with Bacta in the last two years. But because I ordered treatment and didn't recognize the significance of the disease, Gilbastra died. No! Isard's eyes hardened. Gilbastra committed suicide. What? His reports about you are in your file. Your slicer was able to excise them from the Corellian records, but not my records. A man is best evaluated by his enemies. Curtin's stomach slowly collapsed in on itself. Those evaluations were prejudiced against me. Perhaps. But Bastra was amazingly perceptive. He wrote that you rely on your memory too much. Trusting that retention of information can somehow compensate for an insufficient amount of analysis. Because you know so much, like the obscure fact about the fatal interaction of lotyramine and skirtopinol, you didn't look beyond Bastra's obvious line of defense to see how much deeper things had gone. If you had, you would have known about his possible back to allergy and he might still be with us. She slowly exhaled and tugged at the hem of her scarlet jacket. Bastra knew you well enough to know he'd be dead soon. That gave him enough hope to feed you useless information. He held out as long as he could because he was playing for more time for his confederates to further sever ties with their past. The intelligence agent realized right then that the display of bravado Bastra had provided during their first meeting on the Expeditious had not been a false and hollow thing. Curtin's face burned as he heard again everything Bastra had said, this time with the man's mocking tones intact and brutal. What I had seen as my brilliance in ferreting out his errors had been him playing to my sense of superiority leading me on after him like a nerf eager for slaughter. For two years I've been a fool. A revelation hit him strongly enough to make him tremble. I've been fooled for even longer than the two years I've chased them down, haven't I? Very good, Agent Lure. Isard's expression lightened slightly. 
as if she were on the verge of smiling, but she did not. The responsibility for your deception is not wholly your own. Our training and indoctrination tends to make agents and soldiers believe in their own infallibility. This has proved to be a detriment to the Empire. You were not alone in falling prey to it. Even the late Emperor had his blind spots. Curtin decided to avoid the invitation to question the Emperor's wisdom, or lack thereof, and instead followed up on his previous question. The falling out Bastra and Horn had was faked. I thought the reason for it was stupid and assumed they were stupid for being at odds over it. This is even better, Agent Lure. I feel as if, in realizing how badly I was used, I can see more depth to things. A blind spot is eliminated, letting you see more of what goes on around you. She ran an index finger along her jaw. If you had read Bastra's evaluations of you, instead of having them destroyed, you would have been able to come to this epiphany sooner. He nodded confidently. And I would have had them by now. And you were doing so well. Isard's face contorted into a snarl. Don't backslide. Curtin blushed. I'm sorry. More's the pity that you are not. You assume superiority where there is none. She folded her arms across her chest. The Emperor likewise assumed that if he destroyed all the Jedi Knights, that his Jedi Knight, and a handful of Force-trained special agents, would be sufficient to control the galaxy. He did not see, though I tried to warn him, the impossibility of proving that all the Jedi had been destroyed, and that no other Jedi could rise against him. His obsession with the Jedi blinded him to the real threat posed by opposition leaders who are no more intelligent or remarkable than you are. As a result, the Empire is falling apart and the rebels are threatening to supplant the Empire with their own new republic. Curtin nodded. And you wish to restore the Empire? No. Her denial came cold enough to freeze carbonite. My goal is to destroy the rebellion. Imperial restoration can only be accomplished if the rebels are eliminated, and that can only be accomplished if we blunt their military, sorely stress their administration, and crush their spirits. These goals are interwoven, and I have operatives like you, working on all levels to bring my plans to fruition. Can you withstand the pressure of so vital a mission? Curtin slowly nodded. I can. How may I serve you? This time she did smile, and Curtin wished she had not. Your target is to cut the heart out of the rebellion. You will be the death of Rogue Squadron. Excuse me? Curtin frowned, wondering if he had heard her incorrectly. I am no fighter pilot. I know nothing about Rogue Squadron. Ah, but you have the expertise I want and desire. You served on Corellia, and the unit's commander is Corellian. Wedge Antilles, I know. Curtin raised his hands, but that is not to say I know him. I don't. I don't even know anything about the squadron. But you can learn. Yes, I can learn. And you shall learn. She nodded slowly toward him, then brought her head up abruptly. You will also find you have a personal stake in this. Curtin aborted a wince. Yes. Our source within the squadron tells us that a friend of yours is a flight leader of remarkable skill. One of Isard's earlier statements ran through his mind again. A man is best evaluated by his enemies. Corin Horn. You see? You already know more about them than you thought you did. Isan Isard gave him an even stare. Do you accept being the instrument of Rogue Squadron's destruction? 
With pleasure, Madam Director. Curtin smiled to himself. With the utmost of pleasure indeed. Thirteen. Corin forced himself to relax. Though Commander Antilles had cast the trip as an exercise in astro-navigation and hyperspace jumping, deep down in his gut, Corin thought a lot was being left unsaid. He was certain that if they had been going out on a formal patrol or escort mission, Wedge would have told them so. The fact that he hadn't said anything conflicted with the mission requirement of packing up and stowing their personal gear in their X-wings. This left Corin thinking something more than an exercise was taking place. Because of his training exercise scores, Corin had been promoted to lieutenant and given the command of three flight. As an officer, he had expected Wedge would trust him enough to let him know what was really going on. Even so, with his background, he had great respect for security, and that put a break on his uneasiness. Those concerns don't matter. Getting through the drill does. Heading outbound from Folor's scarred gray surface, Corn flew lead for Rogue Squadron's three flight. Ural was back to starboard while Lou Jane and Andorni were off to port, similarly staggered front and back. Within the unit, they had comm unit call signs of Rogue 9 through 12, respectively, though for this exercise, they would be operating as a semi-independent flight. Let's keep it close, three flight. Whistler will send you all our jump coordinates and speed parameters. Have your R2s double-check it, then lock the route. He checked his data screen for the positions of the first two X-Wing flights and Tycho Selchu bringing up the rear in a captured Lambda-class shuttle, forbidden. We follow one flight on this leg, then two flight on the next one. After that, we're leading, so let's be prepared. The members of his flight signaled their readiness to jump, so Corin keyed his comm link over to the command frequency. Three flight ready to jump on your mark, Rogue One. Good. All flights, five seconds to mark. With Wedge's reply, Whistler began counting down for the five seconds. Corin watched the seconds click off the digital display. When it read zero, 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 he engaged the X-Wing's hyperdrive and sat back as the stars filled the view screen. Just as the color threatened to overwhelm him with its intensity, his snub fighter leaped into hyperspace and moved beyond the ability of the light to abuse him. The first leg was to take them about an hour, and had them flying along the plane of the galactic dish, moving against the swirl of the galaxy itself. The course brought them in ever so slightly toward the core, which was good, because the databases containing information about navigation hazards got progressively better as they headed toward the core. And Coruscant. Corn knew the Imperial capital was not their intended target, at least not for this flight, but he felt certain they would get there eventually. His more immediate concern, however, was plotting the course for the third leg of the jump, while he had not been told their final destination, Commander Antilles had given him a list of twenty starting and ending points, and he had calculated the best courses he could see for making those jumps. The direction, speed, and duration of the first leg allowed him to eliminate all but two of the courses given to Risadi for solution for the second leg, and that narrowing down of ending points meant he only had two plans of his own to refine. The first course of his, which would take the flight further along the disk and outside the most populated and advanced section of the galaxy, had been plotted pretty tightly. Several black hole clusters narrowed leeway as far as that course was concerned. He glanced at it again and decided it couldn't be refined anymore. Whistler, Bring up the course for the Morobi system. The astromech droid hooted at him as numbers and graphics scrolled up on the screen. Yes, I know you did the best you could on this plotting. Freeze output there. He tapped the glass on the monitor. 
At the Chorax system, you have us skirting it by 0.25 parsecs. There's only one planetary mass in that system, and the Sun isn't that big. Since the Chorax system comes up so early in our leg, if you pull us another tenth of a parsec closer, we should come out of hyperspace close enough to Merobi's habitable planets that we won't need to make an in-system jump to find gravity if we need it. The astromech wailed at him. Corin laughed. You're correct. The data you used to compute the course indicated giving the system a wider berth. But that's because you're using merchant data, and they're afraid of pirates and smugglers working the system. We're a squadron of X-Wings. We have nothing to worry about. With astro navigation and hyperspace jumping being so tricky a business, courses were plotted as often as not to brush by inhabited systems, even if they were inhabited by social misfits and undesirables. If a hyperdrive went out in mid-flight or refused to engage after a course correction between jumps, being within hailing distance of worlds from which help could easily be summoned was a blessing. Trying to find a ship that had misjumped to some random location in the galaxy was next to impossible, as all those who hunted after the fabled Katana fleet had learned since its disappearance. The first leg of the journey ended uneventfully. Two flight, with Risati flying lead, took over from one flight and brought the squadron around on its new heading. Just before they made the jump to light speed, Commander Antilles shot Corrin the coordinates for the third jump. So, it's Morobi after all. Corrin called the flight plan up for one last time, ignoring Whistler's disgusted wail, and went over it. The course appeared as nearly perfect as possible, given the ships they were using. A ship capable of greater speed could have trimmed even more distance off the run by getting closer to the Chorax system. The greater speed would allow it to resist the influence of the star's hyperspace mass shadow. Without the resistance, the ship would be dragged back into real space in the system and, more likely than not, would be unable to escape the sun's gravitational grasp. Fortunately, X-Wings have enough power to get us through. Korn glanced at his reactor fuel level readings. The hyperdrives barely sipped fuel, while the sublight engines gulped it. Running up to a light speed jump burned a lot of fuel, though not as much as maneuvering through a dogfight. But nothing they had done on their journey so far had been that taxing on the engines or fuel supply. By the time we make my jump, we'll still be at 87% of a full load more than enough to make it to the Morobi system and back home again. The squadron came out of hyperspace and Corrin eased his stick to port. Squadron come about to a heading of 230 degrees and depress 12 degrees. Flight plan on its way to you. He pushed his stick forward until the X-Wing's nose dipped slightly. Jump to light speed in five. The jump to hyperspace for his leg seemed somehow smoother and more effortless than the previous two. He knew that sensation was an illusion, and he wondered about it for a moment or two. It occurred to him that the reason he was more at ease with his jump was because he had been in control of it. Mistakes made in calculating a hyperspace jump could be fatal, and Corrin had never been good about putting responsibility for his life in another person's hands but I don't have to worry about a mistake on this leg since I did the calculations. A keening whistle from his astromech made him smile. Fine, you did the calculations with no help from me at all. Whistler's hooting became more urgent. The astromech started scrolling sensor data over the cockpit screen, but none of it made sense to Corin. There's another stellar mass in the Chorax system. That's impossible unless... Before he could broadcast a warning to the other members of Rogue Squadron, the automatic safety cutout on the hyperdrive kicked in. The snub fighter burst through an incandescent white wall and into the outer reaches of the Chorak system. 
and right into the middle of a running light fight. Corrin threw the stick hard to port and pushed it forward. Rogue Eleven, break up Star. He trusted Ural would follow him moving down and to the left, which cleared the way for the rest of the squadron to enter the system. Lock S foils into attack position. He reached up and flipped the switch with his right hand. Whistler, have you ID'd those ships yet? The little droid shrieked urgently back at him. Anything you can give me. The big ship, Corrin knew immediately, was an Imperial Interdictor cruiser. Its quartet of gravity well projectors allowed it to create a hyperspace shadow roughly equivalent to that of a fair-sized star. The interdictors had proved effective in ambushing smugglers and pirates, and the presence of one of the 600-meter-long triangular cruisers in the Chorak system was not wholly unexpected. It hadn't been there to trap them, however. Running from the cruiser, which Whistler identified as the Black Asp, was a modified Baudo-class star yacht. About three times as long as his X-Wing, the yacht had a broad, triangular shape to it that was softened by the gentle down-curve of the wings. It looked almost organic in origin, as if it should have been swimming through space instead of rocketing along on its twin engine's ion thrust. Korn had seen plenty of modified yachts in his time with Corellian security, and this one even looked vaguely familiar. Most often the yachts were modified to haul contraband. While he had no love for smugglers, he had even less for the Empire. Enemy of my enemy is my friend. Whistler bleated sharply. Korn glanced at his screen, then keyed his calm. Ties. Squints. I mean, interceptors. Looks like a dozen of them. He looked up through his cockpit canopy and felt panic when he couldn't see with the naked eye what his instruments showed so plainly on his monitor. Rogue One, what are your orders? Wedge's voice came back cool. Engage them, but watch the cruiser's guns. I copy that. Rogue Ten on me. Ural double-clicked his comm, indicating understanding of Korn's order. That action seemed like Commander Antilles's order to betray no nervousness at all. The bitter taste slicking Corin's tongue surprised him because he'd flown against imps in real life and endless simulator battles. He'd never been this bad before. Nervous, yes, but not edging toward losing it. Pull yourself together, Corin. His hand snaked up and touched the coin he wore. Your squadron mates and the folks in that yacht are counting on you. Because the break they'd executed had taken them down, the interdictor and its ties were coming in above their line of sight. Pulling back on his stick, Corin thumbed a switch that put all power in the forward shield. All power to forward shield, switching to proton torpedoes. A targeting box appeared on the heads-up display, and Corin maneuvered the X-Wing to drop the sight on the lead interceptor. The range indicator dropped numbers and digits as the X-Wing closed on the Imperial fighter. Easy, easy. Let yourself go, just like in training. He nudged the flight stick to the left and framed the incoming squint perfectly. The box went red, and a strident beep filled the cockpit. Corin hit the trigger, and the first torpedo sped in at its target. Another torpedo streaked past him and raced toward an interceptor. Both of the Imperial ships broke hard, but Ural's torpedo reduced his target to fire and scrap metal. Corrin's missile missed his intended target, so he switched back to lasers and evened his shields out. Good shot, Ten. Scratch one squint. Fingering the coin he wore beneath his flight suit, Corrin swallowed hard, then keyed his comm unit. Cover me. I'm going after mine. Ratcheting the throttle up to full, Corin swooped the X-Wing up on its port stabilizers, then corkscrewed down through a roll that brought him out on the interceptor's tail. He linked his offside lasers so they fired two at a time, 
and triggered a burst that burned armor from the interceptor's bent wings, but failed to destroy it. The squint drifted to the left, then came up in a roll that brought it around and over Corrin's line of flight. If he continues that roll, I'll overshoot him and he'll end up on my tail. Corrin pushed the stick to the left, making a wide turn to port that opened distance from the interceptor, but still let the Imperial ship slip in behind him. Oral cannot get him, Nine. I know, Ten, not to worry. Keeping one eye on the rangefinder, Corrin kept his X-Wing on the long loop. Come on, you know you want me. If you had proton torps, I'd be free space ions, but you don't. Yes, Whistler, I know what I'm doing. Feeling some of his confidence returning, he shrugged. At least, I'm pretty sure I do. The interceptor pilot came up fast and flew in a straight line to get quickly to the same point in space where Corrin could get slowly with his great loop. Seeing his prey close in fast, Corrin centered and hauled back on his stick, tightening his turn considerably and jamming his body down in his seat. The X-Wing shot across the TIE's line of flight barely twenty meters behind the ball and wing craft. Yanking the stick to starboard, Korn rolled the fighter 180 degrees. He pulled the stick back to his breastbone, bringing the X-Wing's nose up in another turn that reversed his previous course. Leveling the fighter out, he sailed in right on the TIE's tail his long S-turn having allowed him to let it overshoot him by a fair distance. A lethal distance. Corrin lined the interceptor up in the sights and blew it apart with two laser blasts. As pieces of the disintegrating ship whirled past him, he keyed his comm unit. Ten, report. Cover, Ten. Heading ninety degrees. I have your wing, Ten. Guiding the stick to the right, he saw Ural's X-Wing shoot ahead of him and into the ion wake of an interceptor. The GAN's first shot struck sparks and armor from the fighter's central ball. One more Ural and you have him. Nine and ten, break hard port, get out of there. Ural's compliance with Wedge's order came immediately. His sharp turn took him across Corrin's line of flight, forcing Corrin to yank back on his stick and roll to starboard. He leveled out and started a turn to port, but Whistler's shrill whine filled the cockpit. The stick slammed back into Corrin's chest, pinning him in his ejection chair as the droid brought the X-Wing's nose up. Red crept into the corners of Corrin's vision and the stick's pressure against his breastbone made breathing hard. The vast expanse of the black asp's bulk filled his viewscreen. By all the souls of Alderaan, a blue bolt of ion cannon energy sizzled in and battered down the X-Wing's shields. Whistler yowled, and the stick went slack for a moment, allowing Corrin to act. He slapped the stick hard to port, bringing the X-Wing up in a snap roll that put the interdictor beneath his feet. He started to pull back on the stick to show the cruiser his stern and rocket full away from it, but he felt a tingle run through him as another ion blast partially caught the starboard stabilizer foils. The astromech's screams died abruptly, and Corrin was slammed against the left side of the cockpit. Even without seeing the stars swirling around him like dust motes in a Tatooine sand tornado, he knew what had happened. The ion blast had knocked out his starboard sublight engines, leaving the pair on the port side of the ship operating at full power and without competition. This put him into a flat spin, with his stern chasing his nose completely out of control but at least I'm hard to hit. The ion blast, in addition to shutting Whistler off, had killed all his cockpit electronics and acceleration compensator. The only thing he could do, he knew, was to shut his engines down and go for a restart. Until he had some sort of power, 
or until that cruiser slaps a tractor beam on me. The X-Wing would spin like a gyroscope. Got to power down. That was easier said than done. The emergency shutdown panel had been placed on the right side of the cockpit. Mashed against the opposite side by centrifugal force, it remained just beyond the reach of his outstretched fingers. Gritting his teeth, Korn levered himself off the cockpit wall with his left elbow and tried to hit the panel. The stick slammed him back into place, pinning him. Korn caught it with his right hand and tried to pry it forward. Pain radiated out from where the stick had jammed his medallion into breastbone. So much for that being terribly lucky. The stick made it painful to breathe, adding one more unnecessary complication to his predicament. A sense of urgency boiled up in him, overriding panic instead of boosting it. Let. Me. Go. He redoubled his effort to move the stick. It resisted at first, but Corin refused to be daunted. Concentrating with every fiber of his being, he pushed, and the stick yielded. Centimeter by centimeter, he forced it away from himself. Yes, I'm free. Corin shoved the stick as far as it would go to the left, then used it to pull himself away from the port side of the cockpit. With his left hand on the top of the stick, he brought his elbow up inch by inch, scraping it past various switches and knobs that had died with the rest of the ship. When his arm came up above the top of the stick, he lunged to the right, letting the stick slip beneath his armpit and hit the shutdown panel with his right elbow. The thrumming of the port engines died, leaving him alone with the sound of his own breathing in the cockpit. The ship still spun and showed no signs of slowing, but without friction or other resistance in the vacuum of space, it would continue to spin forever. Corn relaxed slightly in relief at cutting the engines off and was rewarded by being bashed back against the port side of the cockpit. His helmet hit a hard stanchion, leaving him a touch dazed. Along with the spin-induced nausea, it made him hope someone would shoot him and end his misery. That flash of despair lasted for a moment until another spark of pain spread out from his breastbone. Kill us they might, but I'm not going to make it easy for them. He slid his right hand across his chest, past the medallion and his left shoulder, and tipped three switches up. A bit farther along, he lifted a plasteel plate that covered a recessed red button, then punched that button and hoped for the best. What he wanted to hear was the return of the engine thrum, but what he got was nothing. Ignition circuits must be fried. There has to be something else I can do. Without the engines, he had no power. The primary power cells and the reserve power cells for the lasers probably had enough energy in them to at least give him communications, attitude control jets, and limited sensors, but getting at it from inside the cockpit presented him a problem. It's not like I can just land this monster and do some manual cross-wiring. Corin laughed aloud. No but I can manually land this thing. He brought his left leg up and hooked a small tab on the cockpit wall with his heel. It flipped out a small bar that sat in a groove. Corin centered his foot on the bar and pumped it down. It came back up beneath his foot and he pushed it down again and again. From the nose of the fighter, he heard metallic pops and clicks. The bar was connected to a small generator that put out enough current to deploy the fighter's landing gear. Extending them did nothing to affect the spin, but the payoff Korn hoped for wouldn't come until the gear locked into place. 
With a shudder he felt throughout the ship, the landing gear snapped into their fully deployed positions. The monitor in the cockpit lit up again, and the stick began to feel alive in his left hand. Laughing aloud, Corin took the stick in his right hand and tugged it over to the starboard side of the cockpit. The spin began to slow. He fingered the medallion with his left hand. Because no power landings would be seriously harmful to most life forms, extending the landing gear on the fighter opened a circuit that allowed the primary and reserve power cells to drive the S-foil impeller jets for simple maneuvering and to kick in the repulsor lift drives. The power cell tap tended to be used primarily by techs for moving the ships around in repair and maintenance facilities, because running the fusion engines up for full maneuvering power in enclosed places is generally considered harmful to most living creatures. Corin tried his restart again, with the same results as before. Diagnostics told him he'd lost one of the starboard incom phi inverted lateral stabilizers, and the engine just wouldn't start with power levels fluctuating all over the place. No engines, but maybe I have sensors and communication. He brought those systems online, but got nothing from sensors and a lot of static covering voices on the comm. This is Rogue Nine. I could use some help here. Waiting for a reply, he flipped on the proton torpedo launch circuits. Without sensors, his ability to hit anything was nil. But at least he could get a shot or two off. And I'm probably going to need it. Above and to starboard, he saw the Black Asp. Rogue Squadron had regrouped to form a screen between the Interdictor and the Smuggler. He couldn't tell how many rogues were left and the occasional glint of sunlight off TIE Interceptor's quadanium solar panels told him a few of the squints still existed. But there seemed to be far more rogues than there were TIEs, and that was a good sign. The interdictor ventured in close to the fight, its lasers and ion cannons blazing away with green and blue bolts. The energy streams filled space with tangles and knots as the gunners tried to target the elusive X-Wings. Though he had been hit fairly easily, he knew his collision avoidance maneuver had kept him in one place long enough for the gunners to hit him, and that only because he'd ventured far closer to the interdictor than he should have. He half heard a command crackle in over the comm, but he couldn't make sense of it. Out beyond his ship's nose, he saw a series of proton torpedo launches from the X-Wings. They came in at the large ship from a multitude of angles. While the power in each of the torpedoes was hardly a threat to the interdictor, the combined damage of a volley like that was enough to batter down its forward shield. The concave energy wall glowed a sickly yellow before it imploded, and Corin thought certain he saw several torpedoes explode against the interdictor's hull. Yeah, rogues! Korn laughed aloud. Oh, Whistler, you're going to be sorry you missed this. The interdictor brought its nose up to pull the vulnerable bow away from the X-Wings. It could repair the damaged shield by pumping more energy into it, but that would require the shutting down of the gravity well projectors. That, in turn, would allow the X-Wings and the yacht to escape turning the whole engagement into a draw, if you don't count the vaped squints. The big ship executed a roll that combined with a loop to reverse the cruiser's course. He's running. They've driven it off. Yes! His jubilance died as he realized that meant the cruiser was heading back in his direction, and the surviving TIE interceptors were flying along in its wake like fledgling Minox chasing a slow freighter. Whistler, you're lucky you're not seeing this. It'll be ugly. Rogue Nine, do you copy? I copy. Corin didn't immediately recognize the voice. I'm on partial power. Whistler's dead and I'm blinder than a Y-wing. This is Rogue Null. You have squints coming your way. I marked two. 
Oh, more good news. Thanks, Null. Be my guest. Korn craned his neck to see where Tycho and the shuttle were, but he couldn't see it. I'm naked here, so please get them off me. Not possible, Nine. Clear your sensors to 354.3. What? Korn frowned as he saw the tie getting closer. I'm a sitting hut here. So you have indicated, Nine. Clear your sensors. Korn punched the frequency code into the keypad under his left hand. Done, Null. Happy hunting, Nine. Korn's targeting display came back alive, and his monitor showed targeting telemetry data from the Forbidden. Beyond the display, Korin saw the ties juke to try to shuck the shuttle, but Tycho managed to keep his sights locked on the lead interceptor, despite flying a slower, less agile craft. The HUD went red, and Korin hummed an imitation of Whistler's target tone. He squeezed the trigger on his stick twice, sending two torpedoes streaking out at the lead interceptor. Lead's gone, Null. Give me number two. The display flickered, then Corin nudged the X-Wing around and launched two more missiles at the interceptor, boxed in red on his tactical display. So intent had the Imperial pilots been on losing the shuttle behind them, they had no chance to react to the missiles shooting in at them. The first pilot died without being able to execute even the most basic of evasive maneuvers. The proton torpedoes blasted through the cockpit ball, ripping the craft to bits and igniting the ion engine fuel into a swollen ball of fire. The second set of missiles lanced through that fireball and blew one wing off their target. That squint careened away, somersaulting and twisting wildly through space. Bits and pieces of it flew off into the void. Then it exploded brilliantly, blotting out the image of the interdictor going to light speed. Great shooting, Nine. Corin shook his head. Greater flying, Null. I did the easy part. The kills are yours, Corin. Three confirmed. The best today. The Corellian pilot shrugged. Maybe today wasn't so unlucky after all. Glad you feel that way, Nine. Why, Captain? You had the most kills. When we get where we're going, all the drinks are on you. 14. Corin happily popped the cockpit canopy seals on his X-Wing after the yacht killed its maneuvering jets and the thick fog descended over the ships. At Chorax, the yacht had come back and picked him up, using landing claws to capture the X-Wing's landing gear. This left his ship clinging to the dorsal hull of the yacht like a dauber wasp on the back of a bird. He didn't particularly like the situation, but it was a long walk from Chorax to Talisi in the Morobi sector, and he liked the idea of leaving his fighter and whistler behind even less than being carried into port. He'd shut down all systems except for life support, so he had no communication with the yacht's pilot. Korn had been impressed with how smooth the landing was at the primitive spaceport. A dense fog hid almost everything, and what little he could see in the backwash of maneuvering jets seemed overgrown with dark green ivy. He saw dim shapes that resembled buildings, but most of them were covered with sufficient plant life that he wondered if the New Republic hadn't grown the base instead of building it. He stood and stretched, then doffed his helmet and gloves and put them on the seat of his command couch. Vaulting from the cockpit, he landed heavily on the yacht's hull. More gravity here than I expected. Corrin looked for a ladder to let himself down, but couldn't find one. Instead, he walked along the curved wing and jumped down to the ground from the lowest point. His knees buckled with the impact, and he went down on all fours. Either there is more gravity here than I expect, or that fight really wrung it out of me. As he straightened up and scraped mud from the knees of his red jumpsuit, 
He knew both of his assumptions were probably correct. I'm lucky to be alive. A hatch opened with a hiss on the underside of the yacht, and a boarding ramp slowly descended. Corin turned toward the ramp, wiping his hands off on his thighs. A Sullivan descended first, followed by an insectoid maintenance droid of verpine manufacture. Corin nodded a salute at them, but they ignored him as they waited at the base of the ramp. Corin assumed they were waiting for the captain of the ship, a person he had assumed to be male, since very few of the independent smugglers were female. As the captain descended the ramp, Corin had his assumption exploded by his first glimpse of shapely long legs encased in boots and a form-fitting dark blue jumpsuit. A gun belt encircled her slender waist and long black hair fell to mid-back. She grabbed the ramp's forward support and swung around to face him in a carefree manner. And Corin was very taken with the smile lighting up her beautiful face. He wiped his hands again on his jumpsuit. Thanks for the ride back here. She returned his smile as she shortened the distance between them. Thanks for the save back there. My pleasure. He extended his hand to her. I'm Corin Horn. Something dangerous flashed through her brown eyes. Are you any relation to Hal Horn? He is... was... my father. Why? Because he hounded my father and had him sent to Kessel. She poked him in the chest, right where the flight stick had bruised him. If I'd known who you were, I'd have left you there. Corin recoiled in surprise and, for the first time, saw the patch on the shoulder of her jumpsuit. It showed a Corellian sea ray that had a bar where its eyes should have been. Because of the polarized thread used to embroider the black eye bar, a little vertical white line passed through it, running side to side. I know that crest. I knew this ship was familiar. This is the Pulsar Skate. If I'd known Booster Tarek was bringing me in, I'd have stayed out there. I can see you two have already met. Corin whirled around and quickly saluted Wedge. Yes, sir. The woman planted her fists on her narrow hips. You didn't tell me who this pilot was because you knew I'd not have transported him, right? Wedge smiled easily. I suspected there might have been some friction. How have you been, Mirax? Paying for spare parts and fuel, Wedge. Mirax kissed Wedge on the cheek. I've also been collecting stories about you from all over the galaxy. Your parents would have been proud. Wedge nodded solemnly. I'd like to hope so. Corn's green eyes narrowed. Sir, you realize the Pulsar Skate is a ship with a well-documented history of smuggling, and that Booster Tarek is one of the more notorious smugglers who ever flew out of Corellia. Corin's commander smiled. I know all about the Skate, Lieutenant Horn. I was about fifteen years old when I helped replace the fusion chamber on that starboard engine. Mirax's father regularly used my parents' fueling station for repairs and refueling. But... Booster used to smuggle glit. Wedge cut him off with a scowl. He also helped me track down the pirates who destroyed the fueling station and killed my parents. Pirates who destroyed it while fleeing Corellian security and whom Corsac never caught. And that makes it all right? No, Lieutenant. It just puts things in perspective. Wedge gave Mirax a hug around her shoulders. Mirax isn't her father. Ever since he retired, she's been running a lot of supplies for the Alliance. He then turned and gave her a hard stare. And Corin isn't his father, either. If he'd not made some last-minute adjustments to the course we were taking, we'd not have ended up in the Chorak system to save you. Mirax glanced down at the ground. The anger in her expression eased slightly, aided and abetted, by the color rising to her cheeks. You're right, Wedge. I'm still bleeding off the stress of being jumped like that. The black asp came out of hyperspace right on my exit vector and grabbed me in place. 
Someone sold me out. Corn snorted. No honor among thieves. Wedge frowned at him. More like Imperial credits buying more loyalty than the promise of Alliance credits. Mirax shrugged her shoulders. Some of us find those promises more safe than letting the Empire get their hooks into us. She extended her hand to Corrin. I want to apologize for my behavior, Lieutenant. Corrin shook her hand. Apology accepted, and I apologize as well. I'm still rattled after getting fired upon by a cruiser. My R2 is down and I'm a bit worried. She smiled, and some of the tension in his chest eased. I understand. If I can help in any way. I appreciate the offer. Corn looked over at Wedge. I should probably see to getting the X-Wing unloaded and Whistler's getting repaired. In a moment, Lieutenant. I want to speak with you first. He jerked a thumb at the Pulsar skate. Mirax, do you know where your shipment was going? I was supposed to rendezvous with a ship for transfer or coordinates. She shrugged. According to the manifest, it was a lot of basic stuff for setting up a base. You could probably use most of it here. I don't doubt it. Wedge fished a cylindrical comm link from a pocket of his flight suit and flicked it on with his thumb. Antilles to Mtray. Mtray here, sir. I've been trying to reach you since we landed. Wedge rolled his eyes skyward. I'm sure you have. No time to talk now. I need you to get a salvage crew with a lift crane over here to get Horn's X-Wing and R2 unit. You also need to get the ship's manifest from the Pulsar skate. Find out where that shipment of supplies was going and see if you can't arrange for what we need to remain here. Yes, sir. As I was saying, sir, until he's out. Wedge turned the comm link off and shoved it deep into his pocket again. Tycho said he didn't have any trouble with the droid on the trip out here. But why not, I can't imagine. Mirax arched an eyebrow at Wedge. So you send him out here to talk with me? Believe me, he's not the worst protocol droid on our side. Not by a long shot. Wedge winked at her. Just give him the data card, retreat to the skate, and threaten to shoot him if he comes aboard. Make sure you shoot twice. I'll remember that, Lieutenant. Mirax sighed. Wouldn't it be easier if I just downloaded the manifest to your central computer? Wedge winced. Right now, he is our central computer. True. This isn't exactly Coruscant Rimward. It makes the outlier worlds look civilized. I'm glad you understand. Wedge tossed her an abbreviated salute. We will talk more later, Mirax. Lieutenant, if you'll follow me. Corin fell in step with his commander. You wanted to say something to me, sir? It's never again going to be quite like that first time. Wedge smiled. Taking on fighters is one thing, but fighting in the shadow of a capital ship, that's enough to get to anyone. Maybe that was the difference between this time and the others. I appreciate the perspective, sir. I also wanted to congratulate you for the way you recovered yourself out there. You were in a very difficult position, and you got yourself out of it rather handily. It was more luck than anything else, sir. If that second blast had caught me square on, I would have been on that interdictor, and Talisy would be under assault. Call it whatever you like, Mr. Horn. You did well. Wedge shook his head. Getting those two interceptors after your systems were down was very impressive. As I told Captain Selchu, he did the hard part. I just pulled the trigger. If they'd broken his lock, I would never have hit them. The younger man frowned. That brings me to a question, sir. Yes? Corn stopped, and gray mist swirled between the two of them. Captain Selchu was able to get a torpedo lock on those two interceptors. Why didn't he shoot them himself? Wedge hesitated instantly putting Corin on his guard. The Forbidden is being modified for training purposes to simulate the profile of an assault gunboat. While it has the sensor package for concussion missiles, it doesn't carry any and couldn't shoot them if it did. 
then why didn't he take them with his lasers? Lambda-class shuttles have lasers. Wedge's reply came tight and laced with frustration. The forbidden does not. Korn glanced down at the ground. Commander, I saw Alliance security escorting Captain Selchu around on Folor. He's never had fully powered weapons on his Z-95 headhunter, and you're telling me his shuttle had the lasers removed despite our travel through contested sectors of the core? What's going on here? Wedge took a deep breath, then let it out slowly. Have you told anyone else about the security escorts? No, I... Lieutenant, I want you to understand two things. First, I have the utmost trust and confidence in Captain Selchu. I have no reservations, none, about him, his service, his skills, or his commitment to the Alliance. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Second, the matter to which you allude is a private one, concerning Captain Selchu alone. Because of it, he has agreed to have limitations placed upon himself. Discussion of it is up to him. But both he and I believe bringing the issue up will only serve as a distraction to the squadron. As if not knowing will not distract me. Does this mean I can't ask him about it? Wedge folded his arms across his chest. Corin, you were a law enforcement officer, so suspicion comes easily to you and trust does not. Ask yourself this question. If you could trust him to help shoot those two interceptors, don't you think you can trust him all the way around? He didn't have to save you, but he did. Knowing full well he was as dead as you were if the interceptors turned on him. I see your point, sir. Corin nodded slowly. Doesn't mean I may not ask, unless you order me not to, but I won't tell anyone else about it. And if the captain refuses to answer my questions, I'll have to let it go, I guess. He saved my life. I owe him that much, at least. Good. One more thing, sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Corn looked back toward the Pulsar skate. Back there, you mentioned that Corellian security never caught the pirates who destroyed the Gus Tretta station and killed your parents. My father got that case and worked hard on it. He didn't give up. He just didn't have your connections on the other side of the law. He swallowed hard. I think if my father had known about Booster Tarek helping you find them, he'd have cut him some slack, and Booster wouldn't have done time in the spice mines. Wedge reached out and slapped Corrin lightly on the shoulder. Booster clearly wasn't a Jedi, nor was he a Sith spawn, and the time on Kessel got him out of the business. In a more candid moment, Mirax will probably admit the five years he spent in the dark was good for her father. I doubt she and I will share many candid moments, sir. Really? I think you two would get along quite well together. Our fathers openly hated each other, sir. Not the best foundation for a lasting friendship. Corin shook his head. Besides, she's your friend. But just a friend. More like a sister since she stayed with us when her father was on dangerous runs. Like a sister to the commanding officer? Now there's incentive to get to know her. Corin smiled. I'll take that under advisement, sir. Do that, Lieutenant. Having friends never hurts. Sir, sir! Both men looked up as M. Trey materialized out of the Talisian fog. His dark color on this dim world... I don't envy the commander trying to avoid dealing with the droid here. Wedge looked over at Corin, and in an instant Corin knew they had been thinking the same thing. Emtray, good. I'll leave you to discuss the condition of his X-Wing with Lieutenant Horn. Find me after that. Corin read and, if you can, in Wedge's smile, as the leader of Rogue Squadron turned and walked away. As you wish, sir. The droid aborted a salute, then shuffled his feet around to face Corrin. About your X-Wing. Sir, the damage is not that extensive. What about Whistler? Ah, 
your R2 unit. The droid canted his clamshell head to the side ever so slightly. Your whistler will be fine. He shut himself down before the ion blast could do it. This by virtue of the near miss. I must say, sir, that I thought, yes, Amtray, I appreciate that, but he'll be fine. I should think so, sir, though it was a near thing. Near thing? Corin asked, instantly regretting his invitation to Amtray to explain. Well, sir, a power coupling was negatively polarized, precluding an auto-restart. Many would consider this a minor problem. The coupling will have to undergo thermo-reconditioning, but we have the facilities for that here, since the colonists used to use agrodroids, and this world has some fierce thunderstorms in the rainy season. Fascinating, really, Emtray. Corin smiled easily. You should ask Commander Antilles to let you brief the squadron on the climatology of this world. Use me to escape the droid, will you? Demand it, really. Demand? Oh, my. Insist absolutely. Fifteen or twenty minutes of reasoning with him should convince him of its necessity. Corin nodded solemnly. Now, about my X-Wing. I blew a phi inverted lateral stabilizer. That is correct, sir. Emtray handed Corin a data pad. I have downloaded the requisition forms for the part into this data pad. If you will fill them out, along with an incident report, I'll get Captain Selchu to review the forms and get Commander Antilles to sign off on them. We'll relay the information back to General Salm. We should have the part in a month or two at the most. Korn's jaw dropped. A month or two? Provided they have the part and you don't get pushed back in the priority list. Priority list? Yes, sir. You brought your X-Wing with you and have never formally signed it over to the Alliance. To prevent individuals from using the Alliance as a maintenance depot, Regulation 119432, Subsection 5, Paragraph 3 states, Non-Alliance craft that are allied with or working under the command of an Alliance leader will be provided with parts and maintenance at the discretion of the commanding officer and or the senior officer in charge of parts and supply for said craft. If said craft are damaged in any actions that were not planned or sanctioned in advance, see Section 12, Para 7 for a list of exceptions, all damage is considered non-alliance related and to be repaired only after authorized repairs to sanction action damaged craft have been completed. Now, the exceptions, hold it, Emtray. Corn massaged his temples. Is this the only way to get a new stabilizer? Sir. I am conversant in the regulations of over six million different military and paramilitary organizations, and there is nothing that the pilot wrapped a knuckle against the droid's black breastplate, and that stopped the litany. Entree. There have to be more phi inverted lateral stabilizers in existence than we have in all the Alliance ships and stores. Z-95 headhunters and Incom T-47 airspeeders both used the part. There's probably a wrecked T-47 out here somewhere, in fact. There might be, sir. The droid rotated his head around in a circle to scan the whole area. I'll prepare the forms requesting a general survey of the local sector. Dropping the data pad, Corin reached out and grabbed the droid's head in both hands. He pulled Emtray's facial opening toward him. You're missing my point, Emtray. Forms and requests will take time. Without that part, I can't fly. If I can't fly, I'll be stuck in this fog and on the ground, and that will make life miserable for me. And I don't want that. There are parts to be had, and regulations to be observed. Regulations be damned! The droid pulled back a step, and the condensation on his head let him slip away. Sir! Of all the members of Rogue Squadron, I would have thought you would appreciate adherence to regulations. Corn sighed. Regulations have their place, but not when they hurt. Can't you just scrounge the part or something? The droid froze in position, the flashing light in his eyes being the only indication he was still working. The pilot luxuriated in the cessation of the droid's chatter, 
but it went on far longer than he'd heard before in the droid's presence. The eye flashes became asynchronous, and this worried Korn a bit. Entree? The droid's eyes went dark for a moment. Then his limbs and head jerked, as if he'd been struck by lightning. Entree? The eyes lit up again, and Korn would have sworn they were a bit brighter. Scrounging protocol engaged, sir. The droid bent down and smoothly retrieved the data pad. He glanced at the data pad, then shook his head. I'll shoot a requisition up through channels, but I think I can find you something sooner than anything we get from command. You're a pilot, and my job is to keep you flying. Consider it done. Even the voice sounded different to Korn. Emtray, are you all right? Is the moisture getting to you? I'm fine, sir. The moisture is no problem. One eye light flashed on and off. Touch of a virus, maybe, but nothing to worry about. Did that droid just wink at me? Are you sure? Yes, sir, the droid saluted smartly. If you have nothing further, sir, I'll get on this right away, and I'll have your gear sent around to your billet, sir. Thank you, Amtray. Corin returned the salute. Dismissed. The droid turned sharply on his heel and walked away. Corin stared after him, then shivered. Ural did not think it was so cold here. Corin spun and saw the gray-green-colored Gand standing behind him, another who blends in with his fog. Not cold, Ural. Just fatigue. It's been a long day, full of surprises. Craig wanted to apologize for abandoning you. The Gand Feinsman clutched his hands together penitently. Craig was too busy dodging interceptors on Craig's tail to see you were not there. You followed orders, just as I would have. Craig would give you a sign of Craig's sorrow. Corrin threw an arm around Gan's exoskeletal shoulders. I'll tell you what. Guide me back to my billet and let me get a solid eight hours of sleep, and we'll call it even. Will that assuage your gand guilt? Oral finds this acceptable. Good. Corin swept his left hand through the fog. Lead on, Oral. And this time, I promise I'll follow right behind you. Fifteen. The officious, bulbous officer stared laser bolts at Curtin Lure. I can see your orders are all properly drawn, but I have never appreciated intelligence operatives meddling in fleet affairs. I appreciate your concern, Admiral Devlia, as well as your willingness to return from retirement to Imperial service, but Imperial security must take precedence at this time, which, I believe you would agree, is most critical. The little man brushed his grey moustache with a finger and his expression eased, just so we understand each other. Of course. Curtin cared little for the Admiral's concerns, but the interdictor cruiser Black Asp was part of Devlia's command. Its report of being ambushed by a squadron it identified as Rogue Squadron had brought Curtin all the way from Coruscant to Vladit in the Ratchuk system to speak with the Black Asp's captain, Ula Ilor. He suspected a great chunk of Devlia's discomfort with his visit came because it forced the Admiral to deal with Ilor. One of the women who had risen to command to fill the gaps left in the Imperial Navy after the Endor debacle. The intelligence agent found himself anxious to meet Captain Ilor. He had read her file, as well as that of Admiral Devlia and most of the senior command staff during his journey out from Coruscant. The files were a welcome departure from tracking the various rumors about Rogue Squadron, but her record especially intrigued him. In studying it, he caught hints of how forceful she had to have been to have risen in the Imperial Navy as far as she got before the Emperor's death. Devlia stood and smoothed his gray jacket over his round belly. And I'll tell you, here and now, that I'll stop any questions I think are off the mark. I understand that, sir. 
Dream all you want, Admiral. Devlia led Curtin from his spacious office down a narrow hallway in the mansion that housed the command staff. The Admiral preceded him into a small study that had been converted into a conference room through the addition of a big table that dominated the room. Boxes full of data cards still lined the built-in shelves, and Curtin judged it a larger library than he would have expected to find on a planet like Vladet. Devlia secured himself the chair at the head of the table, then waved a hand toward the woman standing at the far end. Captain Ilor, this is Agent Curtin Lure. He wants to ask you some questions about the ambush. Yes, sir. The brown-haired woman looked at Curtin without a trace of the hunted look most people acquired when told intelligence wanted to question them. I'll help if I am able, Agent Lure. Her voice had an edge to it that backed up the challenge in her dark eyes. Curtin assumed her lack of fear came after years of being on the Navy's NHM track. Non-human. The Empire's bias against aliens and women reached an unprecedented level of refinement in the Imperial Navy. Ilor had been sent to serve under Colonel Thrawn and a host of other alien superior officers before she had been given a ship of her own. She would have been stuck on that Carrick-class cruiser had not the defeat at Endor made the need for competent officers so great that the command staff's survivors reevaluated personnel and awarded commands according to some semblance of merit. I'm sure you will, Captain. I would like any reports you have filed about this action, as well as any holographic records of it, along with any communication intercepts. He walked around to the left side of the table and turned back toward Devlia. With the Admiral's permission, of course. The old man nodded. Very well. If you don't mind, please tell me what happened. May I sit? By all means. Curtin smiled but remained standing. Make yourself comfortable. Captain Ilor sat and turned her chair, so she gave Devlia her profile. We had information that a smuggler running supplies to the rebels was expected in the Chorak system at a particular time and would be departing after picking up some supplies there. I sent a shuttle in to monitor the smuggler's situation while I put the black asp on the fringe of the system. When the pulsar skates started to head out of the system, I jumped the black asp in and brought my G7X gravjectors up. Curtin frowned. Intrasystem jumping is a rather unusual tactic, isn't it? Ilor shook her head. I've seen it used with great success out in the Unknown Sector. It worked at Chorax, too, because the skate had no idea where we came from. It took them nearly six seconds to begin evasive maneuvers. I took the liberty of closing to use our ion cannons on the skate during that time. Then a dozen X-Wings came into the system. I deployed my interceptor squadron, but none of the pilots are academy material. They would have been eaten up, so I brought the Black Asp in and managed to disable one X-Wing. By then, however, the remainder of them screened to the skate and hit my forward shield with a volley of proton torpedoes. The shield came down and I lost two laser batteries. I had to choose between reinforcing my shields or keeping the gravjectors operational. I made the former choice, recovering five interceptors, and went to light speed. Devlia leaned forward. They were waiting for the Black Asp. They came out of hyperspace right on top of her. Curtin stroked his chin. I don't see that one thing establishes the other. I see no evidence of an ambush. Ilor's head came up. That's what I've been telling the Admiral. You're both blind. I think, sir, with all due respect, you are making unwarranted assumptions. Curtin began to pace around to the edge of the table, passing behind the Admiral and back again. Interdictor cruisers are designed to pull ships out of hyperspace. Of course, only where the route is known in advance can they be positioned in such a way that doing that is possible. In this case, since the Black Asp was in the Chorax system specifically to prevent a ship from entering hyperspace, 
you have chosen to discard one of its primary functions. Preposterous! Which is precisely the kind of mistake I would have made previously. Curtin allowed himself a slight smile. Check your thinking. If you choose to ambush an interdictor cruiser, would you do so with a single squadron of X-Wings? Devlia's face reddened. Perhaps I would not, but I have training most rebel officers do not. Granted, sir, yet the rebels are not without wise leadership. Curtin left allusions to Yavin and Endor unvoiced, but he saw by Devlia's expression the man had caught them anyway. I might ask why the rebels would waste their time attacking an interdictor cruiser at all. No disrespect intended to you, Captain Ilor, or your ship. But the action of interdictors is hardly crippling to the rebellion. Our main battle fleets are garrisoning key worlds, like Corellia and Quat, so even predation on interdictors is unlikely to draw them out. Ilor did not smile, but her nod was not as stiff as before. My assumption was that we had suffered the misfortune of pulling a convoy out of hyperspace but the Admiral found such coincidence unlikely. Curtin smiled. The Admiral, despite this misjudgment, is formidable enough that I should think the rebels utter fools to operate in his command sector. Devlia had opened his mouth to protest the first half of Curtin's statement. The second half, which Curtin had added as a sop to the man's vanity, killed the Admiral's comment and clicked his jaw shut. The intelligence agent again focused on Captain Ilor. How did you identify them as Rogue Squadron? Communication intercepts used rogue call signs. Visual data is not very good, but there is a unique unit crest painted on the S-foils. Preliminary searches correlated with a crest said to be that of Rogue Squadron. Also, the Pulsar Skate is a ship with Corellian connections, just like Wedge Antilles. And the pilots were hot. They took off seven of my interceptors, with the last two falling to an X-wing that was dead. Devlia leaned back. Interesting, but circumstantial, as I am sure Agent Lore will agree. Circumstantial, yes, but persuasive. Everything she had said about the squadron that attacked the Black Asp did seem to point to Rogue Squadron. Curtin doubted any other unit in the Rebellion would sport Rogue call signs, and the crest data would have to be checked. Still and all, it was not conclusive. It is, however, a start. Captain, did your shuttles stay in system and monitor the squadron for outbound vector and speed? Ilor scowled. No, and Lieutenant Poten has been reprimanded for fleeing when not threatened. I do have entry vector and velocity data, and it is triangulated with the data from the shuttle. That's something, then. I will make certain you have it in time for your return to Imperial Center, Agent Lore. Devlia stood, assuming you want nothing else here. I do want to speak to the pilots who flew against the X-Wings, as well as review any data recorded from the interceptors that were destroyed. I'll see the interviews are arranged right away. Take your time, Admiral. The next two or three days will be soon enough. The old man's expression soured. Staying that long, are you? Longer, I suspect. Curtin smiled broadly for the Admiral. If Rogue Squadron is operating in this area, and I believe it is, I'll leave... Only after we've found them and destroyed them, and not a moment sooner. 16. In only two weeks, while the official request for a new Phi inverted lateral stabilizer languished in red tape limbo, M-Tray found a pair of Phi inverted lateral stabilizers that the Pulsar Skate dropped off on its second run to Talisee. The rogues at Verpine Tech used the new parts to replace the older damaged parts. In synchronizing them, Zrai managed to smooth things out, so Corin noticed a 5% increase in power at full throttle, 
with a 3% reduction in fuel consumption. Corin throttled back slightly, matching his speed to that of Ural. Three flight to lead. We're all in formation, sir. I copy, Nine. Stand by. As ordered, lead. Corin smiled broadly in spite of himself. Back when he was with Corsac, he had hated escort duty. But after two weeks on the ground, he would have volunteered to go after Death Stars, even if they were strung around a system like pearls on a necklace. Even during his time on the run from Corellia, he'd managed to fly at least once a week, even though that was well outside the profile of the identity Gil Bastra had created for him. He turned and looked back at Whistler. Has Emtre come up with any information based on his analysis of the ID Gill made up for me? A mournful hoot came in reply as the word no appeared on his display. Yeah, I don't like the idea of never seeing Gill again either. He glanced at his sensor monitor. Twelve, trim it up a bit there. You're slipping behind. Trouble? No difficulty. Compliance. Good. Keep close. This mission should be easy enough that a nerf herder could do it. But the other side will be shooting back, so we have to be careful. Despite the light tone in his voice, he knew things could get nasty. Alliance operatives had been conducting surveys of core worlds to assess the political climate and determine the strength of Imperial forces protecting them. On one run back toward their operations base, known to the pilots only as Black Kerr's base, with no location specified for security reasons, they ran into the strike cruiser Havoc. The rebels went to ground on a small jungle planet in the Hensara system. They sank their ship, a modified Imperial Customs frigate, in a deep lake and lacked the equipment needed to repair damage that would allow them to move it again. The Havoc grounded an Imperial walker and two scouts along with two platoons of stormtroopers. While their reported progress in searching out the rebels had been slow, they started relatively close to the lake, so the ship's discovery was a matter of time. The Alliance had reconciled itself to the loss of the ship and had intended a covert extraction of the operatives. Then the Havoc left the system providing a window for repair and escape of the frigate Battle of Yavin. Wedge sent the squadron the coordinates for the trip to the Hensara system. To cover the location of their base, the journey would be undertaken in three parts. The first jump, a short one, would take them to their first transit point, an uninhabited star system not far from the Morobi system. From there, they would jump back out rimward to the second transit system and back in to the Hensara system. While the multiple jumps and changes of direction would add hours to the flight time, obscuring their point of origin was vital. The Alliance had learned that spreading out its forces meant it was all but impossible for the Empire to land a death blow to the Rebellion. But for the efforts of a courageous few on Hoth, the Rebellion's headquarters would have been destroyed, and the Rebellion along with it. Without taking precautions, they would pinpoint the location of their base and invite retaliation. They made the first jump on Wedge's mark and came out in the fringes of the transit system all in one piece. The X-Wings maneuvered around to the exit vector quickly, then had to mark time as the skate and the Corellian corvette, Eridane, came about. Corin nudged his throttle back a notch, shortening the gap between him and the Gand. The larger ships reported they were ready, so the whole convoy shot into hyperspace and came out in the second transit system intact. The course adjustment there was not as radical as the one from the first system, so they headed out quickly and arrived in the Hensara system just outside the gravitational tug of the third planet. Corin heard Tycho's voice come through the comm. Rogue leader, Captain Afyon reports a clean scan of the system. You're clear for your run. Copy control. Three flight. You fly cap. Two and one. On me. Corin let a low snarl resound in his throat. 
Flying Combat Aerospace Patrol meant his flight would remain at the edge of Hensara III's atmosphere against the possible incursion of any Imperial forces. The other eight fighters in the squadron were going to escort the skate down and strafe the Imperial mudbugs and the Durasteel dogs they had hunting Dirk Harkness and his compatriots on the planet. Strafing runs against ground troops. Even stormtroopers wasn't much in the action department, but it was better than skipping across atmosphere shooting at nothing. He shrugged. Maybe slagging an at-at will sweeten Jace's disposition. Whistler gave a stuttered chirp that sounded as close as the droid could manage to a laugh. Corin matched it with some laughter of his own. Jace clearly figures that because his name rhymes with ace, he should be one. He can't understand why TIE pilots don't just line up for him to vape them all in one pass. Tycho's urgent calm call cut off Whistler's trilled comment. Control to all rogues. We have a strike cruiser that just jumped in system. Profile matches havoc, but two fighter bays have been added. Ties are launching. Three flight, lock S-foils in attack position. Korn glanced at his sensor display. Come to a heading of 272 degrees. Control here. I have 36, repeat, three six ties launched. Six interceptors, six bombers and 24, repeat, two four starfighters. Aerodane beginning evasive maneuvers. Wait, confirm bombers are heading to ground. We copy control. Wedge's voice came through strong despite being nibbled upon by static. Rogues three and four, the bombers are yours. The rest are ours. Keep them off the Aerodane. As ordered, rogue leader, Corin shoved his throttle full forward. Go all out, three flight. Into the middle, shoot at anything that isn't an X-Wing. Call if you need help. Under normal circumstances, Corin knew that flying into the teeth of an enemy formation would have been suicidal. But odds of thirty to four weren't all that conducive to long-term survival anyway. Since running wasn't an option, doing what the enemy didn't expect would buy him a second or two of surprise, and that would keep him alive just that much longer. Hauling back on his stick and canting it ever so slightly to the side, he brought the X-Wing up into a lopsided corkscrew maneuver. While the jerky motion of the ship's nose meant he didn't have a flame's chance on Hoth of hitting anything, he was that much harder to hit himself. He pumped more power into his shields, then shot through a flurry of laser bolts before he penetrated the Imperial formation. He hauled back on his stick, killing the weaving flight and arrowing his ship up into a flight of ties. He lined one starfighter up in his sights and let it have a quick blast of lasers. As the eyeball exploded, he cut the stick hard to starboard, then rolled out into a level line that continued his original course, with a half-kilometer cut to the right thrown in. As the TIE formation collapsed in after him, he cruised out the other side of it. Inverting his X-wing, he pulled the fighter into a loop that brought him around in the TIE's wake, though slightly below their formation. Keeping the nose up, he headed back in again. He picked up on a TIE interceptor, that had broken right while its wingmate had broken left. Ural continued on the tail of the ladder squint. The other interceptor tightened its turn into a teardrop loop designed to bring it onto the Gans aft. Corrin's quad lasers shredded the interceptor's starboard wing and blew apart one of the twin ion engines. The other, operating at full power, sent the squint spinning away. Corn winced in sympathy with the pilot, then drove into the middle of the tie formation. The X-Wings, plunging and wheeling through the middle of the ties, had an unanticipated advantage in that they had a very high target-to-comrade ratio to shoot at. Moreover, because the X-Wings had shields, even a shot taken in haste at another rogue would not likely prove fatal. The same could not be said of the ties. One burst from their lasers 
could cripple or kill a fellow pilot. Corrin snapped a shot off at one starfighter and watched it disintegrate. A warning warble from Whistler, and he mashed his right foot down on the etheric rudder pedal. The X-Wing's stern slew around to the left, swinging him out of an interceptor's line of fire while pointing his nose right at the ship as it sailed past him. He punched the X-Wing over 90 degrees, hauled back on the stick, then completed the inversion and dove down onto the interceptor's tail. He sent kilojoules of scarlet energy into the ball cockpit and watched the craft explode. Nine, break left. Without thinking, Corin slammed the stick hard to port and caught the green highlights of laser bolts shooting through where he had just been. More red laser fire chased back along those same lines, and something exploded out there. Thanks, Commander. No problem, Nine. Corin eased his stick forward and dove down to stay clear of the mass of starfighters. With the arrival of the rest of the squadron, he knew there was no way he could track all the ships and sort friend from foe. Even as he came back up, he saw less laser fire permeating the cloud of fighters than there had been when the forces were less evenly matched. So much twisting and turning going on in there, no one can find a target and stick with it long enough to dust it. Pulling up to continue his loop around the fringe of the battle, he saw one X-Wing break free with a starfighter on its tail. His sensors told him Gavin was at the stick of the Alliance ship. Measuring Gavin's line, Corin rolled his craft and looped down at a tangent to it. Rogue Five, break hard right. Gavin's fighter rolled up on its starboard S-foil crisply and pulled away at an angle that cast doubt on the existence of inertia. The starfighter following him tried to imitate his maneuver, but neither the pilot nor craft were up to it. As the tie rolled, Corin swooped and fired. His quad lasers burst the spherical pod like a bubble, sending the hexagonal wings slicing off through space. Before he could even smile, his X-Wing jolted forward. His instruments indicated heavy damage to his aft shield. Whistler, get me a lock on that tie. Corn inverted and dove, then pulled back on the stick to power up through a teardrop and onto the tie's tail. Instead of being where he expected it, the tie and interceptor showed up on his port S-foil, going away at a right angle to his course. Corrin stood on his left rudder, then did a snap roll that gave him a view of the planet above his head and the interceptor racing away from him. Just as he feared it was going to run far enough for Tycho or someone else on the Eridane to blast it, the interceptor pulled its own loop planetward and started back at him. Head to head. He knows what he's doing. As Wedge and Tycho had pointed out countless times in training, the majority of kills took place in head-to-head -head engagements. But so do I. Watch our tail, Whistler. Corin kicked his shields full forward and drove in straight at the interceptor. The rangefinder on the targeting monitor scrolled numbers off with blurred speed. His crosshairs went green and he fired, but couldn't see how much damage he'd done because of the light show produced by the interceptor's lasers eating away at his shields. Corin stabbed the right rudder pedal with his foot, swinging the ship around a full 180 degrees. Punching his throttle to full, he killed his momentum, then dropped the engines to zero thrust. With his thumb, he popped his weapons control over to proton torpedoes, and got a solid tone when he trapped the fleeing interceptor in the targeting box. His finger tightened once on the trigger, and a single torpedo shot away on a jet of blue flame. The torpedo caught up with the interceptor quickly enough, but the TIE pilot, confirming his possession of the skill Corrin had willingly granted him before, juked his interceptor out of its path at the last second. Unfortunately for him, his maneuvering and run at Corin had taken him to the outer edge of Hensara's atmosphere. While not particularly dense, 
impact with it at the speed the interceptor was traveling proved devastating. The starboard wing shattered, and the interceptor ricocheted away in a wobbly somersault. Control, this is Skate. We're on our way back up. We have company that wants to go home. Good job, Skate. Rogue leader, mission accomplished. I heard that, Control. Rogues, regroup for egress. Corin smiled as he heard Gavin's voice over the comm. Leader, there are two getting away. Let them go, Five. Flight leaders, check your flights. Whistler, give me feeds on my people. A tracking chart replaced the targeting data on Corn's screen. Nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Three flight is all here. Control to rogue leader. I have a dozen X-wings in system, two interceptors on recovery vectors, and two deployed shuttles on pilot recovery missions. Corn clapped his hands. We didn't lose anyone? Are you complaining, Nine? No, sir, Commander. Not at all. It's just... Yes, Nine? This is Rogue Squadron. I thought most of the pilots didn't survive Rogue missions. That was when there was still an Emperor, Nine. The grim tone in Wedge's voice gave way to one somewhat lighter. I guess that's the difference. Let's head home, Rogues. This is one victory we can celebrate without having to toast dead comrades, and I, for one, like the change. 17. Wedge sat with his back against the thick wall of the Grand Room in what had once been Talisi's planetary governor's palace. The title sounded much more important than the building and room it described. Built with heavy beams made of the dark native wood, and plaster slathered over wooden slats. It reminded him of the sorts of reconstructions he'd seen in museums on Corellia. This is about as primitive as it gets. The incongruity struck him as he watched his pilots sitting around a couple of central tables, using their hands to describe the twists and turns they went through in what they had taken to calling the Route of Hensara. They could have downloaded their sensor packets and played them out on the widescreen holoviewer in the corner, but that device remained black. By telling the stories themselves, they shared not only what they did, which the sensor data would have shown in exacting detail, but how they felt about it. And in doing that, they'll know they're all the same. Wedge tipped his chair back against the wall. He glanced at two old Iranians who shared his table with him. They did a good job out there today. Tycho smiled broadly. They did better than good. They were spectacular. We recorded 34 kills out of a possible 36 with no losses. If I hadn't been there, I'd think it was propaganda. Afyon looked up from a barely touched tankard of the local Lum equivalent. You know as well as I do, gentlemen, they were awfully lucky. They may be the hottest pilots going, but vaping ties won't Coruscant take. That's going to take an operation that will need more than snubby jocks to make it go. Wedge lowered his lum mug. Captain, I've been in this rebellion for as long as you have. I remember the fighting at Endor, and I know the Aridane fought hard. I appreciate that, Commander Antilles. But it was you who got paraded around the New Republic as the hero who saved the rebellion. Tycho's blue eyes narrowed. He did blow the Death Star, you realize, and survived the previous Death Star run. I know. And I know you were there, too. Afyon sat back and frowned. Look, I'm not saying you don't deserve your recognition. And I'm not saying your people don't deserve their little party here. Strapping yourself into a fighter isn't the easiest thing to do, and more fighter pilots die than do the folks I have crewing with me, but our contribution to this rebellion is just as important as yours is. Wedge nodded slowly. I know that, Captain. And if the Aridane 
hadn't been there today to make the Havoc think twice about closing with us, we would have been blind jumping out of the system. Afyon shook his head. Don't take me for a stormy Antilles. I don't believe everything I'm told. You'd have gone in after the Havoc itself. What's a strike cruiser to a crew that turned two Death Stars into black holes? The Corellian brought his chair down onto all four legs. The New Republic might promote me and this squadron as immortal and immune to danger, but I know better than that. Two of us, just two, survived Yavin. A half dozen survived Hoth, and just four of us lived through Endor. As far as I'm concerned, the Death Stars lived up to their names. Well, now, this squadron has to live up to its name. The New Republic is using us as a symbol because it's easier to blind people to the blood cost of war when you get to celebrate the heroic efforts of a half dozen people. Luke Skywalker is easy to admire and want to follow. Han Solo is a man who rose from nothing to become a hero and consort with royalty. Me? I'm the quintessential soldier who does his job very well. But what is that job? Two things. Neutralizing Imperials and, the part I take most seriously, keeping my people alive. Wedge raked fingers back through his brown hair. It doesn't matter if we were good or lucky out there today, and I'd rather the former than trust in the latter. What does matter is that we all survived, and that's as close to a miracle as I ever expect to see in my lifetime. The key thing to remember is that I can't trust in our luck or skill. I can't allow myself to believe we were that much better than the opposition, and I can't let my people believe it. If they do, they'll die taking chances they should never take. Afyon sucked on his teeth for a second. You're right. I guess I just remember the Clone Wars and how the hero labels were handed out. You'd think a dozen Jedi and two dozen snubby jocks won the whole thing. Even all the years I spend pulling for peace, same as most of the rest of the folks on Alderaan, never dulled that feeling of injustice I had concerning credit for the war. Weird, eh? Wanting peace enough to agree to disarmament of my home planet, yet still burning about getting credit for my part in a war? The other Alderaanian at the table shook his head. One of the problems we all have is that we try to think of ourselves in general terms, and that smooths over some of the inconsistencies that make us who we are. We see all Imperials as rankers, and they see all of us as nerfs. The very fact that we see them as a united front is ridiculous, just the same as we're not all united, as this discussion proves. Afyon smiled. I've not heard that kind of philosophy since, you know, our world. Tycho nodded solemnly and squeezed Afyon's shoulder with his right hand. I do know. He smiled and looked over at the knot of pilots in the center of the room. I'm afraid this group does not inspire that much philosophy. I appreciate being able to share some with another Alderanian. Wedge glanced at his pilots then tipped his chair back up against the wall as the Twi'lek stood. Noara Ven flipped one of his brain tails around and over his shoulder as if it were a scarf, then stumbled slightly. Wedge wasn't sure if it was the cavalier way he tossed his brain tails around or the drink that made the pilot stumble. The lum brewed up by the ground crew had the potency of Corellian brandy and the piquant bouquet according to Gavin, of a Tatooine dewback in heat. Nawara remained almost completely upright as he wove his way through tables to where Wedge sat. Forgive me, noble leaders, but we require your esteemed personages to act as a tribunal to adjudicate a question. The Twi'lek pressed a hand to his own chest. Owing to my legal background, 
I have been appointed a neutral advocate to present the cases to you. Wedge couldn't keep a smile from his face. Please proceed, Counselor. Thank you, sir. Nawara turned back toward the other pilots. First, we have the case of the worst pilot in the unit. May I present Gavin Darklighter, who won this award by virtue of the fact of not getting anything out there today. Easier to read than the scowl on Gavin's face was the open relief on the faces of Lujane Forge and Peshk Vrissik. Wedge knew the award had to sting Gavin badly, but he was young. The rest of the squadron had been willing to cut him a lot of slack because of his youth, but that latitude would last only so long. In Wedge's opinion, Gavin wasn't the worst pilot by far, but his lack of kills allowed his squadron mates to rib him a little. Nawara gestured at Gavin. The accused will stand. Gavin remained seated. Broar Jace grabbed him by the shoulder of his flight suit and hauled him up out of his seat. Here he is, the worst we have. Just like the TIE pilots, he got zero kills. The edge in Jace's voice provoked a snarl from Gavin's wingmate, Sheel. Color flooded Gavin's face and muscles bunched at his jaw as he ground his teeth. Jace laughed and tugged on Gavin's shoulder like a puppeteer manipulating a marionette. The Twi'lek, seemingly oblivious to Gavin's discomfort, smiled at the tribunal. We have determined there should be a punishment of some sort to encourage an improvement in performance. Wedge turned his head to face the other two members of the tribunal. Ideas, gentlemen? Tycho held a finger up. Strikes me that apprenticing Gavin to the best pilot having him run errands and the like for him, might provide the perfect situation for Gavin to learn how to be better. I like that, Tycho. Corn won't be too hard on him, and the added responsibility will give Corn something to think about other than your situation. Wedge nodded. I think that is a good idea. Captain Athion? Sure. I know I'd love to have an aide to draft the performance reports for the Eridane. Captain Affion's suggestion brought a groan from the squadron, so Wedge catalogued the threat of report preparation for future disciplinary use. I believe, Counselor, you have your judgment rendered. The Twi'lek bowed and straightened up slowly, then turned back to his compatriots. Gavin Darklighter, you are sentenced to serve as aid to the best pilot in the squadron until such time as you are no longer judged the worst pilot. Broar smiled broadly and gave Gavin's flight suit one last tug. Good. You can start your service by getting me more lum. Wedge frowned. How is it that you, Mr. Jace, are considered the best pilot? You only had five, and Mr. Horn had six. If we average them over the last two engagements, then Mr. Horn has four and a half, with you... Mr. Craig and me each at two and a half. You fare no better when we total them. Nawara smiled, flashing pointy peg teeth. You have hit upon the crux of the matter, sir. Mr. Jace argues that percentages tell the true story. He killed five of the six bombers he faced, meaning he downed 85% of the ties he engaged. Gavin sat down and snarled and they were big, lumbering bombers. No one could have missed them. The Twi'lek clucked at Gavin, then continued his explanation. Mr. Horn, on the other hand, shot only six of 30, giving him a kill percentage of 20%. Wedge shook his head. This is ridiculous. Percentages have no place in this. If you don't mind, sir, Corn stood up and glared over at Broar. I'm willing to let things be figured by percentages. Go ahead, Mr. Horn. Corn folded his arms across his chest. You want a real contest, Jace? The Thyferon raised his head and glared down at the shorter man. It's an easy offer to be made by the man in the lead. I'm willing to make it even. 
and I'll even concede this round to you, declaring you the best pilot until our next mission. Korn opened his arms and rested his right hand on Gavin's shoulder. What I'm willing to do is average Gavin's kills in with mine. The one he got at Chorax adds to my nine. Then we split that in half. That puts us even at an average of five kills. You and I are both aces, and now so is he. Don't do this, Corin. The small man winked down at Gavin. I trust you, kid. You'll do fine. We start even? The Thyferon asked. Corin nodded. We go straight kills from here on out. Or average them. Your choice. Broar raised a blonde eyebrow. You are still willing to average the kid's kills in with yours? The Corellian nodded again and patted Gavin's shoulder. You willing to take the challenge? Wedge watched conflicting emotions ripple over Broar Jace's face. He clearly wanted to go one-on-one -on -one with Corin, to prove he was better, free and clear. Yet the rules Corin was offering him played in his favor. Any kill Corin got would only count half. Unless Corin excelled, killing two for Broar's one, or Gavin started on a tear, Broar would win easily. The difference between their skill levels was not significant enough to give Corin a real chance of winning. Broar's blue eyes thinned to arctic slits. We'll average things, just to keep Gavin in the game, but you and I can go head-to-head -head whenever I choose. I wouldn't have it any other way. And you and I, because we did have the most kills at Hansara, will share the best pilot crown until our next outing. Corin smiled. Done. Wedge nodded once to Corin, then looked up at the Twi'lek. So, by this settlement, Broar and Corin are co-best pilots, and Gavin has five kills, correct, Counselor? The Twi'lek nodded. If you so agree, members of the Tribunal. The three judges agreed, and Nawara smiled. It is done, then. And the worst pilot is still apprenticed to the best pilot? Nawara nodded. The worst pilot is still bound by that agreement. Good. Wedge stood and slapped the Twi'lek on the back. Then since Gavin has five kills to his credit, that makes you, with only one kill, the worst pilot. Nawara's pasty complexion became ghost-like. No appeal? Wedge smiled. To you, there probably is not. But the idea of a lawyer getting the sentence instead of his client has some appeal to me. The Twi'lek frowned and caressed one of his brain tails. Perhaps it is true that a lawyer who has himself as a client is a fool. Which is why you're a pilot now, Mr. Venn. Wedge laughed lightly. Consider your sentence suspended, at least for the duration of this celebration. Today we proved how good we can be. Tomorrow, we go back to training to make sure we know how we did what we did, so we can continue doing it in the future. Curtain Lure scratched at the reddish, raw patch of flesh behind his right ear. Rachuk Rosiola was a virus, he was told, that got to everyone who came to the world. Scratching it didn't appear to make it worse, and nothing but time made it better. It annoyed him because he found it distracting, and at this late stage in his calculations, distraction was the last thing he needed. He pored over the data from Hensara again, correlating figures and sensor tracks with known performance parameters for X-Wings. All the ships in the squadron appeared to be operating within two standard deviations of the mean of Rebel specifications. This told him that the ships were in good repair, which meant the Rebels were expending considerable resources on that squadron to keep the ships working. That little factoid combined with the spectacular kill ratio, led him to believe Rogue Squadron had been at Hansara. Visuals were of generally poor quality,
but the crests and fighters appeared to match those images recorded by the Black Asp, confirming the squadron's presence at Chorax as well. He had no objective confirmation about the squadron being Rogue Squadron, but one communications intercept had included the name Wedge, and Curtin thought he heard some faint trace of Corn Horn's voice in other messages. The end-for-end -end swapping maneuver that led to the damaging of one interceptor had been vintage Horn, providing Lure all the evidence he needed to label the X-Wings as Rogue Squadron. Admiral Devlia had not been convinced, but he had agreed to send units out to find the squadron's base, if Curtin could isolate it. Admiral Devlia had made the offer in a voice that suggested providing such information would be impossible. It should have been impossible, and for most people it would have been. However, Curtin Lure remembered a wealth of things that might be trivia to others, but proved to be useful to the search for the rogue's base. He had to make a few assumptions about them and the force they arrived with, but his calculations could be run with a number of variables factored in. Then all that data could be correlated with known system locations and rebel preferences for bases. Because several of the X-Wings entered the atmosphere of Hensara III, they left significant traces of ionized fuel in the atmosphere. Spectral analysis of those trails provided an amount of thrust that gave Curtin an indication of the quantity of fuel used per second of operation with sublight engines. This proved consistent with the known specifications of the X-Wing. Since the performance of sublight engines had not been modified, he assumed the hyperspace engines were similarly standard. The forces on the ground on Hansara provided some basic entry vector and velocity data for the rebel force. Backplotting was not terribly difficult and suggested to Curtin that the force had begun their last jump from the Darek system. Using the fuel consumption figures for an X-Wing's hyperspace engine, he was able to subtract from the weight of the ship the appropriate amount of fuel. Thrust output Vector and velocity data provided him with changing weights for the X-Wings as they burned up fuel in their flight. The ending weight and fuel consumption seemed consistent for known performance profiles. Precluding refueling stops along the way, the amount of fuel he calculated for them determined the range to their base. He had to assume, of course, that they had started with a full load of fuel and the same had to be assumed for the Pulsar Skate and Eridane, as well as the Lambda-class shuttle at Chorax. Working out the fuel consumption and range limits for those ships had shown them to be far more fit for distance travel than the X-Wings, as would be expected of larger ships, but few ships like to travel beyond range of their escorts. Even limiting the trip to the range of the X-Wings gave each flight the capability of traveling a considerable distance. He further reduced the range by assuming the Rebels would keep sufficient fuel in the X-Wings for a dogfight or rear guard action to allow the other ships to escape. This cut the range roughly in half, and when given a spherical plot on a map of the galaxy for each of the squadron's sightings, the spheres intersected in a relatively small area of space. 500 known systems existed in that overlapping slice of space. Curtin discarded all truly loyal worlds from the list. He also removed the openly rebellious worlds because intelligence had enough spies of their own in hotbeds of rebel support to inform him if Rogue Squadron had been seen. While the Alliance was willing to draw volunteers and support from such worlds, they chose not to jeopardize them by basing operations on them. Inhospitable worlds were shuffled onto a secondary list. While the base on Hoth had shown the rebels were willing to hide almost anywhere, 
post-invasion breakdowns and evaluations of the Hoth operation showed the rebels had trouble modifying equipment to work there. In fact, had the rebels not been reeling from the defeat at Dara 4, they probably would have bypassed Hoth altogether. Being the opportunists they were, the rebels did tend to prefer worlds that already had structures on them that could be converted into installations. It appeared that the more benign and abandoned the world seemed, the more likely the rebellion was to choose it as a base. Curtin doubted the rebels themselves realized they had this predilection for taking over ruins for their own use, and he imagined it had to do with a subconscious desire to renew the old republic. The very thing that drove them against the empire demanded they embrace things older than the Empire to give their movement a legitimacy it lacked itself. The final list of primary worlds contained only ten names on it. Curtin subjected this list to the final selection process, one that had come to him as inspiration upon waking from a dream that included visions of Isan Isard metamorphosing into a scarlet ghost of Darth Vader. The X-Wings, in arriving at Chorax, had not expected to be dragged out of hyperspace. That meant their entry vector, if drawn as a line through space, would point out their intended destination. Curtin plotted that line through his data model, and then asked the computer to sort the candidate worlds according to their proximity to any world on that line. One world had a perfect correlation with that line. Curtin smiled. Palacy in the Morobi system. He downloaded his result into his personal data pad and headed off for Admiral Devlia's office. We know where you are, Rogue Squadron. Now we will crush you. 18. Korn's eyes snapped open. He knew from the chill of the air and the deep darkness that it was still night. The fog drifting in through the window of the small cottage seemed to amplify the silence of the night. He knew that nothing, not light nor sound, had awakened him. But he also knew Something was wrong. He glanced over at Ural's cot and saw it was empty. That wasn't much of a surprise. He'd learned that Gans needed only a fraction of the sleep humans did and appeared to be able to store it up for times when they could not sleep. He would have loved to know what set of evolutionary pressures had given the Gans this ability, but Ural remained decidedly private concerning his species and Corrin hadn't pressed for details. Corrin's sense of unease didn't center itself on Ural. It remained a feeling that something was wrong, and this sensation was one with which Corrin had a lot of experience. He'd felt it when preparing for meetings with criminals, or during undercover work when his cover had been blown and enemies were waiting to hurt him. His father had nodded sagely when Corin told him about that feeling, and had encouraged him to heed it when it occurred. He threw open his sleeping bag and shivered as the cold air hit his naked flesh. Well, father, I'll go with my gut. Corin pulled on his flight suit and discovered that its synthetic material retained the night's chill better than his flesh retained heat. He stepped into boots that were also rather frigid. He would have run in place for a moment to warm himself up, but a wave of malignancy washed over him. Corin crossed to the cottage's open doorway and crouched in the shadows. He'd have given his right arm for a blaster, but he stored his personal sidearm in Talisi's flight center, along with his helmet, gloves, and other equipment. In my days with Corsac, I wouldn't have been caught dead without a gun of some sort. I don't even have a vibroblade. Either I'm going to be very lucky here, or very dead. 
any advantage he might have, came from the basic appearance of the cottage itself. With an open doorway, unglazed windows, and sagging roof, the cottage hardly looked like the sort of place anyone, let alone pilots, would choose to live in. Unfortunately, Ural and Corin had no choice, since a windstorm had knocked a local Kaha tree through the wall of their room in the pilot's wing of the flight center. Unpowered and barely visible from the center of the compound, the cottage might go unnoticed. Unless someone is being very thorough. The unmistakable squish of mud beneath boot alerted Corin to the presence of someone just outside the cottage. Looking up, he saw the snout of a blaster carbine poke through the doorway. A left leg, encased in the slate-gray armor worn by stormtroopers on commando missions, followed it. The gun's muzzle moved to the right, away from Corin, and began a slow sweep of the room. Corin exploded up from his crouch and slammed his left fist into the stormtrooper's throat. Using his own body as a weapon, the Corellian smashed the stormtrooper against the door jamb, hooking his right hand through the armpit of the soldier's armor. Corin spun and flung the man into the center of the cottage. Taking one step forward, Corin leaped up and landed with both knees on the imperial stomach. The stormtrooper retched and vomit squirted from beneath his helmet. Corin pulled the man's blaster pistol from his holster tucked it up beneath the trooper's chin and pulled the trigger once. A muffled squeak accompanied the reddish light flashing through the helmet's goggle eyes. Then the body beneath him went limp. Corn winced. He who carries a blaster set on kill dies by a blaster set on kill. He tossed the blaster pistol to the floor beside the carbine, then slid off the dead man's abdomen. He unbuckled the dead trooper's ammo belt. Tugging it free of the body, he noticed, in addition to the erg clips for the blasters, a number of pouches, half of which were bulging. Opening one of them, he saw compact silver cylinders, and a new shiver ran through him. Explosive charges. Some must already have been set. A noise in the doorway made Corin spin. The stormtrooper stood there, staring down at him. Corrin's right hand groped for the blaster pistol, but he knew he'd never make it in time. Then he noticed the stormtrooper's hands were empty and, more importantly, the man's feet were two inches off the ground. Ural cast the body aside and it crumpled to the floor. The Gand took a look at the stormtrooper on the ground, then nodded once. Ural apologizes for having left you undefended. Ural was out walking when the presence of these interlopers became apparent. How many? The Gand shook his head. Two less. Ural saw four others at various points on the perimeter. And our sentries? Gone. Not good. Stormtroopers travel in squads of nine. Let's figure two dozen with the crew of whatever brought them here. Corin refastened the ammo belt and slung it across his body. Reholstering the blaster pistol, he noticed that Ural had similarly appropriated his trooper's weapons. Is your boy dead? The Gan nodded and rolled his trooper onto his stomach. The trooper's helmet had a blood-smeared hole in the back of it. The hole itself looked odd, and Corin knew that was because of its shape, not just the jagged outline from where the armor crumpled. Kind of a diamond shape. He looked up. Did you hurt your hand? Ural folded his three fingers into a fist with the wound's peculiar shape. Ural is not impaired. Well, I am, by the night and the fog. You'll be in the lead. We have to assume the others are rigging the flight center to blow. No alarm? Corin hesitated. By rights, raising an alarm would be the smart thing to do, but there were no troops to fight against the stormtroopers. Waking everyone up would be inviting them to get slaughtered as they ran about unarmed. 
the pilots would head toward their ships, and the stormtroopers in the flight center would cut them down in seconds. Have to go silent on this one. We want to approach the flight center from the blind side. The Gant nodded and led Korn out into the misty darkness. Clutching the blaster carbine to his chest, a legion of conflicting thoughts and emotions flooded through him. With each step, a new plan presented itself to him. There had to be better ways to handle the situation than slipping blindly through the night to go hunting stormtroopers. They had every advantage over him. Not only 